थ्री टू वन वी आर लाइव नाउ so uh can i yeah yes i mean yes sir so sir can i invite uh, uh, dr sanjay dhawan he is president of nails to give some sort of welcome address dr sanjay uh thank you amit morning one and all present here i welcome the president i invite dr ramesh sir president elect dr atul shrivastava immediate past president dr shiv shankar sir Vice President I O A Dr. Ram Prabhu uh, Ram Chadda Sir and Secretary I O A Dr. Navin Thakkar and all the eminent executives of I O A to this I O A Advanced Virtual Nailing Course organized by I O A in association with Nail Society. My sincere thanks to I O A for giving us this opportunity to participate as society. Also, my sincere thanks to our guest uh, galaxy of speakers for sparing time to enlighten us with their wisdom. I'm sure. that every bit of their talk and discussion is going to give us a useful tips for which shall be very useful in our day to day practice so with too much of your time once again i welcome you all and it's for all move to academics with my best amit please yeah thank you dr sanjay uh shivshankar sir would you like to say some uh, small address Uh, i welcome all of you on behalf of uh, indian orthopedic association as well as the nails and now i request the president of indian orthopedic association dr ramesh sen sir to say a few words very good morning to all friends and all the participants for this advanced course on the nailing technique we all appreciate that this procedure of interlocking nailing is one of the maximum number of surgeries are being conducted in this way the specificity of the technique the sensitivities of the technique and the implications are accordingly quite high and it's very important that we understand how the procedure is to be taken in the best interest of the patient and i'm very happy that uh, dr gadegane has organized this with eminent people from the nails and uh, we do anticipate with the kind of a galaxy of experts around the participants are likely to get the best Morning. of this uh, uh, program and definitely appreciate that the efforts which have been put up by dr ne in organizing Morning. all this it will be a wonderful experience for all of us to listen to understand and to appreciate this program so a lot of thanks to all the experts to have contributed and to have been contributing to this program all my best wishes to the faculty to the participants to be a part of this i am very magnificent program thank you dr gone thank you everybody thank you sir welcome sunil and uh, may i just uh, now invite uh, dr gade gone who has been the prime organizer of this meeting just to say a couple of words so good <clears throat> good morning to everybody this idea of advanced nailing course was mooted by dr shiv shankar and amit rastogi in the and dr sushmit babulkar uh, in the meeting of uh, goa of eot kan and it has been finalized with the help of navin thakkar bhai and the ramesh sen has consented very uh, promptly and therefore we can uh, gather here the galaxy of the all orthopedic surgeons from all over india and it will be a very one of its kind uh, advanced nailing course and uh, this will be beneficial to the all delegates i welcome all uh, these faculty members and i thank also for their spending valuable time up early morning on sunday thank you very much and you can start the proceedings right <clears throat> uh, amit amit we have the secretary of ioa dr navin tucker also Uh, he will uh, before he before he says a few words on behalf of ioa it will not be out of context to say that its nails the national association of interlocking surgeons is one of the sub specialty it's only seen in india there is no other second similar association we have everywhere in the world arthroplasty of the hip knee foot and ankle arthroscopy shoulder wrist joint everything but nails is something Uh, this is now in the 22nd year in india but uh, this is the only association 
in the world at present over to you navin yes wow well, there is a, there is a kunstner association in germany that's only kunstner right. it's all yes. nailing right. total nailing that's only, a kunstner it is, it is, it is, it is, yes 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 on behalf of the ioa as a io secretary i welcome all the faculty and thank all the faculty and dr gade ganesh sir dr amit dr sanjay dr susurup everybody to formulate this program to get the benefit to the all the orthopedic surgeons and in a way to the patients for better advanced nailing techniques tips and tricks these experts will be giving all of us we will be learning together so it is the best place to share learn contribute together and evolve further together so you can go ahead with the academic program so that we will not lose the time for academic part thank you very much i also thanks for uh, coordinator dr sushrut babudkar and moderator as a b shiva shankar sir he has kindly and navin thakkar kindly consented to be a moderator of this session and i welcome also and i thank them uh, three of them thank you very much <coughs> sir Sir, we can can we take a leave because we have to go down. Uh, yes, yes, you can, you can. Okay, sir. Thank you, thank you. Sir, over to Shiv Shankar, sir, and uh, Shushrut. Ah, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Gade Gone, sir, and uh, thank you, Navin and uh, Dr. Ramesh Singh, sir, for joining in spite of your busy schedule. I know you are in Dindigal in uh, Tamil Nadu at present, attending the midterm meet of Tamil Nadu Orthopedic Association. I am glad that you, in spite of your busy schedule, you have been. a part of our uh, meeting today navin will be joining after the inauguration session there again to give his talk uh, for the first talk may invite uh, dr amit ajikaukar because he has to again leave for another workshop so we have all the faculty busy in the, uh, today like dr sunil is busy with evo trauma dr sanjay dhawan is uh, busy with uh, jess at uh, delhi so we have dr amit ajigaukar to speak about uh, the gextast art plus fracture sintibia sorry so, shiva i just started share screen share earlier very no, sorry uh, we all have been talking about the just just articular fracture sintibia so, for so many years the nails the trauma society and everyone has been teaching us how to do yet there are a lot of errors while doing the proximal and the distal fractures now look at this here if you would have if one would have put this polar screw and directed it this would have a result would have been better basically the proximal in the proximal fragment can you see my slide in the proximal fragment the nail has to be centralized that is the main thing over here and that can be achieved by a polar screw on in the concavity of the fracture in this case or slightly lateral to the center so this could be the entry point and your nail could have been centralized in the proximal fragment by putting a polar screw in the convex concave side similarly if your nail is directed posteriorly you have to have a medio lateral polar screw which directs your nail more anteriorly towards the anterior cortex these are the final things in the proximal fragment you have to always see to it that you enter properly and you have the nail placed in the central position in 69% of patients there is this anterior ligament which joins the medial and the lateral menisci which is called as a ligamentum transversus many a point time many a times whenever we do our nailings we go too anteriorly too intra articular and then we tend to damage this ligament which causes anterior knee pain so always take care of this ligament whenever you are doing the nailings because in 70% of the patients there will be this ligament always there we always have this two step entry point one for the proximal tibial fractures and the lower entry point just above the tibial tuberosity which could be for the shaft fractures so choose an entry point from there slightly lateral to the midline oh this is the infrapatellar the red line which is marked red is the infrapatellar in the entry point which goes transcendinous 
we have other entry points. This green line would indicate the medial parapatellar entry point, which Torneta has described by opening the uh, joint and uh, just flipping the patella on the lateral side. Then we have the suprapatellar. This yellow line indicates the suprapatellar entry point. If you mark a line, a dotted line, just below the patella, all your entry points from above this line would be done in the, all your tibias would be done in a semi-extended position, whereas all your infrapatellas are done in the flexed position. In your semi-extended position, your tibia lies this way. This is the semi-extended or the extended position. For me today, yesterday or a few years back, I would have done it in the flexed position. But today, I would always prefer the semi-extended or the extended position for a tibia nailing, for any type of a tibia nailing, I would like to say. And because the reduction is so easy, handling of your fracture fragments are easy, the entry point is not that difficult. Whereas in flexion pos flexed position, everything would be a bit difficult. And given a chance, if you try a, a semi-extended position by a suprapatellar entry point, you would know that how easy it is to do the semi-extended position. You go down, you have the instrumentation should be proper, your jigs, your tissue protection sleeves, your wire should be directed more anteriorly and centrally. So your proximal fragment should be centralized. This is the two-step entry point which I've told you. This is for the proximal shaft fractures. Always see to it. By whatever means, if you don't have the suprapatellar nail or if you're doing an infrapatellar nail, a normal traditional nail also, you have to enter from this point and not over here. This is for your shaft and for your, all your proximal tibia fractures, this is the entry point. And go down directed to the anterior cortex, parallel to the anterior cortex, your guide wire should go. This is the suprapatellar entry point. You have to have good instrumentation and proper equipment, protecting cannulas, long reamers. And this is the way you go down, that's the incision. That is the incision where you go down with your jigs. And this is the way you, I always prefer the extended position rather than the semi-extended position. And if you have a tight PFJ, that is the patellofemoral joint, you can just slightly release your quadriceps too and hyperextend your knee joint. Your patellofemoral joint will become slightly loose and your jigs and your cannulas will go in easily. That's a portal of entry, portal placement exactly. If you are going posteriorly in the lateral view, direct your wire anteriorly. It has to go anterior, parallel to the anterior cortex by just slightly doing an hyperextended position. In a semi-extended position, the pull of the patellar tendon is neutralized to get a good reduction of your proximal fragment. Now look, this was a case wherein uh, the patient had this type of a more or less a mid shaft fracture, but here the fibula was fractured lower down and we needed to take care of the fibula as well as there was a lateral condyle proximal fracture. We a CT scan and the CT scan was showing this. What we thought was we go ahead with something different. It was a different idea. We first went ahead and we fixed the lateral condyle first with K-wires, then entered the with a suprapatellar approach. And that was the nail. This is the nail, which is more or less straighter. The Herzog's bend is very high and it is around at 10 to 11 degrees, not much. So more or less, it's a straight nail. And that's all the instrumentation which is available. And look, in this X-ray, you can see we have left enough space for the nail to go. And the condyles were fixed just by these K-wires. Past the nail, this is the nail entry point. You went ahead. This is, this was a guide where it was initially, and then the nail passed, and this is the nailing done. And ultimately, what we did was we did the nailing. We got a good reduction over here, and then we managed the proximal tibia with this plate and the lower end of the fibula with the other plate. This is the patient at ten months follow up, and uh, uh, this is the patient with good function. So basically, wow. your Patellofemoral joint has entered your knee joint. Okay. Uh, if you give good okay. physical treatment to these patients, this is the result. End result. There's no problem with the extension at all. So, how the patient is doing this extension?
Now, in the distal third fractures, they are a bit difficult fractures in the distal because they might be oblique or they might be too distal. There might be an intra-articulate extension, rotationally unstable fractures. So, you need to always think about these fractures. Indications for kneeling could be a pure metaphyseal fracture or an extra-articular fracture. Fractures with clear-cut intra-articular extensions, you may think about nailing, but the nail has to be, um, a plate has to be added over a nail. What I feel is today, given a chance, if you do a nailing, if you get an ex excellent reduction and a good fixation of your distal fragment, then it's fine. You can go ahead with just a nailing. Otherwise, you have to add a plate, a medial plate, just a sliding medial plate would be sufficient enough for a distal femur fracture, this etibial fracture. Your timing should be very important. You can't operate with this. You have to have the wrinkle sign as in the proximal tibia. You may use external fixators temporarily. Now, this is uh, Sunil's slide. And uh, this is a, a method wherein you use your reduction forceps to hold your reduction and then do a nailing. So this is the way you hold your reduction for oblique fractures. This is the way it's done. For oblique fractures, a reduction tool is used and then you put a nail, your nail has to be centralized again in the distal fragment. All your shorter fragments, your nail should be centralized, or always keep in mind. And at least two or three locking screws in the shorter fragment in multiple planes. So this is the way it was done and your uh, superb reduction was achieved and uh, the patient went into the mind. A polar screws in these distal tibial fractures can be used, though I don't use nowadays. In varus fractures, you can use a proximal polar screw, which is medial, and a distal screw, which is slightly lateral, and vice versa in valgus fractures. Now, look at this fracture. Here, a polar screw was used. I have used many a times polar screws after putting the nail, wherein, wherein I've found that the reduction is being lost. Just one polar screw on one side, wherever you have to always think intraoperatively, and one polar screw shifts your nail and gets a good reduction before passing your distal locking screws. And uh, they are really very useful. Once you use your polar screws, you will easily understand how they get your reductions and how they use. They are useful in centralizing your nail in the distal fragments and getting oblique fractures reduced. Polar screws can be used in valgus fractures by this way. Or you may always have polar screws on both the sides so that your nail is centralized again in the distal fragment. This is another case wherein an oblique fracture, the reduction achieved and polar screws used. Now, for all these distal tibial fractures also, there is enough evidence that a suprapatellar intramedullary nailing technique lowers the rate of malalignment of distal. This is a paper which has been published and around 266 patients have been studied. This is a cohort study and um, a level three evidence is placed over here for a suprapatellar nailing which reduces the malalignment in the distal tibial fractures. Here we have done with a suprapatellar nailing. And uh, this was another case wherein there was a distal tibial fracture, a compound injury after giving enough good wash. We did a suprapatellar nailing in this case and the patient went on to unite. Concluding, I would like to say that always remember the small tips and tricks. Both proximal tibia and the distal tibia can be named following the principles of suprapatellar nailing today. You can do it, if not a suprapatellar nail, you can do it by an infrapatellar normal traditional nail, but always keep in mind whatever we have talked about, about the polar screws, about centralization of your nail, a high entry point with a guide wire which is directed anteriorly. A semi-extended position is best for neutralizing the patellar tendon forces and the reduction. Distal tibia, a nail has to be centralized and reduction of oblique fractures achieved. If you have an oblique fracture, and if you have achieved a reduction initially also, you can your reduction can be lost later if you have not centralized your nail in the distal fragment and if you have not placed your screws for interlocking screws in multiple multiplanar directions. So today, a suprapatellar nail would be the all-out solution for all tibia nailings. That is what I conclude. Thank you. Amit, yeah. Uh, quickly, if there are any questions uh, yes. you from the faculty, 
Amit, when do you use additional plate before you do a nailing in proximal tibial fracture? How often it is the practice uh, to use a unicortical plate for uh, reduction purpose? Mm, that's a very good uh, question. And uh, today, given a chance today, I would, if I'm doing an infrapatellar approach, infrapatellar approach, and if I'm not achieving a good reduction, if I'm having oblique fractures, I would always go in with a small plate with a very small, uh, maybe a 3.5 screw uh, plate also, just two screws above and two screws below. Uh, a sliding plate, biological fixation, and in fact, I can get a bicortical, not a unicortical. Bicortical also is it now. If I'm doing the suprapatellar approach, I would never think of uh, putting a plate if I'm getting, because I'm damn sure that I'll get good reductions. You, you are a master of suprapatellar nail, Dr. Gadi Gode. And I, we have we have shown enough cases wherein you get uh, in distal femur tibial fractures. I would always use a plate, but in proximal tibial fractures, adding an additional plate only if and there's an oblique fracture, which I which I feel that there is rotational instability. In a Amit, distal, in distal yeah. tibial fracture, uh, Amit, in a distal tibial fracture after having done your surgery, you feel that there is some vulgus malalignment is still persists. Yeah. In that case, what you will do? You will remove the nail and redo the surgery or you accept it uh, if it is in a, uh, near about 6 to 7 degree vulgus? Uh, look, I may remove. I, initially, I would not do this, whatever the vulgus or the varus malalignment. But if at all I feel that there is some amount of malalignment, then I would add a plate or I would remove the distal locking screws. After removal of the distal locking screws, you can get uh, alignment of the distal fragment easily and uh, add polar screws, get the nail centralized, get a reduction. And uh, if needed, add an additional plate on the medium side. Yeah, Amit, can I ask you a question? Yeah, yeah. yeah okay, so your first case, we, you put, uh, there was a lateral condyle tibia fracture along with the... Oh, uh, yeah. Correct, correct. You oh. put wires there. Yeah, exactly. What is, what is your uh, take on putting a plate first, a small plate, which will stabilize your fracture? And then you go ahead with nailing. And what did uh, you do? What did you do after the nailing? Did you uh, replace the wires with screws or what? Yeah, I replaced. Definitely, I removed the um, uh, the wires. You could have seen the post of X-ray, no? and put that plate over there. <clears throat> but initially, I thought the wires were holding well, and um, unnecessarily the plate would have come in the way of my uh, nailing. At least the CM use. So I thought that. Uh, uh, and the nails, the wires were enough. It is just a matter of your geometry of the fracture. You may put a small plate and then replace the it. The point I wish to make is that if this thing had happened in the medial condyle, you would have had to plate it first. You can't just rely on your wires and your screws post nailing. If my if my fracture was more proximal, more more anterior, then I would have uh, had to do something. You know, put a plate first. And then uh, keep enough space for a nail to go. Yeah. Or else do a long long plating also for the shaft fracture. Mm. But yeah. it was too, too low a shaft fracture, so I thought a nailing would be better. Amit, we have a good lecture of Dr. Trika on this subject. Mm, we have. Yeah. 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 Sunil and then uh, Sangeet Gawale. Sunil? If, he's, if Vivek is going to talk, then I will not ask the same question to Amit again. To waste same time. <clears throat> That's what we are going to discuss when to apply a plate and what are the factors where we apply a plate first and a nail later and how do we go about that? I want my question to Vivek rather than now. <laughs> Sangeet, uh, we come across similar situations where you have done a clamp assisted reduction and uh, you have locked the nail proximally and distally and as soon as you open the clamp, uh, the oblique fracture opens out. So, in those situations, what do you do? Uh, Sangeet, you're asking me? Yes, yes. Yeah, it happens. It happens many a times. Not, not only immediately after, it happens after months later also, at least three to four weeks later. And we have seen the x-rays. Tanna Sarai has also presented this. In such cases, I would, um, if, if I'm on table, if this is happening, then I would add a plate. I would again reduce, remove my lower interlocking screws. In the distal interlocking screws, we do the distal interlocking, but they are centralize the nail, additional plate, and then I put a interlocking screws. 
or an interlocking schools and then put a plate. These, there are various things. So what do you exactly want to tell Sangeet over here? No, see, the issue is, it is basically a malalignment of either, like you have a long oblique fracture, which you have reduced it with the clamp or a short oblique fracture. Yeah. It is opening up means what? There is some rotational malalignment. Basically, because of the medullary canal, which has not been fit tightly with the nail. It could be a mismatch of the nail and the medullary canal size. So, the reduction is opening out. That means there is a malreduction. Rather than adding up adjuvants like a polar yes. screw or interfrag or adjuvant plate, why not withdraw the nail, realign and then uh, redo that part of the nailing. Can I, can so I, by, removing, by removing the proximal screws also, you mean to say. And then the uh, entry point also. Because it could be because of the wrong entry point. I believe here you are asking wherein there is a proper entry point, proper nail placement in the proximal fragment, proper proximal lockings. And then if you think that distal locking is the, the problem or only the rotational problem is there at the fracture site, wherein you have not placed your uh, reduction uh, forceps properly, then it could be a, only a distal revision. If you feel if that on table, I feel the whole thing has gone wrong. That's my entry point is also wrong. Then I have to remove the whole nail and redo it. Sunil has something to say. There is a paper last year published by the putting a latch screws and the nail. So I have done eight cases like that because the obliquity on the proximal fragment, which I put two latch screws and then put an interlock nail that has served the purpose. So I'm just waiting for more patient because this is a very interesting paper. When I saw that, I was doing that, but we are not sure how to do it. But there is a very... Before nailing or after nailing? So after nailing, once you reduce it, clamp it, put a nail and then put a pull two lakh screws of that obliquity. They may not be a lakh screws because we may not get the direction what a lakh screw requires. But positional you screws. You mean positional screws? No, he no, meant lakh screws that is interfrags, no? Interfact yeah. scrolls by Paul Tornetta. There is yeah. a paper which has been published yeah. in JOT just too. last year <laughs> regarding the same. Which but then Vivek, I have, I have achieved reductions even after after the nailing. Yeah. After that, I put polar screws and yeah. then shifted the distal yeah. fragment and got a reduction in oblique fractures. I agree, Amit. It's all dependent on how yeah. thick the nail is in the medullary cavity and how much the play is there with the nail Absolutely. and the medullary yeah. cavity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that you can decide sir, whether you can paper. play around or not. Shushankar, sir, next presentation. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Amit, for the talk and you generated a lot of uh, discussion also. Now I request the Secretary of Nails, Dr. Amit Rastogi, for the evolution of intramedial nail, interlocking nails. Okay, uh, so this was supposed to be uh, the start of this thing, but because of the change in order, we could, uh, um, I, we, uh, I was, uh, I'm doing it second. So all of you do nailings and uh, nailings, I think are probably as Dr. Ramesh Singh just now said, probably the most commonly done orthopedic surgery nowadays. If you look at the history, we had Spanish and Aztecs use wooden implants for pseudarthrosis, Hein used ivory, and these are all natural materials. In 1800s, uh, Ambott in Belgium introduced uh, uh, metallic IM pins and Smith Peterson 1905, and some of my seniors up here listening might probably have done the Smith Peterson nail for hip fractures. This also brought in the first concepts of a biocompatible material. Biocompatible in the sense that uh, initially all the material used was just material. Nobody ever thought about what type of material we're putting in the human body. The father undoubtedly is uh, Gerhard Kulcher. He developed the concepts and principles and described three construct options. Pins, which control only alignment. Canal filling rods, which control alignment and translation. Nails, which control alignment. That is, those with interlocking bolts control alignment, translation, rotation, and length. And he devised two nails. The V-nail, which used to be compressible only in one side, from one side. And the clover leaf nail, which can be compressed from both the sides at right angles to one another. So we come to the, when we look at the history of uh, and the evolution of nails, we find that there are many generations of these nails and we'll come to them. But we can also classify nails on the basis of entry portals, like for example, the centromedullary nail, uh, like the K-nail or cephalomedullary nail, which we normally use, the condylocephalic nails like endo nail, which go retrograde, 
from condyle to cephalic. And of course, the direction, whether doing anti-grade nailing, that is from proximal to distal or retrograde, that is from this. So generations, first generation, second generation, third generation, and finally, nowadays we come to the fourth generation nail. So what was the first generation nail? Basically a splint with minimal rotational ability, but it had an ability to closely fit the metric canal in which it was uh, put in. There was a longitudinal slot along the entire length, and the classic example is the K nail. But all these K nails, and they had a very high failure rate. Why? Because there was no uniform manufacturing. There was no medical grade material available at that time. And there was unable to be a fluoroscopic imaging, which caused the nails to go way away in the canal, especially if the canal was very big. So if you look at, if you compare from the point of view of stability, uh, non-locking versus interlocking nails, uh, non-locking should not be used uh, other than in simple, stable, or minimally comminuted fracture because it does not offer any rotational stability and can be used only in selected cases and also needs approximation of cortex in contrast to interlocking nails, which offer st uh, torsional stability are, pop are popular in diaphyseal fractures, especially those which do not have cortical continuity and full acquisition of these fractures is not necessary. After the first generation came the second generation nail, which used biparticle screws proximal and distal, which controlled length and rotation. 72 Clem and Shellman actually introduced first commercially available interlocking nail. The RT nail, the Russell and Taylor nail, designed smaller and stronger nails because at that time there was a lot of uh, uh, concern about the deleterious effects of reaming. So that they wanted to minimize reaming and so use smaller nails but stronger nails so that they could ream less for bone conservation. In 1990s, the issue of endosteal vascularity disturbance uh, during reaming was reconsidered to the advantage of reaming, but unreamed nailing, because unreamed nailing did not attain adequate stability with the, and had lower union rates. And reaming, but uh, reaming was also uh, implicated in pulmonary complications. So that led to the uh, revaluation of reamer head design. And these were early generation, second generation nails, that is uh, the reconstruction type. Third generation nails were from 1998 to 2008, which resulted from, from analysis of failure of second generation. There was very high screw breakage rate with second generation, which involved materials as well as a structural change within the nail itself. Surgeons also during this time expanded the indication to metaphyseal fractures. Initially, you, these nails were used only for diaphyseal ones. Titan and minus alloys came to be uh, used more frequently and screws were made more fatigue resistant. And why interlocking screws fail by axolotling? The mechanism was also elucidated. This can be reduced by multi and can and was found to be reduced by multi-axial screw placement to make the nail more stable. There was also an evolution in materials. Initially, only austenitic stainless steels were used, 316 L and LVM. These were biocompatible and bioequivalent, but were not very strong. The next austenitic stainless steel used was orthanox, and this was typically used for gamma nails, which was very high strength nails because they were used in very high load situations like subprochanter fractures. Titanium uh, uh, was uh, then considered to be the blue-eyed boy of, uh, mm, of material science in orthopedics because it was newer, more elastic, had lower rim modulus, and CP titanium was the first type of titanium used. But it made explantation of these nails and screws very difficult. So alloys were used like titanium-6 aluminum for vanadium or titanium-6 aluminum and niobium which are anodized and high, higher strength. Entry points were also changed, like pyriformis or trochanteric entry was dependent on nail design. And so these there were nails which were uh, specifically for pyriformis entry and for uh, trochanteric entry. And reduction of the fracture methodology was also changed evolved through flexible wires and extensive imaging with more anatomical uh, and more anatomical nails with multiple bends was uh, developed. The latest fourth generation nails are uh, nails which have additional functions. Like for example, surface engineering with active or passive coupling of antibiotics for an antibiotic nail, sensor technologies for screw placement without the use of uh, image intensification and load stress telemetry. These are experimental, uh, these are experimental uh, uh, nails which measure load across the fracture site. And there are motorized nails also for management of limb length discrepancy, which are a remote control mechanism for distraction osteogenesis, which can actually control great and rhythm of distraction and provide reliable fragment stabilization as well. Entry points were changed. Why? Because if you all of you know this picture, and the 
Trochanter seems to be a very, very uh, attractive place. No uh, vascular uh, damage and therefore no chance of AVM. So the AO people calculated the change in the angle necessary to put in a trochanter entry nail, which was six degrees. So it had two types of nails, pyriformis entry and trochanter entry. Look at this patient, standard uh, shaft femur fracture, standard methodology of nailing, everything fine, good reduction, steel nail. Patient comes back after 15 days with a spiral subtrochanter, with a spiral uh, neck femur fracture, which was managed, of course, with the missile nail technique, went on to union. So the trochanteric versus pyriformis entry, fluoroscopy shots in trochanteric entry are less required. Operative time is also less. Intra-op GT fracture, although is more, and this is especially true for large diameter nails, which are uh, large diameter proximal femoral nails, like the gamma nail. The avian head is, of course, less. Average union time was 18 weeks and VAS score was also less. But pyriformis entry, more fluoroscopy, more operative time, and intraoperative neck femur fracture is more. Avian was also more. Average union time was actually lesser than 15 weeks, but the pain score was also a bit more. And this was an article published in JCOT in 2019. So what are nails? They extend from one end or other to, uh, and act like splints. Then they allow axial forces to be transmitted to the opposing, uh, opposite fragment and prevent angulation translation and to some extent rotatory movement. Contact between nail and bone exit between entry point, marrow, and that cancellous physical region on the opposite side uh, do the uh, work of load transmission. So in biomechanics, if you see good cortical contact, you have stable fixation, the bone shear load, and the nail actually works fairly well. But if there is no cortical contract, the nail transmits load, stress on interlocking screw, bend or break. Not all of it is dependent on uh, uh, the nail and some of it is, uh, and of course, some of it is dependent on bone also. So, and also the design of the nail. So design and local biomechanics have to be considered. Now, this is a subtrochanter area with high loads. There is a medial void, nail is transitioning at this point at the fracture side, the nail is transitioning from 11 to 13, 11, 13 to 11 millimeters and is now a load bearing implants, which if the fracture does not unite, leads to free failure. Similar case, uh, salvaged by a surface implant like an angle blade plate. When the screws fail, how do they fail? They fail actually at four places, at the point of uh, entry into the bone, at the point of entry into the nail, because the nail is a hollow structure, at the point of exit from the nail and the point of exit from the load. So frequently when you remove these um, broken screws, you will find that the nail, that the screw is actually broken in three places, the proximal fragment, the middle fragment, and the distal fragment. So the strength of the fixator or of any nail is basically dependent on all these five things, the shape, the diameter, the working length, area of contact reduction, and of course the material. So thin and loose fitting nail lead to an unstable construct, it will lead to a delayed non-union. So now got tight fitting nails, they might affect endosteal revascularization, but union rates, there is no really good paper which says that delayed healing is observed if the nail is snugly or tightly fitting. What about the shape? Now if you see the, the uh, Early nails were all a dry fly nail from Smith Peters and V nail and a, a clover leaf nail from this thing from uh, Gerard Kulcher Dana uh, Street, that is Street and Hansen nail, diamond shaped nail. And Gross and Kempf nail was a clover leaf nail with an open cross section, just like the standard thing, but had a bolt which was interlocking. And nowadays we use something like Russell and Taylor nail, which is a closed section. Why? Because a closed section nail has got much more torsional rigidity as compared to an open section nail. The working length. Uh, I think all of you are familiar with the concept. The important thing here is that the bending strength, stiffness of the nail is inversely proportional to the square of its working length. Now that's a huge, uh, the small change in the working length would lead to a large change in the uh, bending stiffness of the nail. And torsional stiffness is inversely proportional to its working length. So here also the working length is, uh, uh, does matter. A shorter working length means a stronger fixation not in the sense that it will allow the bone to unite, but it means it, uh, a stronger or stiffer nail can be an advantage or a disadvantage depending on which biological condition you're using it in. So when you compare the strength of nails, so rim nailing with increase, increases use of larger nail and improved nail bone contact, improves stability and reduces chance of bone splintering. Non-rim nailing is preferable in compound fractures because you don't remove the endosteal bone, but less stable as compared to uh, uh, to a rim nail and is suitable for mostly for forearm or upper limb bones. 
Done innovation, I think, is something uh, some, uh, one of our speakers is going to speak about, so I'm not going to go here. As well as Reeming, I think Ajit will be speaking on this. Thank you very much. Good talk, Amit. Uh, Amit, if yes. I want to really ask you only one question, what is the latest innovation you think uh, should be made uh, in design of nail uh, femur or tibia, you think, based on uh, whatever clinical difficulties we all are facing all over the world? This is a very huge question, sir. If you think, uh, uh, and very nice this thing, because this will give me food for thought for August. <laughs> uh, if you think that there is one right nail, then I think you are sorely mistaken. There is no one right nail. A one right nail for a tibia or a one right nail for the femur does not exist. The reason why nails fail is not because of the fact that they've got wrong material or wrong technique. They also fail because of the wrong anat uh, anatomy of the fracture. The anatomy of the fracture will dictate the type of nail which you're going to use. So if you've got, let us assume that you are doing a trochanteric fracture, a simple trochanteric fracture, which is the right nail? Do you want to use a two, two screw device? Do you want to do use an integrated two screw device? Do you want to use a helical blade? It will depend on what type of uh, bone you are getting. So it's all a complex. It's not something which uh, is like a, a made to order thing that you use this nail, whatever okay, fracture. So, so to uh, pin you down on just interlocking screws, what design of interlocking screws should be a good design? Okay, or, that's uh, I think a very, very nice question which you can, you can get a specific answer to. The bending strength and the breakage strength of screws is dependent on the core diameter of the screw. So I do not know if you know that there was one uh, uh, French company which actually never brought out screws at all. It was all quarter pins. So those pins had at the proximal end near the head, they had a small threaded area which allowed the and there was a big thick shaft which used to go in across the nail and onto the other side. These are the kind of uh, uh, quarter pins actually which would be most resistant to break. How do you put them in? How do you put them in? You drill them. The, the quarter pin diameter is the drill diameter. You understand? Suppose the quarter pin, the pin is 4 millimeters in diameter, you drill with the 4 millimeter drill. You are putting it in at uh, the metaphysical end. So you don't need to enlarge the entry hole for this uh, screw portion. This was, uh, I've forgotten the name of the nail. Uh, I used to do it fairly commonly and it was a French nail. So should people brought it out. Okay. Any questions for Amit? Amit, wonderful presentation because you have brought out so many new things and uh, from the beginning there is a new generation of nails. And it's a value addition in the knowledge of all delegates as well as to the, I think, in the faculty members. Thank so, Sushrut, go ahead with the third lecture. <clears throat> Ajit? Yeah, good morning. Um, grateful to IOA as well as Nails for giving me this opportunity to be part of this uh, wonderful program. My brief is to talk on the uh, reaming in uh, locked intermediary nailing uh, scenario. We'll be talking about the uh, principles, uh, some of the uh, techniques and the com uh, complications associated with that briefly. It's not moving forward. One moment. I'm just having a, just give me a minute to check out. Click the mouse on your screen, then again it will go. Once you click there, and second time when you click, it will advance. Yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah, so sorry about that. Um, yeah, most of the principles uh, from Garad Punsha's time is still uh, relevant uh, in uh, the nailing scenario even today. And like Dr. Amit said, I think uh, although research is ongoing in this, uh, most of the answers are out in the open now, but perhaps most of the uh, research was done during the late 80s and 90s when the uh, controversies about uh, 
damage control orthopedics versus uh, early total care was in the offing for the polytraumatized uh, patient. We are all aware that uh, there are uh, extensive benefits of uh, reaming. Uh, first and foremost is it enlarges the medullary canal, which increases the uh, size of the nail that can be used. Uh, it improves the nail bone contact, which again enhances the stability. As has been mentioned by Dr. Rastogi, it decreases the working length, which increases strength. And this added stability decreases the uh, risk of uh, fatigue failure of the implants. So we are all aware of this, and that's why most of us do ream nailings most of the time. Now, reaming has uh, certain advantages as well as a few disadvantages. Uh, there is an alteration in the not just the medullary blood supply, but even the cortical as well as the periosteal blood supply is uh, altered. And uh, we are aware that the intramedullary blood loss, I mean, uh, the blood supply is damaged to a great extent temporarily. But at the same time, uh, there is reactive hyperemia that happens in the uh, peripheral or the periosteal blood supply. And uh, even the intramedullary disruption of uh, or the endosteal disruption of blood supply is uh, uh, restored within uh, 8 to 12 weeks. There is this issue of embolization that happens with reaming, but the most of the microemboli that has been shown through transesophageal echocardiography uh, does not cause problems in the stable patients. In the polytraumatized or the under resuscitated uh, patients, that may be an issue. We'll talk about that briefly. Then the reaming products uh, have uh, 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 mesenchymal potential for fracture healing. And of course, there is this issue of uh, thermal uh, energy that is uh, uh, produced by the act of reaming. Um, like I mentioned, the medullary uh, disruption of blood supply is re-established. And at the end of uh, three to six months, there is no difference whether you ream or you do not ream. So at one point, reamed, unreamed nails were more popular, but uh, there have been many complications. And uh, right now, reamed intramedullary nailing is the uh, preferred methodology. Few points about uh, uh, doing uh, a, a perfect uh, nailing. Um, one is, of course, to minimize the chances of uh, thermal uh, damage, do not use the tonique. Almost uh, none of us do that. Um, the other important point is to use sharp, deep fluted reamers so that, uh, again, the amount of heat generated is minimized and uh, you can finish your procedure in a quicker time. Then the first reamer has to be a front cutting reamer. And uh, you start small and proceed with 0.5 mm increments uh, up until there is enough chatter to tell you that the reaming is adequate and you can use the appropriate size the nail. So we will talk about the uh, pressure effects and so forth in, in subsequent uh, uh, slides. So when you're reaming, when the act of reaming is going on, you uh, use the maximum RPM, but you advance slowly. You use maximum RPM to uh, avoid incarceration of the reamer heads and you advance slowly so that the heat generation is minimized. And the ideal way is to go in and out, in and out uh, in, a, in a sort of a synchronized manner so that there, the, the reamer doesn't get stuck in a, uh, at, uh, uh, at the isthmus. This is a pressure graph to tell us the amount of uh, pressure uh, based on the uh, speed of your uh, reamer. When it is only 450 revolutions per minute, the pressures are very, very high. But when you go to a high speed, like say 1350 revolutions per minute, the pressure is much less. So that's one important thing, uh, experimentally also proven and clinically as well. This is a slide to tell us that uh, you need deep fluted re reamers because if you have blunt reamers, they get jammed easily and the uh, uh, the cortical temperature is almost three times higher uh, with a blunt reamer as opposed to a sharp uh, reamer. And so with the ongoing studies that were going on earlier, 
they design various uh, types of uh, tips for the i mean uh, tips of the reamers and uh, although these conical type of reamers minimize or reduce the uh, pressures to some extent it was not all that clinically significant what they found subsequently was the uh, sharp reamers with a thin shaft you can see the uh, ratios here with a 9 mm drive shaft the pressure was 715 millimeters of mercury with a 7 mm drive shaft it, it dropped down to 210 and that's the one most of us i think use with the sin ream and here's the graph to tell us the ao standard reamer versus the sin ream reamer the differences in the pressure with a 9 mm shaft and with a 13 mm size reamer so the sin ream system of uh, reaming with a narrow drive shaft is what gives the least amount of uh, pressure readings now to understand uh, the pressure changes that occur in the intramedullary canal if the fracture is proximal there is less pressure as we go further down the pressure is more while reaming and if it's an uh, say a minimally displaced fracture or a spiral long fracture those have uh, more, much more pressure than in a totally disrupted and displaced fracture this is all in uh, uh, in concurrence with the pascal's uh, law of liquid pressures so just coming to the uh, amount of pressure changes that can occur in uh, during nailing just the act of introducing your all the pressure can go up about 250 to 260 millimeters of mercury introduction of the guide wire is surprisingly very very high the first entry is very high 500 to 1000 millimeters the first reamer again is uh, higher subsequent reamers in some uh, uh, papers it's a little different but in one particular paper it said 4, 420 to 1510 what is important is the pressure is less in the proximal segment because the reaming products come out at the fracture site but it is more in the distal segment because everything is uh, contained within the uh, distal fragment unless of course it's a comminuted fracture the act of introducing the nail itself the pressures are not as much as what it is when you are introducing the guide wire or when you are using your first reamer now what about uh, malleting or hammering the nail in with gentle hammering it's very minimal 60 millimeters of mercury but if you're constantly hammering then it goes up to close to 250 to 300 millimeters of mercury so these things we have to bear in mind particularly in the uh, multiple injured patient or if you're doing a bilateral femur these small differences in pressures can make a big difference to the outcome of the patient so there are very many controversies many of them have been definitively answered like uh, always there was a worry about rib fractures and uh, reaming but it has been proven by studies uh, from all over the world that if there is a lung contusion then of course you have to be very very careful about reaming you have to wait for the um, uh, systemic inflammatory response to settle before you undertake uh, reaming in the brain injured patient initially there were concerns but now studies from the west have said that uh, it does not make much of a difference whether you do reamed or unreamed nailing and of course the under resuscitated patient is at high risk of developing ARDS if you uh, do a ream nailing particularly in the multiply injured situation and in particular if you're uh, nailing bilateral femora those are uh, inherent uh, risks by themselves and uh, with extensive deglout uh, open tibial fractures of course the risk of uh, devitalizing the blood supply intramedullary as well as the already disrupted extramedullary blood supply can give rise to uh, increased incidence of infection non union and so forth um, studies have shown that the uh, during the act of reaming the temperatures can go up to about 50 degrees centigrade and th there are studies that act actually tell us that for thermal injury to bone uh, to occur the temperature has to be in the range of about 56 degrees centigrade but again that has to be sustained for about a minute or so not for a few seconds it has to be sustained for quite some time and that's why the although uh, thermal necrosis is a discussed topic uh, a few case reports but not uh, too many uh, 
people have a major uh, series on that. Like I mentioned, small emboli are very well tolerated by patients and uh, right from the 90s, transesophageal echoes have shown a huge uh, burst of uh, uh, marrow material going into the lungs and chest, but uh, with no uh, clinical significance. But if a patient is uh, having chest injury or is, uh, has pre-existing lung illness, or a polytraumatized situation, then there is a definite risk of uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome. So you need to be very wary of that. And uh, uh, another issue is uh, even uh, infected uh, femora, if you're reaming out to remove the uh, infected material, they, they also have a higher risk of uh, chest embolus. Uh, the the uh, microemboli are higher in those situations. This is a paper by Pope to tell us that uh, only in the situation where the lung is already contused, reaming causes more damage. But if there is only rib fractures and no uh, 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 substance injury to the lung, then it is fairly safe to carry out uh, judicious nailing, uh, ream nailing. Literature has uh, sorted out the uh, difference between, I mean, in the infection, infected situation, whether you use unreamed or reamed nailing, there is no difference in the outcome. And uh, reamed nailings are better in terms of time to union and reoperation rates. Thoracic injury is the major det uh, determinant for pulmonary complications. And head injury, like I said, reamed nailing did not worsen the outcomes. However, when you have a badly... Uh, uh, soft tissue injured patient with uh, complex fracture, then there is always a risk of infection. So you may need to uh, think of other modalities of fixation, whether it is uh, an external fixator like a ring fixator or uh, another methodology. That's up to the individual uh, uh, surgeon or the departments. Of late, um, the uh, to minimize the complications of ream nailing and the MLI pro pro problems, uh, the RIA or the reamer uh, irrigated aspirator has come into the market. The only problem is, is this starts off at about 12 millimeter diameter, which most Indian uh, patients, uh, it's not feasible. But uh, it, it is very useful as a source of bone graft while re reaming. And also uh, in the West, they've used it uh, in the infected scenario where uh, they can uh, ream as well as wash out the canal at the same time. And the risk of embolization is much less uh, with the reamer irrigated aspirator system. So the take home message is intramedullary reaming is the gold standard for uh, locked intramedullary nailing uh, currently. What we need to do is to uh, you have to ream with the full uh, RPM, but you need to advance slowly. Use sharp, deep fluted, uh, fluted reamers. Withdraw frequently while reaming. Be wary of reaming in patients with chest injury, particularly in contused lungs. If you have a thin shaft reamer, they have the least pressure effects. And the RIA has promising uh, benefits. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Ajit, for that wonderful exposure to all the reaming modalities, how to get better result with reaming and how to minimize the complication. Uh, I have a question for you. As yes, you rightly sir. said, when you are reaming the proximal fragment of the femur, there is not much of a problem. The reamer blocks the mouth of the uh, canal when you are reaming in the distal fragment. Yeah. Uh, is there any way like making a drill hole in the distal fragment or anything which can minimize this? And is there any paper which deals about this? Yeah, earlier there were plenty of studies where they did a venting of the distal shaft uh, for this very uh, concern. Uh, and a lot of papers earlier about that. I, I remember reading at least uh, three or four papers in the uh, early 90s or mid 90s. But uh, uh, the seminal uh, work from Sunderland, uh, I forget the name of the author, one in uh, a Nanus team there in Sunderland, they were the first to show this uh, transesophageal echocardiography, huge emboli going through uh, that and absolutely no side effects in the normal patients. In the 
uh, comorbid patients, in the uh, people with poor lung reserve, and with people polytraumatized patients, then there is an issue. But otherwise, uh, I don't think we are reaming elderly, 90 year olds, 85 year olds routinely. You are doing your uh, trochanters all over the country with absolutely no side effects. I don't think there's a major issue there. Yeah. Okay, Sangeet. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> what they now repeatedly tell is uh, uh, what increases the intramedullary pressure, insertion of anything suddenly That's with right. force. So that means your guide wire should go slowly. It should not be forced. Whether True. it is uh, your uh, guide wire, reamer, and also the nail, it should go slowly in the distal canal. Otherwise, it increases the uh, intramedullary pressure in the compromised patient or in elderly, and that leads to uh, high uh, chances of P. Very true. Very the true, same is true uh, when you're putting a intramedullary rods for a knee replacement. <clears throat> Very true, sir. Shruth has to say something. Uh, Ajit, there is a beautiful design from Zimmer. Uh, I think it's called as a nature nail or natural nail or something. It has got a flute uh, which is, you know, it's kind of uh, curvilinear all along the length of the nail. And they have shown that while inserting, the nail kind of rotates a little bit, but it does not significantly increase the intramedullary pressure. But whatever particles still remain within the canal and the marrow fluid, it kind of uh, comes out when you are simultaneously inserting the nail. Uh, it came and it went off for some funny reason because uh, in addition to decreasing the uh, intermediate pressure, it was also trying to rotate the nail if it is uh, not adequate size and if there is some mismatch between um, the uh, rimming size and the nail size. Uh, so that's a good advantage of the design of the nail to decrease the uh, pressure. Have you used that? Any experience? No, I've not used that, but reading about the reamers, the conical reamers that they did, the I showed you showed you the picture of those uh, tapered uh, reamers, and the, some of them had a device to suck out the contents as they ream, but they found that the size of the reamer shaft actually made the bigger difference than the uh, sucking out the uh, reamer. Uh, I mean, the medullary contents as you put it in. So I don't know how that contrasts with the RIA, RIA system. Um, I'm not sure, but uh, they the study the papers that I read they say that the the type of uh, reaming system that uh, Synream has has better benefits. They have okay. another have in fact for you since, even uh, yeah uh, the golden tip uh, reamer from Zimmer versus exchangeable. Uh, tip of reamer system. So if you closely observe, practically the golden tip Zimmer reamers have narrower shaft and a wider uh, yeah. tip as against uh, same width of diameter of the reamer. Yeah. So bringing up your point that the width of the reamer is more important. So practical suggestion uh, to take home for all of us is golden tip independent reamers better than uh, exchange tip reamers? Yeah, provided the shaft is also thin. Thin? Yeah. Yeah. Can I, can I butt in here? Yes, sir. Yeah. yeah. Uh, see, what happens is that you, if you look at manufacturers, people who make those reamer shafts with detachable heads, they have to have a fairly large amount, thicker reamer shaft because they would have to use a linkage yeah. at one place. If you've got an integrated reamer shaft and head, which is non-detachable, then you can afford to make a thinner reamer shaft because you know that you've got a stronger connection between the reamer shaft. The reason is that people want to make sure that the reamer, shaft, reamer head is not going to break off and detach and you will have to re uh, remove it later on and have a struggle with you. So what's the take home message, both of you? So I think that you should always use dedicated reamers, a small head reamer with a thin shaft. Okay. And also not to jump reaming. Yeah, so not to jump reaming. Sequentially. Yes, Sangeet. Yeah, Sangeet uh, and Vivek. Vivek has raised his hand before me. Let, let him ask. 
Okay. Just two points. But what Sangeet was saying was that the initial entry inside the intermediary, that's when the maximum embolus is happening. So that's what we need to take care. And we put in saline out at that time and wash it out. That's the first thing which every person should ensure while reaming. The second thing is, as was said, the smaller shaft and the bigger diameter of the flute is very important. That's what everybody wants to follow. Third thing, RIA 2 is now available, which has got a diameter starting from 10 mm rather than 12. So if RIA 2 is available, maybe we can be using it much more in our settings with the 10 mm diameter of the intermediary start. Just two things to add. Uh, the old reamers, they generate a lot of heat and thereby thermal necrosis. So if you are using the old reamers, which are blunt, if you are not able to replace at least pour saline, as Vivek also mentioned, uh, when the reaming is difficult, particularly in the isthmus, where uh, you hear that sound while reaming. And second thing, what Shushrut was mentioning, see in synthesis also, the shaft diameter of these reamers, they change when you are moving from 11 and above. It is not the same shaft diameter of the reamer. So the same applies to the Zimmer also, a narrow and uh, if something happens, like if your one reamer gets blunt, it is easy or it will be cheaper to uh, change only that detachable piece. If it is 9.5 or 10, uh, you don't have to buy entire, which would be costing more. Okay. So I will ask a last question and then we'll finish. In spite of taping all precautions, if we are stuck to, uh, there is an impaction of this uh, flute inside the medullary canal, then how to get it out? Actually, you have to ream over a beaded guide wire. Yes, okay. Ajit. No, you you are using it uh, over a uh, tipped guide wire, isn't it, sir? So the guide wire has to be. Uh, you need to slap it back. The guide wire. You use the connector on the top and uh, slap it back. It is, sometimes it's very difficult. That's why you need to go in and out, in and out, in and out while you're reaming, not just jam it in and then uh, you know so the, look for help. Uh, it has happened in the past. Uh, the tipped guide wire, you can attach it uh, at the top end to a this thing and uh, snap hammer it back. That's one. And second thing is uh, some of the reaming system have a reverse mode also. So never do the re 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 removal of the reamer in the reverse mode. That will unwind the coil and uh, that has given many trouble. Yeah. Anyway, let's move to the next topic by Sushrut. It's about the floating knee injuries. The connection is lost. Amit. So Shiva has brought an important point. Never uh, uh, reverse the reamer. You can push and withdraw it, but never reverse it. It will break that reamer shaft particularly when we used to have the spring uh, in the shaft, it used to get disconnected at the junction. Okay, yes. can yes. everyone see me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I think uh, those, uh, Sangeet, those coils wala reamers are gone now. Yes. That them anymore. So I, uh, thanks uh, everyone uh, to be here and I'm going to brief on uh, floating knee. Uh, Floating knee, as we all know, are ipsilateral fractures of femur and tibia. Uh, they are not so uncommon as have been uh, thought about. Uh, so when the, prior, when the knee joint is isolated, either partially or completely, uh, that's what uh, when we call it as uh, a floating knee injury. Uh, as I said, it is not an uncommon injury and has been described way back in 1975 uh, by this gentleman but uh, and lots of articles have also been uh, reported with varying uh, degrees of uh, and intensity of uh, injury uh, pattern that is seen with floating knee injuries the commonest classification though uh, is this particular classification wherein uh, Blake and McBride have uh, differentiated between a true floating knee, wherein knee joint is isolated completely, or a variable of floating knee, wherein uh, one part, which is type 2A, is only the knee joint alone is involved, and wherein type 2B can be an associated fracture neck of femur, or associated also uh, a fracture around ankle, which is uh, most commonly seen 
in uh, polytrauma situations. So this is uh, the classifications with uh, Jamie Waddell from uh, Toronto has described with Fraser, wherein type one is a completely extra articular injury. Type two is uh, uh, the one which uh, we uh, talked about, wherein type two oh, A is with TBL plateau, uh, with a femoral shaft. Type two B is intraarticular distal femur with tibial shaft and type 2C is both sides. It is an intra-articular injury uh, of lower end of femur and proximal tibia. So that's uh, what we need for documentation purpose. Management is quick assessment, X-ray and uh, CT scan. So when initially we started uh, 10, 15 years back looking at these injuries, we used to always span, scan and plan uh, the injury and how we evolved through uh, management of floating knee uh, seen as an isolated injury or as a part of polytrauma victims, we will see. So initially it was span, uh, putting an external fixator and then distracting, then doing a CT scan and then planning uh, for uh, treatment. Of course, we have to have uh, a good OT table with a possibility of uh, various attachments to do this uh, floating knee kind of a situation. Uh, basically, if, uh, sorry, uh, fixation of both the fractures is to be attempted. Operating conditions must be clearly uh, good enough to have uh, good uh, stabilization. Inadequate fixation is worse. So uh, make sure that you have all the armamented and instrumentation ready when you uh, do this. Uh, due to positioning problems, femoral neck subtrochanic fractures should be addressed before at the first go, then tibial fractures. And attention has to be given to be uh, to associated ligamentous injuries also. So let's look at this uh, first case, which uh, uh, we did something like 18 or 20 years back. And when we thought that both these injuries, which is uh, lower end of femur and proximal tibia can be uh, tackled with one single incision, one kind of a nail. That point in time, we had no uh, idea of dealing with upper third tibia. So that's what we used. We used the same supracondylar nail uh, in a reverse fashion, same incision to tackle with this. Of course, a uh, very uh, old generation one uh, lower end femur nail seen in both the situations uh, and fortunately it held uh, well uh, in good position but then we evolved with uh, our ideas so this is uh, a polytrauma victim with a uh, fracture neck of femur trochantic fracture uh, lower third femur fracture with an extension intra-articular and proximal tibia uh, as well seen so a retrograde femur nail an independent uh, fixation of lower end of femur there and a proximal tibia fixed with a independent fixation of uh, proximal tibia and um, a fracture fixed with uh, a trochanteric fracture. So this is a case which uh, from Professor Holes, which uh, gave us some insight into how uh, fixation can be done. And then we moved on to uh, our uh, concept of developing uh, fixation concepts in this floating knee injury. So that's a, a fracture lower end of femur with a vascular injury. We treated that with a, a retrograde femur nail and a uh, independent fixation of tibia. Uh, that um, gave us a good uh, access to vascular uh, reconstruction and uh, fixation uh, independently in lower end uh, femur and proximal tibia. With this evolved the concept of at least a tackling floating knee injuries in the same go, uh, retrograde nail was one uh, advantage because with the same incision patient in supine position, uh, we could tackle both the injuries of femur and tibia. Uh, though uh, the concept of multi-directional, multi-angular screws, distal locking in uh, lower end femur, in retrograde nail uh, was evolving. And now, of course, we have 
for uh, this kind of nails, multi-directional, multi-angular uh, plates. Um, so I chose to do a uh, anti-grade nail in this uh, injury because the knee was fired. But since the knee was open, uh, did a uh, conventional tibia nailing, anti-grade femur nailing. Uh, the wound healed well and uh, fortunately had a good range of uh, movements. So closed rim anti-grade femur nailing is also another option. Uh, lower end femur, distal femur, retrograde nail uh, is an advantage uh, in femur nailing, but we must uh, now uh, seek forth for uh, newer generation distal femur nails, which allow us to uh, do distal locking in a multi-directional, multi-angular fashion to have less chances of screws backing off because these kind of screws, which we, we, we used to use them, uh, which we used to put in parallel with each other, have very high chances of backing off. So locked distal screws are important, multi-angular, multi-directional uh, benefit, retrograde femur nail and blocking screws uh, probably are beneficial. So that's an example wherein multi-directional screws can be put in very effectively and uh, used um, in floating knee injuries. Retrograde nailing is useful. So uh, to kind of conclude uh, what floating knee injuries demand is uh, probably a retrograde nailing and anti-grade tibia nailing. If there is an associated neck femur or a trochanteric fracture or an associated ankle injury, it has to be tackled independently. The sequence has to be proximal to distal. So the first has to be a proximal femur fracture then retrograde nail or anti-grade nail for femur and then tibia, lastly, the ankle. So it's not a rare injury. Polytrauma uh, can be associated with floating knee. So uh, associated vascular ligamentous injury has to be uh, looked for. Stabilization of femur has to be done first, followed by tibia. Retrograde nailing of femur and anti-grade nailing of tibia through same incision is possible. Articular injury requires perfect restoration as we always do of articular surface. So distal femur and tibial plateau, if is there, has to be addressed uh, in terms of reconstructing the articular surface well. We have revised uh, the initial protocol to scan, which is a preliminary quick scan, then span and maybe re-scan to have good adequate assessment of comminuted fragments if there is an articular fractures and then plan for your uh, way of tackling individual fractures. Of course, early mobilization will achieve faster recovery and that should be the goal. And that's why good, adequate, stable fixation of all individual components is important. Thank you. Thank you, Sushrut. Uh... Sushrut is the immediate past secretary of NAILS and is the president-elect of NAILS at present. A wonderful presentation. Any question? One question. Yes, Amit. Uh, Sushrut. Yeah. The still femur nailing is fine, but then if at all those fractures are in the proximal extra-articular region, that's a metaphyseal fractures, and if you feel that you want to do a suprapatellar nailing, then. so have you ever gone and done a suprapatellar nailing along with the distal femur? Nailing. Suprapatellar approach in tibia. So oh, I've done a lot of suprapatellar uh, tibia nailing by now. Uh, but the question is if the fracture is in upper third in femur. No, in the no, 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 no. Tibia, I'm talking about to be tibia suprapatellas. No. So in case there is a floating uh, knee injury, there is no point in doing a suprapatellar nailing because then the preferred approach is a conventional. Parapatellar incision, same incision for retrograde nailing of femur, same incision for tibia. So, so that's parapatellar the, means you open the joint or it's an infrapatellar uh, split ex, uh, tendinous approach? I prefer to open the joint, parapatellar and do a, a retrograde as well as tibia nailing. For a medial parapatellar, you flip the patella 
open Correct. the joint. Yeah, once you open the joint, then you can do whatever. You can do a supraparietal or also. Yeah. So, uh, Shishrut, what he is asking is very relevant point. Now, ideally, for proximal third, we uh, ideal implant would be a supra or approach would be a supra patellar. I agree. And in a That's floating true. knee, if we do it, we are opening the uh, femoral fracture. No, the point is, if you take a supra patellar approach, which is the preferred approach for upper third tibia, then you will have to take another incision for doing the retrograde femur. I, I understand, but by taking a supra patellar approach. You are almost opening the fracture, which is in the distal femur. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So don't do it for floating. You should do it. But there are certain yeah. fractures now today. Given a point today, mm. like um, the infrapatellar uh, tibia nailing, you may look today. The knowledge is so much that suprapatellar uh, has been put into our mind so much that you may not achieve the proper entry point by the infrapatellar uh, nailing, infrapatellar approach in the tibia. You have to approach that upper step. That's an intra-articular entry point in the tibia. Completely understand and I completely agree with you, Amit. Suprapatellar approach for upper third tibia fracture as an isolated injury is perfect. But with a combined injury of femur, where you will need to do a retrograde nail, preferred approach should be the conventional approach. Yeah, that is absolutely then, okay. Understood. But is there a harm, again, Sangeet, again, over here, is there a harm in opening that suprapatellar space to do no. a suprapatellar nailing? Yeah. Amit, no. I mean, the network is there. No, there is no harm. Shiva, you are speaking. Which, which should be done first, femur or tibia? Yeah. Sir, Pima. sir, may I intervene? Yes, yes please. Yes, sir. Yes, it is in the suprapatellar ipsilateral. I have done it, and if first to fix the tibia, first to fix the tibia, stabilize it. And then it is better to have a, because you need a fracture femur, traction and many other manipulations. So, so on a stable construct of a leg, you can do a easier uh, suprapatellar kneeling. So I have done it by suprapatellar approach and through the tendon splitting approach uh, for the supracondylar nail. It's very easy. But as you said, it's a, it requires a much more precision. And uh, it is better that Susruth said you do a medial parapatellar orthotomy, you know, do both the things that, that can be done. But uh, more precision is required because the unstable of the instability of the femur as well as the tibia. So you need to have a stable construct first of your leg and then for a supra. Sir, but do you uh, find any problems if you do the tibia first by a suprapatellar approach and then if you are doing an infrapatellar distal femur? We are not dealing with the intra-articular extension in a supracondylar fracture. You need to have an extra-articular fracture. Extra -articular, yeah. Yes, if you have an intra-articular fracture, it's not a very good idea. Okay. Uh, no, Amit, but to answer your question, there should not be any problem. Anyways, if exactly, you... I think there should not be a problem. This, yeah, there should not be any problem. Uh, so the joint is open twice, so once up from and once down. Yeah. That's the only issue. So, yeah. Sure. yeah. Uh, yes, sir. Now, if we are not doing a suprapatellar approach mm -hmm. and uh, uh, we are doing by infra infrapatellar approach, both, yeah. uh, uh, how do you adjust the position? So, we I always do femur first as the rest of the world always does femur first and tibia second. Most of the times, you if it's a fresh case which almost always is. Traction is not a huge issue. That's number one. Number two is... Uh, to my surprise, when I looked back at all my floating knee injury patients, a lot of times there is some associated undisplaced trochanteric fracture always associated. So uh, that should be given importance. Once you are dealing with that, anyways, femur is a uh, big uh, thing. And uh, your uh, I do in a way wherein the knee is dangling on the end of the table. So positioning, supine position is not a problem at all. Uh, because if you do the tibia first, as Dr. Uh, Gadigone has suggested, yeah. uh, how do we correct the procurvatum uh, or the flexion of the proximal tibia? If it's upper third tibia fracture, yeah. Yeah. I use polar screws. No, 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 no. Sure. It is, what I'm saying is in the presence of unfixed femoral fracture, yeah. they're doing the tibia first. Yeah, yeah, it's very difficult to do that. I agree. So, so in my books, uh, 
and whatever references and all the published literature, I think people have all over the world preferred femur first and then tibia. So, but Dr. Gadegudi can answer this. No? He's, he's doing tibia. No, no, I am doing it in that way because they, yeah. I don't know the, what is the literature is saying. But in my practice, I do the tibia first and then I go for the femur. Sir, what but, is the uh, position? The, uh, position. Position so, because you are putting in a sem semi extended position. So you must concentrate. Sir, 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 sir understand the question. Yes. We are not doing a supra patellar nailing. Yes. We are doing an infra patellar nailing. In that position, uh, how do you, uh, because we cannot have, a, con we cannot control the extension of the proximal fragment in that position because femur is fractured. So, so in what that case, the ideal position? Uh, in that case, probably on the booster, uh, you have a, a, a fixation first of the femur, stabilize it because more concerned over the procurator, therefore uh, tibia next. We will first concentrate on the femur in this situation. Okay. Dr. 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 Gadegode, I think yeah. uh, he does the suprapatellar nailing in tibia first and then... Uh, yeah, Sir. first. Amit and Sangeet, in floating knee injuries, uh, the femur always is a junctional fracture, as you always say, Amit. It's always lower third femur. It's Correct. highly unstable. So, unless until you control that, your tibia is... No, I fully understand you, Sushit. But then this is a rare case which Dr. Kadekona has done. We are discussing that. So, a suprapatellar entry in a tibia nail... And, and uh, for the that is in there. a semi-extended position. No, yeah. Dr. Gade Kone. So I think we will yeah. not confuse too much. Suprapatellar approach is not for a fracture, floating injury. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Uh, we oh have God. a question by Sunil and Vivek. Gade Kone, Gade Kone, sir. What is the logical uh, uh, explanation behind TBA doing first? Because you can wait for TBA because femur is a bigger bone. Logically, bigger bone should be stabilized first. And then tibia can be, if suppose patient develops something problem, that there is a chances of pulmonary embolism or the, the, the fat embolism is more on tibia than the than femur. Femur is more dangerous fracture and more uh, bleeding goes more on. So if you're able, unable to do the second uh, nailing, so better to stabilize the larger bone first. That's a logically and physiologically accepted worldwide. So there is no logic behind doing a tibia first. Yes. Vivek. Yeah. yeah, the same thing was that, as uh, Dr. Sushut has said, it's a mechanism of injury is pretty high. So, femur has to be tackled first because many a times we had situations when we had to abandon the tibia. But the second thing is, when we were doing infrapatellar, we have a huge series of floating hip. When we were doing infrapatellar, the femur automatically was the first thing to do and then we used to do tibia. However, the confusion has started with suprapatellar entry points. So, now in that, as Dr. Gadegona is saying, if you are doing suprapatellar nailing for the tibia, then you will have to do nailing first of the tibia because it's easier. It's on a semi-extended position. You don't have to bend the knee and procurvatum and other risks are less. Preferable will be, as Dr. Sushut has said, a parapatellar approach by which you can approach both the things at the same time without damaging the quadriceps tendon as well, as well as the patellar tendon, which we now have shifted. You have given one minute. Conclude. My basic <laughs> question was after doing the femur in the flexed position, can you semi extend and do the tibia in the uh, semi extended position by supra? So that is mm -hmm. a femur, femur is done in which position? Flexed position in the on the tibia frame. That is what I do. I do on a tibia oh. frame, the femur, okay. distal oh, femur. Then, and then, then semi extended position, a suprapatellar entry, tibia nail. Okay. Anyway, if you have yeah. any doubt, if you have any doubt any time, it's always better to give a slap for the tibia and do the femur. And yes. if time permits and the anesthetist, anesthetist give exactly. the permission, remove. Oh, yes or no? Can you do the supra nailing entry point later? Yes or no? On the same same. Yes, uh, yes, yes. You yes. can do. There are many ways to skin yes, up. No, it is possible. Why not? Yes. Why not? Yeah. Correct. Yeah. 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 Ye
So I should I have, I have one more, but one more, one more. No, not more. Before, the, before I, more. I talk, because more. the floating knee, there is a lot of injury to the quadriceps also. So, uh -huh. so why do you want to uh, for that injured again the knee joint by doing supracondyl? I have never done this uh, supracondyl nailing for extra articular fractures till till recently the multi-directional nail has come. But okay. I do all my uh, floating knee by anti-grade nailing form. Uh, for femur first and then for infrapatellar, never done in my life the suprapatellar nailing. This is all nothing. But okay. So, okay. Uh, you, have, you have made your point. Now I will tell you, Sunil. Yeah. Sunil, anti grade nail as an option for femur is agreed, possible, not debated. Oh, no, I am asking. Most of, most of the times. Already injured. Most of the time. Are again damaging the knee joint by doing a parapetal incision. That's what I'm saying. Three. Floating knee mother, most of the times it is a junctional fracture which is lower third femur. Okay. Yeah, right. Anti-grade nail will not control your uh, wider canal lower Absolutely. third femur Absolutely. fracture. Retrograde nail is better. Number and one. Retrograde Number nail two, it's, also a, it's a misconception nail. that retrograde nail damages the knee joint. It's gone. So retrograde nail does not damage articular surface if done properly does not do that. Not saying third that. point. Third point. Third point. With advent of multi-directional, multi-angular supracondylar nail, That's now we are better off in having the weapon in hand of retrograde nail. Better design, better control. Absolutely. So doing the anti-grade nail, Sunil is gone now. With this nail. Yeah. Nail. Sunil nail. also has started retrograde nailing for your information. Anyway, I think we are Shiva. Yeah, yeah. Shiva. So let's, let's move on. Shiva. Let's, move on. Let's, let's move on to the next topic. Sure, next Daniel, topic. Sangeet, uh, I request Sangeet to talk about the flipped uh, uh, intercalary fragment in a fracture. Sunil, sorry, sorry for that. But anyway, that that's one of the method of treatment. Oh, I, I just Probably all of us are telling the same thing in a different way. Uh, can I start? Yeah, yeah, please. Okay. So uh, my talk is about this fragment, which flips by say 180 degrees or 90 degrees in certain diaphyseal fractures of femur and tibia. Very often, <clears throat> we have a situation that after a fixation, a good fixation of the proximal and the distal major fragment, you end up in a situation where uh, a large fragment, uh, butterfly fragment is rotated by some degrees and you are left with a gap uh, on the medial side or one side of the tibia. So what happens in this situation, uh, whether this displacement of the fragments or a persistent gap uh, or the fragment which has rotated by certain degrees does all of them become avascular? Do they have a strangulation of the blood supply? And what happens to the periosteum? Does it contribute to callus formation? Or does it contribute this situation where a gap and a reversal of the fragment to a non-union? But we do not see always non-union in such situations. Here, uh, the same, it heals up in about a little longer time as compared to a normal uh, transfers are a short oblique tibia. But uh, certain, certain situations, they behave differently. Certain situations, they heal. So this is what we are going to talk and uh, look in. Now, these butterfly fragments, uh, which represents either from one side of the shaft or the distal side of the shaft, they represent about 5% of the femoral or tibial diaphyseal fractures. Most often, they are as a part of a segmental fracture like this, where you have two butterflies on either side or a segmental fracture is split into two. One butterfly on the medial side, one on the other side, or even the butterfly is fragmented in proximal and distal. These are the results following a high energy injuries and are usually accompanied by massive soft tissue damage. Now, when you nail them, most of them will align after close nailing and will not need any separate treatment. You can see here, this is a half butterfly. Half butterfly means it is from only one longer segment of the fracture. That is the distal side, the distal fragment of the femur. And what happens, even if it is away, uh, even if it is not 
covering the nail, even if it is reversed by 90 degrees. But if your fixation is stable and has adequate screws in proximal and distal major fragment, it will, help, it will end up in a healing like this in expected time. There are certain situations where we have butterfly in a complex fracture. They are characterized by the position of these segmental components and they leave a larger fracture gap. Hence, there are more bending stresses on the implant and that becomes an unstable situation. So these can be divided into three when it involves the subtrochantric and the diaphyseal component like this, or we have a purely diaphyseal intercalary segment, or there is involvement of a supracondylar in the diaphyseal segment. So these are three different situations. Now, when we talk of butterfly fragment as a part of intercalary fracture, this could be a simple intercalary fragment or a simple butterfly fragment, or it may involve multiple frac fracture planes, or it may be comminuted intercalary fragment, as we have seen the butterfly breaking into two or three pieces leading to a combination at the fracture site. How do you reduce this fracture? Most often, uh, we require a fracture table and we have to reestablish a proper length, rotation and alignment of the femur and tibia. And often, a full length radiograph of the contralateral femur is beneficial in this situation. The reduction tools, when you are doing a close nailing uh, to achieve a rotation or to achieve a proper alignment of this butterfly fragment, you can use spike pusher, which are useful to push the fragment in a position. You can use various hooks, a small hook inserted percutaneously or a dental hook uh, through the fracture to pull and achieve a good reduction of this fragment. Or you can use a unicortical diaphyseal or bicortical metaphyseal sand spin in aligning this fracture. KYS to derotate the fragment often fails and uh, uh, you cannot really rotate it. Again, it springs back to a normal position of reduction. Uh, when you have a situation when there is a double butterfly on either side of a segment, uh, wherein there is a large uh, reverse fragment that leads to a bone gap and that has the worst outcome, where a situation wherein this femoral fracture was treated, uh, uh, probably it was a bag of bones, where it was treated by a femur nail and uh, KVAR was used to uh, rotate that flip fragment. And you can see here that flip fragment has uh, rotated by almost 180 degrees. The cortical side is closer to the nail and the endosteal side is on the outer side towards the soft tissue. Now, what happens in this situation? Uh, this was done by a closed nailing and you can see uh, that this is the reverse fragment. It doesn't have any contact with the nail on the outer side, but on the medial side, just see what has happened. It's a slurry of the reaming, which you can see on the medial side of this. And at the end of three weeks, you can see that same slurry getting consolidated. And as the months progress, you can see what is happening. There is a consolidation of that rim products from periphery towards the center. So, and similarly, the reverse fragment at present is not contrib contributing. Uh, the endosteum is turned inside out by 180 degrees and the fragment on the outer side is completely flip. So what happens subsequently? That slurry on the medial side contributes to the healing and on the medial side, the gap is reduced significantly. And you can see the flip fragment also incorporates with a callus proximally and distally. And that is how it consolidates over the time. And this is at about three years, everything has consolidated and the nail was removed for some social reasons. So this is the fate of a well-fixed, stable construct in a situation where there is a extension of the diaphysis into the subtroch area. Now, in the diaphysis, particularly when you have a single butterfly fragment like this, very often when you nail them, they align. But here, the situation was different. 
close reduction was not possible because the patient presented late and hence we had to open the fracture to nail uh, to put the, insert the guide wire and the nail in the distal canal and once that was done uh, we tried to reduce that fragment by flipping it and holding it with circlage wire but you can see here the reduction is not anatomical because that was done after locking proximal and distal so what what is going to happen in this situation even that is going to heal because you have not disturbed the soft tissue of that butterfly fragment you have just turned it and you are holding it with a circlage wire and at two years you can see that as that fragment that large butterfly fragment has also incorporated well that is his function flexion and extension uh, when you are reducing particularly the situation where it is in the junction of the diaphysis and the distal femur guiding the guide wire properly and placing the nail in the center is a must if the guide wire if you guide the nail in the dis uh, distal if you don't guide the nail properly in the distal metaphysis you will end up in an angular deformity leading to a malalignment of the fracture uh, situation what is usually the fate of a flip fragment so uh, this is how it has been nailed the fixation is stable proximally and distally and you can see at two months there is no new bone the fragment is completely flipped by about 180 degrees but the fracture is well aligned it is a thicker nail it is a statically locked in nail so you can see here the first calcification you see around two or three months at the end of that butterfly fragment this is the common pattern uh, seen where you can see the calci uh, the callus formation proximally and distally and uh, it is basically dependent on how much is the distance of this fragment from the nail if it is within 1 cm you will see this that a typical callus formation and proximally and distally at the uh, uh, rotated butterfly fragment and subsequently that calcifies and uh, the fracture heals on both the sides. So this is a normal pattern if uh, uh, you can see as far as healing. But if your nail is thinner, the same fragment behaves exactly opposite. You can see here the distance of the fragment is more than one centimeter from the nail. Uh, there is in this situation either there are uh, interposition of soft tissues or uh, there is an increased frag fragment movement when the patient is flexing his knee there is a poor contact of the rotated fragment and the shaft and plus there is an instability because of the loose nail and as expected the nail the gap there is no contribution from the because of the instability there is no callus formation, there is an excessive mobility, there is an instability, and that leads to a breakage of the implant. So that needs, that non-union needs grafting, and a thicker size nail is all what is required to end up in a healing like this. That is his function. Uh, you have certain situations where whatever you do, you cannot rotate that fragment. This is flipped by 90 degrees. This fragment is flipped by 90 degrees. And even if you graft, you try to align, it doesn't come in that situation. Grafting in or around the nail, again, it doesn't uh, help. Here you need more stable situation. The gap between the fragment and the nail, again, here is more than a centimeter. What you need is a plate, uh, extra medullary fixation, where uh, grafting and fixing it in, in a stable way will help in healing that fracture. Plating is useful particularly when you have a situation like, like this where uh, it involves the distal fragment it is at the junction direct visualization to assist the fragment reduction fixing this fragment or the butterfly with a, a interfrag screw achieving absolute stability and using a neutralization plate is going to help in such situation in getting an excellent result like this the only disadvantage of plating in these a comminuted or reverse flip fragment is associated with the periosteal stripping, increased blood loss and increased operating room time. So to conclude, after nailing in most of these fragments uh, are going to realign. 
length, rotation, and axis alignment should be addressed while nailing these fractures. Aim for a stable construct. That means you have to use the thickest nail, uh, more number of screws in the larger fragments. And if it is unstable, uh, you can augment with an interfrag screw or a circlage wire, or you can use a plate to stabilize uh, or improve the stability of the construct. Even rotated fragments will heal well if you ha have achieved a good construct with a thicker nail. Fractures which are ending in the junction between the diaphysis and the suprachondric area and the diaphysis and the supracondylar area, they require more stability, either increasing number of screws in the shorter segment or you use a augment plate. If more than one centimeter is the distance of the reverse fragment from the uh, 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 nail, so you have to be cautious as regards it has a poor prognosis as we have seen in those failures where the fragment was more than one centimeter and most of them, they had failed. So, uh, so that is the situation what you have to be very careful in that situation, either you have to add graph or improve the stability to achieve a expected union. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Sangeet. Yes, already the hand is raised by two people. Amit Rastogi first, then Amit Ajgaukar. Sangeet, uh, very nice uh, uh, exposition. And uh, this thing. I just have one simple question. Do you have any indication for circlage wiring of such a fragment when you have been able to achieve a close reduction? No. Uh, you have achieved a close reduction, but if your nail is thinner, no, no, you got nice thick nail then. Down nice there. thick nail. There is no role of circlage wire. So even and for those fragments which are more than one centimeter away? No. If it is more than centimeter away, uh, you have to take a call and see how is the progress occurring of the callus formation. Younger patient, they will behave differently as compared to older individuals. Those who are elderly, the potential of callus formation is not as good as the younger individuals. Okay. And in them you must open it, reduce that reverse fragment, use a circlage fire and add up graft in those situations. What about a screw? You can, whatever way you want, you can use either circlage wire or a screw or a small plate to realign or bring the fragment closer. Uh, at the same time, uh, not disturbing the vascularity of that segment. Thank you. Yes, Amin. Sangeet, uh, the cases that you showed, uh, Probably maybe the, they were the older x-rays. But then what I feel is whenever you have got such a lot of uh, combination with multiple butterflies, then you should have rotational stability on both the sides of your nailings. The rotational stability would be given only by locking in different planes. So only two lateromedial plane screws in the, all those most of the x-rays would not suffice at all. Definitely there would be some failure. You should have either you should, nowadays the AFN synthesis nail or a distal fragment also you should have two planar lockings and AP as well as lateral one. The second question is uh, that uh, medial slurry you showed in the subprochantric region is not is in a one in a case finding but then it's not always seen and in the subprochantric region the medial surface and the medial cortex you cannot leave gaps you should always have a continuity over there in the subtrochantric region. And not only, you cannot replace that cortical bone by a cancellous graft. You should have proper cortical contact over there on the medial side. That is what I feel. My talk was on diaphysial fractures, Amit. And in them, you don't need multi-lock screws always, always for fixing the major fragment. The nail, if it has a good contact, as you have seen, proximally and distally, of about two inches across, or in some of them, I have used additional third screws, proximally and distally, that is enough. Not all of them, they require multi-lock nail and always one. Second, the case what you are describing, the slurry, I have shown it till the healing, I mean. Yeah, exactly. That is fine. But then, you know, so you can't... The slurry, one second. The slurry will consolidate if you have a stable fixation of the proximal and distal fragment. Yeah, that is true. Absolutely right. But then... Uh, the slurry, would it form 
in all cases in younger individuals if you have uh, no no oh, yeah uh, so it, there you have achieved a stable construct it should form but the medial side i feel there should be some cortical contact yes i agree with amit ajgaukar that in a subtrochanteric fracture and yes uh, it's a risk to leave a gap and depending upon the slurry yeah i think vivek has a question vivek no any more question otherwise we'll go to the next talk by sunil kulkarni word with this sunil sunil ji yes yeah you are to unmute sunil kulkarni is the past uh, president of nails he is from miraj yes sunil you are not heard you see my case yeah you can see okay. you can see thank you dr gadegone and uh, sir thoda awaaz wadwa aadu thoda awaaz wadwa awaaz badao bada isse bada kitna aur kada badao mar okay so non union at junctional femur i have the topic was given to me so non union as sangeeta has said this uh, the junctional area is a very uh, sudden change in diameter which has got a rotational instability the high forces and implant does not take the cyclical and rotational load and that is the reason you get a lot of failures in these cases so this is a case i would uh, to have a, with the polytrauma with the junctional fracture femur and we did a, a nail and the patient was this is a pay x ray which is a junctional area uh, which is a butterfly fragment and uh, i used a, a cyrus nail here if you see the nail wise and stability wise the three locking bolts uh, and the one anterior posterior screw so four screws in the distal femur uh, which is a, a absolute given excellent stability but still uh, there is a butterfly fragment which is also not far away from uh, the main bone uh, so that i thought it is gives a because it's a polytrauma so we don't want he has a tibia he had a humerus as well so after 7 months he came with this okay so what could be the cause of this do you think the nail is unstable rotationally and uh, sangeet so can uh -huh. you what so is the cause it, requ it required more stability apart from three or four screws in distal fragment so the hardly any this is a cyrus nail has got only four that yeah the, So, uh, the design of uh, reduce one more screw. They have only added three screws. So, this is a older Cyrus nail which has got four screws. So, so which nail has got more screws than this? I think. Uh, so, um, uh, here the there is a hole, junk hole in the nail which is a stress riser which is too near to the fracture site. Yeah, that could be the reason. There is a hole. Yeah, where it has broken. Oh, that is a locking bolt there. That is not a yeah, locking bolt hole. The, the nail is inherently uh, unstable. Unstable at this uh, interlocking hole side. It is uh, more vulnerable for breakage. So it is true for all the fractures then. Yeah, yeah. It is near to the fracture. That's why it has to be at least two inches away. Here it is uh, just a inch. Two centimeters, quite two centimeters, three centimeters away from the fracture side actually. No, no. The situation no, no, no. is when there is a poor nail bone contact. Is Shiva it? is ask, telling you that if there is a poor nail bone contact and if your hole is closer to the fracture within two inches, the chances of breakage of at the level of hole is very high. So you mean to say that isthmus uh, where the nail is passed, that is a maximum nail rim nail was passed, which has got excellent snug at the isthmus. We cannot go more than whatever the isthmus is giving more than two millimeter. Mm -hmm. of That's what we were talking about. So yes, retrograde nail is better. But if you put a put a retrograde nail, it has a wider diameter in the distal portion of the femur. That's what exactly. is required here. Exactly. And, if, and a retrograde and nail. All, also. Ek minute, Amit. Oh, boy. And if at all you want to do anti-grade nail with this diameter, which is adequate in isthmus but floating in the distal funnel shaped uh, femur. Then you do a super combo, so you add a plate to this. Right. So it will be a nail and plate combination on day one. Okay. Now we have evolved uh, uh, through this uh, thinking process. We were not knowing about this. I agree with you, 
So if you want to do an anti-grade nail, do a nail plate combination on day one, or because it is unstable, because it is weak. And if you want to do a retrograde nail, this would, uh, but nail by, by itself will combat you in this situation. Definitely. Yeah. Okay, and, uh, Sunil, can I, this was an, uh, this was an ideal junctional fracture. But today, given a chance, I think you will also go ahead with a retrograde nail at this keeping the nail. Mm. Now, because the, that time, the nail design was only two locking bolts. There was no anterior posterior screw was available. So, um, still, I, I uh, because I'm just, I, there's Sushrut probably taking the, my question of the his talk, but my question was that time also, the, just to do a, a parapetal incision, not the nail implant. Anyway. So uh, it was an absolute non-union. So we give the absolute stability. Then uh, what uh, we started doing this is uh, now exchange thicker nail, retrograde nail, the combo nail plate, nail plus plate or a dual plate. So I opted for uh, a dual plate and the nail. Okay. Any comments on this? Shushrut, you're muted. Uh, yeah. So tell me, Sunil, uh, if we really look critically, Biomechanical stability is more with a nail plate combination or the newer design nail with multi-directional multi-planar screws. What will give more stability for this junctional fracture, you think? I, I will do a retrograde nail for fresh fractures. I will never do a nail and plate right from the beginning because it becomes a very rigid. I have seen, we have done, and these are a lot of failures. So I recommend I will do a retrograde nail with this. Now the angled uh, screws are come, which is a Natura nail. Uh, that, that is, I will now do, not doing it. But for fresh fractures, I will never do a absolute stability. This will is a super construct. This is good for a non union Okay. Mm -hmm. So I, this is my philosophy. I put it this. This went on to a union. This is excellent uh, healing. Patient uh, is happy and there's no problem. Okay. Now the second case is, this is a very interesting case. Again, a polytrauma. And this patient has got a deformed, deformed distal femur. Not the fracture. Fracture is, uh, this is junctional. So a deformed fracture uh, in a distal femur. Again, uh, I did a, a retrograde nail, not retrograde, the anti-grade nail. Uh, I thought it is giving a good stability, which is uh, a segmented femur. And it's giving, a, I have used now putting a two screws through the dynamic hole. So give additional screw. So we can give a, almost five, six screws in the distal femur, which I thought, which is a rotationally stable. After, um, uh, again, it was going well. The rest of the fr fractures united. This was after say five months, five months again, almost five months, six months, patient was walking. There is no problem so far, good, showing some callus. And suddenly he got this with the broken nail, okay? And showing again, the same area, same fracture, all right? Now, because uh, we cannot put a, a retrograde nail as well as anything, so I opted for a a dual, so exchange nail, dual implants, nail plus plate or a plate plus plate. Now the role of distal femur, you require a dual implants. Do whatever you want to do it. So if you want to have a proper uh, intramedullary nail, then you can augment with the plate. This is a learning phase, which we, I also learned by a lot of failures saying the, this area, a junctional area of the distal femur and the proximal femur. So I'm showing some uh, cases here, showing some cases as well. So this I did. Uh, this is this is the way we just started with the anterior bridge plate, like we do for the humerus. This works very well. This works very well. Any comments, Shushrut? No, I think this is good. Uh, so the points which we need to establish here is yeah. both these plates have to be 90 degrees or more yeah. uh, with each other to have. Uh, but this is a great idea. I agree. Gadegona, sir, if you want to have comments. You have used a phil long pilas plate. This is, I think, so. Oh. No, no, no. Lower end femur plate is humerchi. Zimmer. 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 Zimmer
This is a Zimmer distal femur. So, no, this is a very good idea yeah, because good it is a diagonally you are fixing the fracture, giving absolute stability. No, this is a but, very uh, good plate, egg dumb strong, rock uh, solid plate. Uh, so, 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 this will did you add graft also? Yeah, of course, of course. Grafting without non in non Indian without grafting, I don't think there is a treatment is incomplete. Uh, so grafting is necessary so that but it was a deformed femur right from the beginning. So yeah. I could have thought plating right from the day one, but it was a so uh, given the thought that we more rely on nails, so uh, so plating was done. Yeah. And this is a, a functional results. Excellently, patient went off. The five months patient with the the infected non Indian at the same time, and uh, some of my students has done this outside. So he came to us after five months, and training sign. This was the patient came into a junctional area, typical uh, low subtrochanteric fracture. Now that there is infection, there is a cyanogram. If you see the cyanogram there, we are going there. Hmm. Okay. So what would you do? Anybody? Shiva? Antibiotic coated nail. There is no doubt about that. Yeah. It is already came with the antibiotic coated nail itself. Still there yeah, is. You can change the antibiotic. You can take basically, though it is an antibiotic coated nail, probably it is not uh, stable enough. Yeah. Probably I will add an interlocking also in the antibiotic coated nail to give more, more stability. So I just go ahead with the want of time because we did the, uh, this is a standard way of treating our any infected non Indians uh, with the new retrosional stability. There is an empty ring. So there is no need to put a central because we don't want to pierce it. So distally stabilized with the Italian arch, the higher up. And once everything heals up, all the sinuses heals, we remove the fixator. We are showing some sort of callus on the medial side. So we remove the fixator, keep it for splint a little bit so that the pin tracks heal. And after that, I put a, a nail and the plate combine. This is now the standard uh, method of treating this. This is because it requires absolute stability. And then once it is done, it is it gives excellent stability, also heals the infection. So a combination of a nail and the plate is a beautiful way of treating any non indian anywhere in the body, whereas especially in junctional area where there is a highest rotational and the cyclical loadings, which will give you excellent stability and patient has got still sinus, but it has all healed. There is no problem about uh, the healing of the bone. Uh, the case for the last, uh, this is again, my case. Uh, we did, this is a, a junctional area. Again, the communicated fragment. Uh, this is a, a lateral view and uh, this is a CT scan of the same. The parents theory worked well here. I used a, a nail here, proper Cyrus nail here. And uh, I thought it is, a, it is giving a good stability, rotational stability. Down there, up there, all four screws up, rotationally stable. And good reduction, reasonably good reduction in both AP and view. And once the patient started walking and uh, he came with the same again, broke the nail at the junction. That is a uh, always there is a first screw near the fracture site always gives way. But a reasonably good alignment, patient was not that a having pain, but I said it is not possible to get. Then I, then I change it to a nail plate combination. So I change it to now, that I stopped using Cyrus nail again design. I use now long PFNs because two screws and less chance of screws in the near the fracture site. And then use a, a plate, which will give you excellent stability on the on the all these junctional areas. As Sushrut said, day one, you must try to use a dual implants, whether nail and nail plus plate or a plate plus plate. You can use a small plate on the anterior, and you can small on the lateral side. You can use a bigger plate. I've used the anterior plate also uh, for the subtrochanteric fractures uh, for the junctional area, which also gives a excellent stability on the uh, medial, on the anterior side. Don't touch on the medial side because medial blood supply, we don't want to disturb it. So it gives an excellent stability and finally it is united. So take home message is junctional area is a notorious for non-Indian. Use proper implant from right from the beginning and use absolute stability and bone graft for non indians And also believe me, the rehabilitation is also a very important aspect of uh, treating this 
and nail and plus plate is the best for the so far lot of all the junctional non unions if you want to uh, treat this non unions thank you any questions comments rajiv yes welcome rajiv from uk you okay good morning you are muted good. that's good Sunil, I just got up. Sorry, Sunil, you are wonderful presentation, and you have number of cases to share with you. But your concluding remark, I can understand that nail and plate combination with uh, bone graft will give a good uh, construct and uh, healing potential for non-united junctional zone. And in a fresh fracture, if it can be done a retrograde nail, lower third, and sometimes you may require a additional plate. That's what you want to say. Yeah. Uh, Sunil, just one little comment. What I've started using is, you know, when I put the nail down, I don't lock distally. Put Hello. the plate on. Use a Muller's compression device, and really compress till the whole thing starts bending. Then I put all the screws in. Yeah. When I finish, there's no fracture scene. So I use it Muller's compression device routinely on these. So I don't. The trick is don't lock distally. Put the plate on Muller's compression device. Put the distal screws on. Then go distally. Uh, uh, Very no. femur. Yeah. yeah. Distal femur. Femurs. Mr. Femurs in junction areas, you know, approximately on 30 uh, femurs. Fracture or a non Indians? Non Indians, non Indians. Non okay, okay, and what do you do for fresh fractures? Do you use a nail plate combination? I, I have started going in for that now. <laughs> and whenever I'm in doubt, whenever in doubt, communicated, just put another plate on, peace of mind. Just peace of mind. No, but Rajiv, does that message go that always, most of the times you do nail plate combination with fresh fractures? Because there yeah, are a lot of people, I don't think anyone is doing it. Many I mean, these cases quite often you end up with a open, very reasonably open reduction. You have the pathway open in front of you. If you have yeah. combination, if you have instability, I mean, if you feel, if you put the nail down, you have enough, you don't have very good co contact among the fragments, fragments lying over, just, just slide a long plate. You take away the rotational stress. That's it. Just to give the rotational stress. Sunil, so you showed a PFN with a uh, multiple uh, multi planar lock in the distal fragment, which was that PF? EP screw also in the I made speci specifically, specifically. Exactly. I always say that PFNs, long PFNs, should have an EP lock in the distal fragment for all these type of fractures. I have told my supplier to make it clear. Yeah. Because uh, no PFN gives an AP locking in the distal fragment. Why, why do you want PFN? Why, why do you want an AP locking in the a oblique screws. For rotational stability, definitely it is so. Oblique, strong. oblique, oblique screws. AP is very dangerous. No, no, no. That no. area. AP lockings in the distal fragment. It's not that dangerous. We have been doing very regularly AP lockings in the distal fragment. We have been doing for many years. Cyrus Nail has gone. Very, very regularly AP lockings in the distal fragment. There is nothing. There is and nothing. In is, uh, that area, there is nothing there. So there is no vascular. There is, so no, there is no problem. Distally, distally. Oh, distally only, distally only, there is no problem. Not come there. Vessel does not come there. There is a bare area of femur where you are. You are up here. Absolutely. The vessel, the artery turns around. Maybe posterior, like slightly on the medial side, not dead center. It comes dead center in the near the, uh, the PCL. That AP locking in the distal fragment is very important. Anyway, you should be careful. Yeah. yeah. Shivshankar, sir. You can start now because uh, uh, Tanna sir, Chandak and Lokande, they are in the same session. Yes, correct. So, Dr. Tanna and Dr. Vijayanand Lokande and Dr. Ram, uh, Rajan Chandak are in Washi in a CME. So, I am taking the next talk. Can you see my slides? Yes. Okay. So, I will be talking about the subtrochantric uh, non-union. Again, it's all cases I will be showing. And my work has been done easy by Sunil's presentation. So this was a case of femur, again, with a broken nail. I just did an exchange nailing with another thicker nail, thinking that the reaming products will work. This was way back in 2002, I had done this. So the fracture united and the patient came about uh, 10 years later, sometime, yeah, seven years later in 2010. And again, for social reasons, he wanted to get the nail removed and I removed it. So this is in uh, 2010. And he came back in 2012 after two and a half years with a fracture at the same site with a trivial injury that indicated that the fracture had not totally consolidated. Probably it was a fibrous non-union. This time 
I didn't take the chance of doing any close thing. What I did was I opened, pressure dents, added bone graft, shingling, multi-locking nail. As you can see, there is three locking proximally and three locking distally also. There is an anterior posterior locking also in the distal fragment. So this nail I used. Within four months, the fracture got consolidated. Friends, this is what I did it in 2003 and 2004. But uh, if the same patient comes to me today, uh, I will also add a plate uh, as an additional supplement because non-union requires absolute stability, which can be given by plating with compression. If you are a nailer like me, you can augment the nailing with local plate. And this nail gives stability for a longer duration, longer length of the bone and plate gives absolute stability and decreases the working length because their screws are very near to the fracture site. This is a, one of the example, a subtrochanteric fracture. After 10 years, the patient came with a broken implant. The, the patient was walking comfortably on the nail, even with this non-union for 10 years. If you see the entry, you can see that the tip of the trochanter entry has been taken. And since the proximal fragment is wide in the middle canal, the nail has gone more medially. Instead of going laterally, it has gone more medially because of the wider middle canal. And this angulation has led to varus, and this varus stress has led to non-union. So what I did, you can see a Steinman pin here, which I used as a blocking to prevent the nail going to the earlier entry site, made a fresh entry medial to the base of the trochanter, or you can even call as a, a pyriformis fossa entry. I again did the pressioning of the end, shingling, everything. It's, you can see the nail being removed first. Then I did the pressioning of the ends. You require, uh, you require a very good osteotome, uh, sharp osteotome to shingle the uh, surface. You had to literally remove small bony specks from the bone. It's not elevation of the periosteum. You had to take out the bone pieces along with the periosteum. Then I have done a nailing with a plating. And if you closely see, there is a polar screw anteroposterally, which is preventing the nail going back to its original track, which was from the tip of the trochanter. So here you can see the polar screw and the fresh entry made more medially, giving good valgus to the nail. This is the union just at four months time, the patient had an excellent function and the patient started walking without any problem. Another case, a subtrochanteric fracture treated the previous year, came with a fracture like this. It was treated again by the same surgeon with the second surgery with PFN. This patient came only once in uh, after two months and he again came after three years with a fracture in the subtrochanteric region, again of the nail. So you can see that it's a junctional area or the screw hole area where the fracture is too near to that site and the stresses have led to this and also the entry was from the tip of the trochanter which has led to this. Again, in this case, you can see there is a one polar, uh, one guy K wire which is going into the neck, which is an anti version K wire to know the neck direction. There are two K wires which are lateral to the entry to prevent the nail again going through the same entry which was done earlier. This act as a polar wires, then as fresh entries made over the neck, then uh, the K wires have been replaced with the antero posterior blocking screw. You can see this is the antero posterior blocking screw. And this patient is the immediate postoperative x ray in 2017. He never came for follow up. Literally, I had to chase this patient many times. And finally, recently, after repeated attempt, I could catch hold of him. After four and a half years, you can see the fracture has united. And beautifully, the patient had an excellent function. And the, this is the patient walking. There is a shortening of almost three fourths of an inch. And also, because the grafts have been removed from both the uh, trochanter iliac crest, probably that also added to the problem of this waddling, shortening plus uh, uh, this removal of the bone graft from the trochanter uh, iliac crest. This child was treated with a plate for a femur fracture in, the, in his childhood. He came with a fresh fracture in adulthood and the implant were removed and a locking plate was used. And this, again, after two years, this locking plate also gave away. And this time, 
It was treated with a PFN with an augmentation plate with bone grafting and total surgery has been done. And you can see the fracture united in due course of time without any function with the last follow-up in August, 2020, almost one and a half years down the line. Another case, subtrochanteric fracture, uh, a tip of the trochanter entry has been taken, a regular femur nail has been used. All the, the, the problem because of the varus and the nails hole at near to the fracture site, the nail broke, the culprit only proximal fragment of the nail was removed and the fracture went into non-union. That was the time I was involved. I could extract the nail. Unfortunately, while I was re reaming, I did the reaming up to 13 millimeter and passed the proximal femur nail. You can see there was a vertical split of the proximal fragment because I had not used the 15 millimeter centering all to open the canal in the proximal fragment with this nail uh, for this uh, PFN, which is 15 millimeter proximally. So I did a encerclage wire and then it was a suboptimal uh, position of the screw. The nail went back again to the earlier entry. You can see it has gone into, again, the fracture fixation was a slight virus. But uh, uh, luckily, the patient went on to unite with this. And uh, this is uh, after the fracture had united. And this is after the implants have been removed in the same patient. Uh, the patient is still having little lurch because of the virus in the proximal fragment. So one should take care to avoid this uh, complication of leaving virus. Another subprochanteric fracture with a non-union, again, in a similar fashion, we are treated. First, as the nail screws are in proper position in the neck, pass the anti guide wire, then did a PFN along with a, a locking plate, you can see, or the augmentation plate. Uh, this man, again, never came for follow-up, but he keeps sending the pictures from his village wherever he takes the X-ray. This is... One of the video he has sent beautifully is doing the full function. He's uh, working as a fisherman and he's able to jump, hop onto his uh, uh, boat and also catch the fish without any problem. He does all the work. You can see him jumping now into the boat and doing the work without any problem. So uh, subtrochanteric fracture requires absolute stability. Another lady. Again, this lady had a fracture which was treated about 10 years back earlier. And when we advised the surgery, the patient deferred the surgery. She came after three months. At the time when AP X-ray was taken, it was looking that the fracture had united. So this is just after three months. I thought that autodynamization might have happened. But when we took the lateral view X-ray, it was a Pakka non-union case. Again, in the similar fashion, we removed the proximal fragment, then uh, uh, removed the distal broken nail also with the help of uh, the proximal part of the nail being extracted and uh, with the broken nail extractor, we could extract the nail, then do the femur nail and do a augmentation plate with bone grafting. This is the implant which have been extracted. These are some of the threads cut by the extractor in the nail. So this is immediate post-operative picture. This is after the uh, some time X-ray. This is two months post-operative. This is eight months post-operative. The last X-ray I have in this patient. Patient is doing clinically fine. This, uh, if you're thinking how you can put a plate by the side of the nail, what I normally do is I always use a K-wire. I hit the nail and slip beside the nail and I fix one or two on either side with the K-wires. Then only I pass the screws. So it's, you can still adjust the plate. So what you do is with a K wire, you hit the nail just by the side of the nail, you slip usually on the posterior aspect of the uh, nail uh, of the femur, there'll be a lot of place if you're putting a lateral plate or even on the medial aspect in a subtrochanteric region, there will be a lot of place. You can put a K wire first in, and then you can gradually replace them with the screws. So this is how you can do the nailing, don't use the drill bit, otherwise drill bit many a time breaks at this side. This is the last case I'm showing, it's a long case. I myself involved here for 26 years in treating this patient. Initial two surgeries were done outside, then all the remaining eight surgeries have been done by me. Because of the mistake of entry, I had to redo so many times. This was a subtrochanteric fracture treated with a SP nail plate. Unfortunately, the plate bent, so the implants were removed. And these are the only two surgeries which are done outside. Then he came to me, that was in 1996. Then I made 
used a regular femur uh, nail because subcutaneous fusion was not available at that time and even the locking bolts were also not available you can see 4.5 mm cortical screws i have used i intentionally kept the nail proud so that i could do the second locking otherwise the nail would have come at the the hole would have come at the uh, fracture side so but you can see this is the varus because of the entry which is from the tip of the trochanter this problem has happened the patient had problem at the entry site so i had to remove the nail when i removed the nail the fracture had not consolidated so i did a stacked canaling and this stacked canaling worked for about 5 years 6 uh, years it came in 2006 with a broken stacked canaling so i don't have the x-rays in between then i removed by close technique with my broken nail extractor all the broken pieces with a close technique i could extract with a broken nail extractor the stack nail and i did a uh, recon nail at this time recon nail again without when opening the fracture i have done the close recon nailing but again you can see my entry is still from the tip of the trochanter the fragment proximal fragment has gone into varus again this nail worked for about again 6 years and again this broke in 2011 the patient came again with the breakage of the nail so this is all why i'm showing this case is just because the entry was wrong right from day one all this trouble the patient had to undergo finally i treated this patient with a plate in 2011 when that was the locking plate had come in the market in the patient gave way in 2015 but he was able to walk with a walker and he refused any surgery no, no he said no more surgery in 2015 so he refused surgery again to come back with a broken plate till in 2018 he was able to manage with walker with his uh, uh, ununited fracture but after the breakage of the plate he couldn't walk so he came this was the time i had already started doing the augmentation plate with nail so i did everything i what i did was i added a lateral plate to the uh, proximal femur which is passed from here then i also added a an anterior posterior plate because i added two plate because i didn't want uh, the plate and the nail to fail again because he, he had so many failures in the past so i have added two plates and a proximal uh, femoral nail and also the bone grafting shingling everything has been done and this is the follow up x ray this is uh, sometime later again this 18 months follow up he just before the lockdown he came he wanted the implant to be removed i advised him to undergo a ct scan before we can remove the implant so at last after 26 years on the pa patient face you can see there is a smile so letting the patient know that what is your thinking process then if you are really having concern for the patient and his good well being patient will stay for with you for long duration time and this patient is a proof that for 26 years and eight surgeries he has stayed with me without any problem this is the algorithm i use for hypertrophic non union you just require a good stability for atrophic non union if it is a stability is good only you can add bone grafting but if the stability is also not good better to use a good fixation with nail with augmentation plate and add bone grafting plating is also a good option but uh, since uh, i am a more uh, of a nail uh, nailing i do nailing more than plating so friends in established non union shorting shorter working length by using a thicker nail and a local augmentation plate augment the biology with bone graft if opening the fracture removal of avascular bone ends is very very important compression plating is also very good option especially double plating in junctional fracture is also very good option but uh, my topic was uh, augmentation plate for subcutaneous fractures thank you very much Yes, Shushrut. Hello. Any question? No questions. Or yes, Shankar sir. Yes. Um, uh, Navin has joined. And he will deliver one, and then uh, uh, Vijayananda Lokhandi is also joined. Has uh, joined, Horena? Okay. Okay. Any question? Uh, Any otherwise, I'll ask Navin to take the next talk. Vijayanand is there. He is yeah. joining. 
Okay. So Navin, yeah. uh, Navin, you can uh, you can talk on first topic. Yeah. Which one? Which one? Oh, which one? Dynamization. Dynamization. Then Vijayanandan. Then again you can talk. Okay. So you want me dynamization? Okay. Let me see. <laughs> Navin bhai, golden, golden necklace, acha bhao, saro bhao che. Nahi, wo inauguration khatam karke sida upar aya me, ye room me. Shadi ho gai abhi. Aray, ek minit, ek minit, ek minit, raja. Share ho. Share screen. Meanwhile, share. Yes, yes, yes. Shankar. Shiva? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, if you are given a choice for a subtrochanteric trick, what you have uh, shown now, the last case. Yeah. Now, if the patient comes like this, would you do a dual plating or a dual nail plus plate? Nail plus plate is my choice. Nail plus plate. Yes. So usually now the subtrochanteric area, the dual. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes, nail always gives a better because it load bearing implant. So I definitely prefer a nail for a plate. No, but you require there, you require a absolute stability, not the load bearing or load sharing. Because you require... No, no, this is a very high stress area. You require a good but strong mechanical support as well as a absolute stability. It absolute stability, I am giving it a plate, but uh, mechanical support, I am giving it a nail. I am more comfortable it, in doing a nail. Sushankar, so 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 sir, I must... Will, add. I must so admire you because of long follow-up and multiple repeated uh, very difficult cases you have presented. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, probably the delegates will be benefited. So yes, over yes. to Navin Bhai. Yes, yes. Sunil Bhai, uh, with nail, you will not get absolute stability. It is only a stability required rotational stability will uh, the plate will add. Okay. Okay. So there is a practical dilemma of surgeon when the femur interlock has been done and the fracture is not uniting. Where is the role of dynamization? A case-based thought process. We'll be learning together. 90% of these fractures unite, but the 10% goes for the non-union, particularly with the supraisthmal and infraisthmal and the comminuted femoral shaft in the isthmal part. So this is failing. Why this is failing? That is a problem. Again, another case where it is probably failing, and this is the supraisthmal, and again that is a failing. Again, there is an infra, uh, infra isthmal and it is failing due to various reasons. But the main problem is the stability, bone to bone contact and alignment. That is the main problem. Dynamization is a very small part. And the second part is the biology, vascularity, osteogenesis, envelope and the soft tissue. These are the problems. Here, we need a bone to bone contact alignment and adequate fixation. And for the biology, we have to fill the gap, induce the osteogenesis, respect the envelope of soft tissue and adjuvant therapy. But here, what is the role of the dynamization? Does it help or does it harm? That is a question mark. So we'll like to know from the faculty, does it help or does it harm? What does everybody says according to the recent literature? Dr. Rajiv Chetaji? Dr. Rajiv, you, you are muted, I think. Unmute yourself, Dr. Rajiv. We are not able to... We are muted. Rajiv, you are muted. Unmute, unmute, please. I think he is not getting... Uh, what no, I yes, perceive, sorry. Navin Bhai, what I perceive, if the stable construction is there, and if you require only axial loading, then dynamization will help if you do it in an early period and if there is a fracture, a healing index is good. Otherwise, it is going to produce an unstable construct and probably it may fail. So it's a dual squad. And so, we have yes. to with, we so, have you, to so you say that there should be an early chaos, then and then it, dynamization should be done. And it, should be, it, it, should, be, it should be a stable construct. Dr. Vivek? Dr. Vivek, is there? Uh, see, uh, and the other important thing is the timeline. 
You yeah. just can't leave it beyond three months be- after which it becomes used. Uh, actually, uh, in my last 10 years, dynamization has become very, very low. Very, very low. Very low. So, so we are decreasing now dynamization. Uh, so gradually we are not doing dynamization much now. Right? So let us see what the literature and what is that. The dynamization is a, one of the biomechanical solution. But the method of dynamization is very important. Timing of the dynamization is very important and the type of the fracture uh, where the dynamization will work or will not work will, is the most important thing. So let us see the first case. 12 weeks and here is the position. Now you will you dynamize or not Dr. Sangeet Bhai? No. <clears throat> you will dynamize or not dynamize? No, no, it will become unstable. Right, perfectly. But here what the surgeon has done the dynamization at the 18 weeks this is the position what how 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 it will go about anybody pseudo arthrosis can form pseudo arthrosis can form uh, hypermobility because, of hypermobility if it is there and you can so, have some callus but a fracture site may still persist fracture site will persist okay so Dynamization created here instability. That is what the all faculty now tells. Here you can see the exactly what Dr. Uh, Vivek had suggested. Here the mistake is the method of dynamization. The old screws are removed from the one side. And that is the principle not to remove all the screws from the one side. That will lose the rotational stability on that side. And it is now you can see it is failing at the end of the 24 weeks. So the first rule is not to remove all the screws. Now the second example here, what will you do? The surgeon has again, there is a small gap and two screws above, two screws below, but still there is no signs of uh, union. Here, so Vivek. Yeah, no, here there is a dynamization possibility because there is a static lock proximally can be removed. So yes. that will allow dynamization and the rotation stability will be still be given by the other screw which is in the dynamic hole. So this is a very basic part of the dynamization uh, for the all the delegates that you have possibility here to dynamization within the nail because this nail is a dynamic hole. So you have a possibility but you have to not to remove the, all the screws. So you can remove the status screw which Dr. Uh, Sivasar has said in 18 weeks the surgeon removed only the static hole here and you can see at the 18 weeks it has stimulated and given a callus here and I mean by can I ask question now yeah yeah hundred percent after 12 weeks will you remove it because it's just three months give some nature to some time to go into a tag into a non-union what's because he, if he has no pain if patient is walking comfortably I don't think there is a there is a role of just the removing screw is not thrown the callus. Callus is thrown by the nature, not by the that. Yes, screw. you are absolutely, yeah, absolutely. But <laughs> your actual, <laughs> actual, <laughs> low, ex, actual <laughs> compression, actual compression is allowed by removing that static screw. Once the once the patient starts walking, the load from the bone is already on. It is not that nail is preventing loading. It is not. It is a now. You are right, absolutely right. Now we are moving. The literature says that no dynamization at all. Just give the stability. I will come to that part later on. But here, in a such as fracture where it is a isthmal fracture and not a much combination, where only the axial part is required, where dynamization can be done, as Dr. Gadegone said. What is op- your opinion, Dr. Gadegone? Sir, in this case, I am in a doubt whether the fracture has healed because of dynamization or it's because of the natural process of healing. Because right. if you will see, there is a telltale evidence that there is a attempt at a new bone formation and a three months is a very early period. So, in so that, that case... So, so uh, dynamization you will do within three months or after three months? No, okay. no. In this case, in this particular case, if you want to do a dynamization, it is to be done within three months. But so it is exactly is it is exactly three months. So it's a doubtful whether the dynamization help bad or natural healing help. Uh, that we cannot confirm on this issue. Okay. One thing to note will be the amount of gap also is a very important thing. 
Right. Even if you remove the static hole and you remove and have a screw in the dynamic, the dynamic screw can give you a displacement of only three to four millimeters max because five it's actually six, five to six, yeah, five to six seven, 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 centi seven millimeters is the thing, seven to nine. Right. And based on 4.5 screw, so you will have three yeah, to five yeah. millimeters. Of I, that. I, I, will, I will show that figure okay. also okay, okay, uh, okay. later on. So I that's what that, that also needs to be considered while you are dynamizing. Yeah, yeah, Otherwise, you will create instability and the fracture yes, will break. Yes. Screw will break. So, so the fracture gap, how much dynamization is possible with the dynamic hole, that also has to be calculated. And that should match with that case. And, and that is very important thing. But exactly said, now the evidence said whether the, it was the variable of dynamization that has given a union or it was a natural process which has given the union. And Dr. Sangeet was telling something. He, he raised the finger. Yeah. See, there is no role of dynamization in a well-fixed nail. Yes, absolutely right. It is, it is a natural healing whether you uh, remove it or whether you keep it. It is going. It is harmless. It is harmful only in the junctional zone. Right. That's right. it. Right, absolutely right. So now the principle is even if you want to do dynamization, do not uh, remove all the screws from the one side. At least one screw has to be retained. That is the what the literature says that the 24 weeks, this is the position. Again, here the surgeon has dynamization and it, it is failing. You can see it, it's a supra instable, unstable, and it has given an instability further. Such here a, again, such a here fracture again, is a such a fracture is a contraindication for dynamite. Yes, absolutely. That that is the message we are all together we are giving the message that infraestimal again here the surgeon has done a dynamization, and you can see the holes all the both screws are removed uh, uh, from the why it is happening. Yes is working now so again infraestimal part and do not remove from the all from the one side that is the message here what uh, dr vivek was telling is this is the 15 mm total distance here in this between uh, that, that is the 15 mm of the dynamic hall but when you put the screws here it is six to eight mm only is allowed this part of the Dynamization is allowed here with the 4.5 screws. Different right. nails have different uh, oblong length. So, yes, yes, so you need yes, to yes. You need Normally to it is it. 7 to 9. 7 to 9. Right, yes, right, exactly. right. So I, I have gone to 6 to 8 because certain nail designs allow only 6. So 6 to 8 is the middle pathway uh, I have put in the figure. So this is the paper in the injury that retained screw and all removed screw. And the more than 24 weeks is not effective. This is the literature in the uh, injury journal. That is the end result that in the paper that retained screws on the one side had got more chances than the old screw removed and more than 24 weeks not effective. So method of dynamization gap and the timing of the dynamization after 24 weeks, it is not effective. Uh, this is what we were saying earlier, but there are stray incidences where dynamization do work even at six months, eight months. And from yes. Ganga Hospital, there is a good paper which has come that uh, delayed dynamization also works. That is, especially in uh, isthmic fractures, delayed yes. dynamization does work even at later time. But right. anyway, ideally, right. it should be done between three to yes. four months. Yes, yes. So more than 50% in this study become unstable and fail and significant shortening when there was a combination this is the again a paper uh, where it journal of trauma where it has said, uh, said that in dynamization more than 50 percent become the unstable one so again this is a very uh, very good paper which suggested the transverse or a short oblique fracture that is the type of fracture where dynamization works it is the isthmal that is the site and type 1 and type 2 combination only it works otherwise it doesn't uh, work in the decision making of the dynamization but this is a very benchmark paper where they have said that static locking of the intramedial nails in the femoral sub fracture does not appreciably inhibit the fracture healing routine conversion to dynamic fixation although occasionally necessary 
need not to be performed at all. So this benchmark paper has given a good study that no dynamization also works. Only it takes little more time. Average time of union was 19 weeks with them and healing occurred in 98% of the fracture treated with the static locking. So now the concept is coming, coming that dynamization role is very limited in a very small subset of the uh, fracture patterns and uh, patients conditions. Now this is the condition at the 24 weeks. What do you think, sir, Dr. Trika, sir? It is well fixed. 24 weeks and this is the combination. How many screws are distally, Navin bhai? Distally two screws, sir. You can see here, two screws are there. You it's an unstable, unstable construct. If you do a dynamization, it will again go into a... No, 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 no. Now, surgeon has read the paper that static locking will work. So, surgeon is not doing dynamization. He, he learned uh, from the paper that I will not go for dynamization. So, okay. In, so in, he continued, he continued and this is 28 weeks, another one month. What do you think? What will be the fate? Kiran Bhai? Dr. Kiran, sir. Yeah, yeah. So I think... What, what is, do you think? I think now you should intervene and uh, do a plating with bone grafting, additional. So at 28 weeks, you will think of intervention of bone graft and plating. Anybody yeah. has to defer? If I am waiting, I'll wait till the either the implant breaks. <laughs> Why to wait? <laughs> to do half heartedly anything now. I'll, I'll, you need to look at the clinical scenario as symptoms. Well. Patient so, symptoms. Patient, what the patient, patient is? Pa saying? Patient yeah. has slight limp and slight pain. Not much pain. Not much limp. So patient is now roaming around with the X-rays. Shopping or roaming? <laughs> roaming, shopping, whatever word you want shopping, to use. <laughs> <laughs> roaming to different surgeons and this is young girl so my, my, main, patient, worry, my main worry is the atrophic nature at 28 weeks yes atrophic yes, nature sir. right 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 at almost now, seven months there is no callus nothing nothing at all right 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 so this is the situation many times we said the 32 weeks again surgeon is doing every month x-ray and at 32 weeks, this is the position. Some callus has appeared here, if you see here and here. But still, there is a. No, so, I will. I will. In a situation, this is the time to intervene. It is better not to wait for some time. It may heal with the waiting. But I think now, uh, in a practice, we must intervene at this juncture. So, dynamization here will not work. And we are not advising dynamization, right? Yes, sir. Can't but try. what what try. what what intervention at the 32 weeks? We are now we have learned the literature that after 24 weeks, dynamization will not work. Static locking is equally effective. And now what to do? Navin Bhai, if the patient has come to you for shopping, what did you what did you ask? <laughs> <laughs> right, that is I'm going to show you. That in this condition, in this condition, the dynamization has not rolled, but still it is lacking of the biology. Now stability looks good. So I opted because it was a girl, unmarried girl. They wanted that they don't want a big scar. Mm -hmm. So what I did was only a bone marrow aspiration and bone marrow graft to add the biology as an adjuvant therapy here, whether it works or not. That was the question mark. But we did this in between time. Uh, now at 36 weeks, this is the position. What will happen? Now, Navin Bhai, I have, we have started for such patients where they don't want any scar. Yeah, I am yeah, just yeah. putting a one polar screw when the patient is already on table. I just put one polar screw in between the cortex, five centimeters away from the fracture site. Here, here, here. It is a uh, stomach fracture, uh, Sunil. Where, where, where will you put the polar screw? Polar screw down in the distal fragment. Distal fragment. Gratifying results. You know, you're exchanging with a lot of 
the how, how 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 the polar screw will give here stability is not the problem i think oh, everybody no, agree everybody no, no. agrees the, about the polar yeah. screw Absolutely. no no nobody may may not i also no may not agree but if the patient doesn't want in a scar and he already put in on uh, on the table so just additional one screw which will give you a there is some sort of uh, a gap between the nail and the cortex so there is yeah, a yeah, i i agree with sunil definitely it will enhance the stability in the distal fragment yeah so i agree with sunil we are which is not sure whether now now sunil sunil, sunil 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 now after 32 weeks bone marrow aspiration has been done this is the 36 weeks film at the 4 weeks what do you think now now you will add polar screw now you will add the polar screw now it is working now you can go ahead so now i am asking when i am when patient is ready on table i am just asking just right. a small small stab injection one puts to that set there is nothing okay. much to because exchange nailing will lot of uh, bone then you would have got a complete major change that okay. will give you change everything i am just okay. giving up i mean what i also yeah, yeah. patients which i operated by me also that once you are two nail you got i have stopped using two nail screws anyway but okay. those in spite of that you get some sort of delayed union i just put it because they don't they don't have so more or they can't uh, go for second surgery right, and right. prp is also good good yeah, option okay. yes we are giving prp navin yeah. yeah. till yeah. now till now you have not shown the distal or the knee joint we don't know where the nail is ending we don't know whether it is in the center of the distal femur what it sunil is. is pointing out is a polar screw as what is seen is the nail is going on the medial condyle on the medial side right. so there is a mal alignment right so probably that is the reason he is saying that uh, a polar uh, some, screw might some, uh, all the fractures which has a nail has some mal alignment but that gets united i think there are so many cases but uh, yeah sangeet sange do you find some uh, entry point issues also now you can see here yeah entry point is from the tip of trochanter yes you are right absolutely entry point is i am going with the other films now you can see that uh, the nail position in the distal part here previous x ray till we see the knee joint we will not agree with that <laughs> okay it is not there sir these these are the films i got from them only Uh, right now But it is a thirty six week. You have taken this X-ray. Yes, yes, yes. I have taken care of. Right. It must have been cut here because I can see here the writing below in the film. So the, the uh, radiologists have not taken it at that time. I think now this is the forty weeks. Ah, uh, now we can see the knee joint. <laughs> it is, is in the center. It is in the, in the lateral view. It is center, but in the AP, it is going on the middle side. You are right, absolutely. But it is stable. Yeah, it's stable. Screw lengths are good. Both are holding well in the distal part. The bone quality is good. Stability is almost good. Two screws above, two screws below. Here it was only the biology. So any oh. fracture, the conclusion so, is any fracture. <laughs> if you wait for forty weeks with a good uh, locking proximally and distally, yes. it will heal. Yes, K will heal. But you have to wait till that time. There is a one proposition which has given a result or not that proof we are not having. But at that time, the anxiety of the patient. This is the one of the way where you can put the PRP and get advantage of that PRP probably. we don't know but now what the literature says about this let us see bone marrow does it help and when these are the papers where they say it is a low morbidity and 75% to 90% is the success rate with the percutaneous autologous bone marrow injection in the site these are the papers and the caveat is when it works the defect is less than 5 mm prerequisite is there has to be a stable construct rotationally axially no signs of infection and good number of progenitor cell the smokers it doesn't give any help this is the review of literature in sort of all the papers saying that defect has to be less than 5 stable construct no sign of infection and good progenitor cell then and then it But, works how do you know that there are good number of progenitor cells non smokers have 
usually good progenitor cells in the bone marrow. That is the proposition they have said. Uh, Sunil, yes, uh, from yes. one iliac crest, you should not take more than 10 cc. Yes. Okay. And uh, whenever you are taking more than 2-3 cc, you rotate the needle yes. so that you are taking more number of cells rather than only or, or Or make with the K-wire 2-3 holes in the different parts of the iliac crest and put the 18 number needle inside long needle and then aspirate it from the different sides. And put your needle on the non-union or delayed union side from anterior lateral two, three directions and put that graft in different area and circling as far as you are, you are able to do that. Navin Bhai, we have started PRP. Now, right. the bone marrow aspirate is much, much better. The PRP is much better. Yeah. Because also giving excellent results now. Right. Or even for skin defect, the massive skin defects also been treated by our plastic surgeon by PRP. So, bone, bone non-Indians, we are injecting it. As so, such, again, as non -Indian, two, where you okay, again, I, again I, I am not including here two, three slides for dynamization that for dynamization, as everybody suggested that we need a film of the knee joint, whether there is a space below down for nail or where, whether there is a space above or whether there is a bone plug which has gone while reaming or putting the nail inside. And that is protecting dynamization. And is there is a bone plug above which is not allowing that slides I am missing because it was an emergency call for uh, giving this uh, dynamization part suddenly. So these are the slides I had available. And now appeal to the, all the delegates, those who are not the members of the IOA, please become the member of IOA and take part in the IOCON. Submit your abstract. We have extended the date till 31st July. So, showcase your uh, orthopedic science. Till now, we have received two, two, one, five abstracts. So, everybody is submitting the abstract and we welcome on behalf of IOA at Amritsar IOCON. Thank you very much. Anybody has any questions? Navin Bhai, thank you very much for the <coughs> 11th hour uh, uh, presentation. And it's thank a good sir. presentation with a good take home message. Right, sir. So now I will go for uh, um, Shushankar sir. Vijayanand yes, Lokhande is there. We'll start. Yeah, Vijayanand Lokhande, we can talk about the subtrochanteric fracture, problems with entry, reduction, all those things. Let's uh, hear more from Dr. Vijayanand Lokhande from Pune. Vijayanand, you have to unmute yourself. Uh, am I audible, sir? Yeah, you, you, are audible. Just... you can share your screen. If you have got yeah. network issue, you need not have to show your video. You can, yeah. yeah. Thank you for joining, though you are not in Pune today. Uh, yes, sir. Uh... So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, sorry for the delay, I was also in a meeting. Uh, so, I will be speaking on subtrochanteric fractures, uh, entry point issues, type of nails, positioning. So, these are the two x rays. Am I audible, sir? Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah. Please go ahead. Yes. So, these are the two x rays. The first one here we can see it's a trochanteric nail used for geriatric fractures. Here we can see the proximal fragment is abducted, externally rotated, not in a good shape. On another side, we can see an already arthritic hip suffered a subtrochanteric fracture fixed with a recon type of nail, right straight nail through the pyriformis fossa or a trochanteric fossa. So majority of the issues of subtrochs are because of positioning, the reduction methods, implant choice, biology and the fracture itself. The same X-ray we can see on lateral views, a mal-aligned fracture with a trochanteric nail and a rightly aligned fractures with a reconstruction nail. So let's consider these issues one by one. These are the two positionings we are favorable and we do every day or always. So first one is a traction table and another is a leg free on a supine table. So in descending order, the benefits of a lateral positioning are the reduction is better there is good manipulation, 
the need for open reduction becomes easy the trajectory and entry is easy imaging is easy only the next two parts that is assistance as well as associated injuries when we have to manage that attraction table is found to be better so this is the error of thought what we have and uh, shiv shankar sir has been telling us since long regarding this so we usually we know that these names have four to six degree bend and we can see in the second picture here that actually the bend in which the rimming is going on is around 18 degrees so it is far more than the actual bend what the nails have so eventually as we see if you rim in this position and pass a nail it opens up laterally and the proximal fragment goes in varus so all issues are because of our error of thoughts we have a thought that these nails have to be passed through the trochanter but no in such situations when you get we have to cut something medially create a proper entry point and then pass a nail in an appropriate alignment still i think this is not a very good alignment here but this is a very important point to be noted this is again a very good paper which suggests that for a atypical femoral subtrock fracture a medial entry with a trochanteric nail gives better valgus as compared to a routine nail so this is what have been advocated that even if you have a trochanteric starting nails use it through a medialized entry that is medial to the greater trochanter co planar with the neck in lateral view so that on passing the nail we get a better valgus as compared to the normal hip and makes the hip a better biomechanically which favors healing of the fracture So again, the same slide showing a trochanteric entry nail from a lateralized entry creates a varus at fracture site, and a straight nail aligns it very well if passed along the canal. So what we have today for this subtrochs routinely we have our routine PFN what we use, but we want smaller diameter nails. We have these some nails from multinational companies, the Striker, Synthes, Zima. Also, we have Indian companies which produce the Cyrus nails. If you are using Want to use these nails? You can use it, but we have to use it from a medialized starting point. Here we can see the first case; it was an adolescent case, so I put the nail from a trochanter. But the second and third slide, uh, third image, we can see a trochanteric nail put from a medialized entry, which creates a good valgus here. Coming to reduction tips, everyone has very good reduction tips about all these cases. so we can use percutaneously placed thinman pins clamps artery forceps whatever we need but by any means we have to align these fractures the first thing is alignment you do it on a traction table or a lateral position depending upon your choice and the fracture geometry pass an appropriately uh, uh, nailed or along the length of the canal so that we give good good coming to reduction of these fractures most of the people have skepticism about open reduction but there are multiple papers that if you are not able to align these fractures closed or percutaneously don't fail to open it open it in a biological manner use biological friendly clamps you should not use very big clamps like verbooz clamps or lens forceps to reduce it you can use pointed reduction clamps and then you can very well treat it losing the fracture hematoma does not mean that we are losing complete biology it is just one part of the biology percutaneous circlage they are beneficial in certain situations they actually do not disrupt the blood supply if they are done done in a very appropriate way so coming to some cases this is a 25 year old male rta isolated injury a short proximal fragment with flexion abduction and external rotation so for me there is no anatomical reads available to reduce this fracture so for me it's a fracture to be treated on lateral position and many say that lateral position you need some assistance more assistance necessary but in some small hospitals where there are routine fracture tables where you can place a fracture table along with the standard table i use it in this way just put the patient in lateral position and hang the leg on a traction table and it gives a bit of traction what you want uh, this is the way i do in some of the hospitals you can see here and as you put the patient on lateral position you see a neck very well proximally aligned fracture in valgus and in this scenario by just flexing the thigh you can get a very well alignment in a lateral view too so just but a bit flexion of the thigh we get this reduction and the rest of the procedure is standard a medialized entry along the lateral wall parallel to the lateral wall in lateral it is coplanar with the neck 
you do it routinely and finally we can see we get a very good valgus reduction with a trochanteric entry nail if passed through a medialized starting point this is the point i like to share case 2 a uh, 28 year old hemophiliac rta thin build but here we can see that the apex of the fracture is located posteriorly therefore we can very really well get an idea that this fracture can very well be reduced with just a traction table so this is a patient which i place on a traction table and we get a very good aligned fracture both in ap and lateral views the rest of the procedure is a routine we will transfix the fracture nail it in a routine way and this is the final uh, image of the patient uh, post operatively this is one year post operative x ray of the same patient a well healed fracture walking well case 3 this is a 35 year old male here we can see that it is a long oblique fracture and we can note that this fracture can very well be clamped so for me again it is a patient which has to be treated on a traction table with percutaneous reduction a small incision is placed anterolaterally a ball spike pusher is passed to posteriorly directed direct force and a clamp is placed to fix the fracture and it is nailed again here we can see a routine pfn used through medialized starting point getting a very good valgus reduction and an appropriate alignment here is for a 68 year old male ground level fall a spiral subtrochanteric fracture with flexion abduction and external rotation for me a spiral subtro cannot be reduced closed so for me but still here we can see that we have a very good read which can be reduced anatomically so i place this patient on a traction table and open reduction is done a circlage wire is passed across the fracture side and nailed but here we can see as we have done it the final reduction is in a bit varus as compared to normal side because this i call it as clamp skepticism because when we think we have reduced the fracture anatomically with the clamp we can just nail it but if you do not take care of a starting point even in this scenario still we can get some varus so the take point is that even if you are using a trochanteric nail you have to use it through the medialized starting point to create a good valgus Three months and a year post-operative view showing good union. Final clinical images. Uh, fourth case: a comminuted subtrop, a three-week-old, no anatomical read available at the metaphysis, but shaft can be aligned. So I take this patient on a fracture table. It is fixed, transfixed temporarily. The shaft is aligned, well reduced, and placed uh, with a circlage wire and nailed. but still again we can see the nail entry is through the fracture side not an appropriate entry which should have been through a medial starting point so what is it is going to create it is going to create a varus there so immediate post operative x ray we can see varus four month post operative x ray the fracture starts healing at one year it heals but it does not mean though the fracture has healed but still it is in varus and it is not a good thing to accept final case a comminuted subtrop with intertrochanteric component here the proximal femur is shattered completely there are no anatomical reads available in this case you cannot open reduce it because you will need a, you need the vascularity as well as the biology so this needs a, a treatment by closed methods it was nailed in this manner and over the period of time the fracture just heals up in this way by secondary intention the so length alignment and rotation is an important so from all these cases the six cases i have shown these three cases all the cases have healed but in all cases we can see that there is varus it is not a very well aligned hips because all the nails are through the trochanter if the same nails would have been through a medial starting point they could have been better aligned so the take home message is that the same thing we have to use it through a medial starting point in these two cases where it was put through medialized entry we get a very good valgus at the hip with the same nail so the take home message is that good reduction not only eases the procedure but weight bearing forces are transferred along a load sharing device aim for primary stability the majority of fractures the same circlage at the apex does the job always get a medialized entry irrespective of the nail use The basic principles of nailing of proximal femur should not be overlooked in spite of circlage addition. Thank you.
thank you thank you vijayanand that was a wonderful presentation uh, you you re supplemented my views that uh, any nail you are doing in the femur whatever is the entry stop, you stop, take, stop uh, on sharing stop on sharing yes you should take the entry from the medial <clears throat> to the base of the trochanter so that's uh, the point of entry which shifting to the tip of trochanter is the one which has caused all the problem especially in india where the medullary canal is narrow it's okay yes. in western people where the medullary canal is little wider so the tip of the trochanter is in line with the middle canal but in indians or the asians the tip of the trochanter is overhanging outside and it is not in line with the middle canal this is what the uh, studies also show so if there is any question to shiva sir shiva sir you are most happy person today because you are propagating this uh, medial entry point since last 2 3 years but not 2 were... 3 years 20 years 20 years <laughs> uh, i always they... say that the but... fire firm is for the entry if you are taking you will never repel so, 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 so there, there so... was there was a long discussion in trauma cone about this <laughs> many many years yeah yeah i have been the only person who is uh, propagating this fire firm i call it as fire firm is entry the pyriformis is a misnomer it is little more posterior but it is this entry for pfn is more anterior yes chal chal but wonderful presentation anand and uh, keep it up and we will uh, now go for a next talk uh, by navin tucker yes uh, acha okay so let me share now Shiv Shankar sir, we have to finish up because the time is very short now. Yes, 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 yes. I am, I am going little bit fast. Let yes. us see. Uh, subject is TTC nail utility and technique, right? So this was the case. Male, 62 years, road traffic accident, operated multiple times with diabetes mellitus, open grade two fracture, tibia fibula, 1989, before 26 years. this was this is the film i got from his record 1989 this was the fracture this was the injury film at that time that time dr rudy was well known for plating and so everybody was doing plating in this he published the series of plating primary plating in these fractures so surgeon fixed with the plate available plates at that time and the fibula plate and everything and got infected had a bone loss then surgeon put a just st pin from calcaneum to this and this was the non union and in 2015 it presented to me 26 years of painful limp and varus this was the condition and this is the local condition where stg was here and you can see the nail condition of the nail you can see in this photograph other photographs will come probably and this was the doppler study which was showing that circulation is also a issue so he had gone to many places elizaro was thought many thing was thought and this is the condition what is the opinion of everybody it is in nail <laughs> it is in nail now it is the subject has been given already <laughs> so i did a ttc nail and in 2017 you can see this is the film i got here and this is the function limited opening on the lateral side because there was no possibility of opening anywhere else on the lateral side i removed the part of the fibula and this ttc nail was done you can see here and there was a compression uh, at the both the sides and ultimately we got a good result so now this is the literature about the success of tibio telocalcanal arthrodesis with intrabodal nailing a systemic review of literature that suggests that it works very well now dr gadegona said me that you saw the technique so i had uh, not having the video immediately so i asked dr rajiv sa and this is the video from dr rajiv sa i thank dr rajiv sa for uh, allowing me to show this video in this webinar and uh, this video is going on this is the case one which he has depicted here he is noted in case two just to show the technique of uh, ttc nail so first is the position what will be the position so supine then the bump under the gluteal region and also a bump at the ankle so keep it in in the neutral 
lateral transfibular approach. This is the lateral mellulus. This is the fourth metatarsal and 10 centimeter abo. Complete incision here he has marked. And now he has put an incision. He has demonstrated very beautifully the whole procedure and the exposure. He has completely exposed it. Then it was the fibula which was osteotomized to turn around. And this is the picture of uh, osteotomy of the fibula has been done and uh, made ready to turn around to be used as a natural plate, bone as a plate. Now the ankle joint is exposed and all cartilage and everything has been removed. Now the subtalar joint is getting prepared, lamina spreaded, spreader was put inside and very sharp osteotome and then the temper reduction is required. So this temper reduction is done to have an alignment of the nail and have an exact entry. It is better to have a reduction in temporary fixation with the ST pin. You can see here, this is a good possibility of putting the ST pin and putting in the, seeing in the both the planes and then decide and select the implant which gives the compression at the both the sides subtalar and ankle this is the straight nail of the matrix titanium nail 9 10 11 is available 150 to 330 mm and difference of 30 and there is a dynamic hole here you can see here freehand you can do and a dynamic hole here for an ankle compression dynamic hole here for a subtalar compression and this is a nut for the compression inbuilt inside and now what should be the entry anatomically? So you have to do a centering in both the planes. Here you can see one long pin has been put in this axis and this axis. And the cross section of these two pins will serve as the entry point exactly to have a good alignment of tibio tello telcanial nail. You can see that Dr. Raju sir has putting incision exactly there, then exposing the calcaneal part that in the that deep making the entry and reaming now after putting the guide pin now guide pin is checked whether it is in the center in the both the planes and then after that entry the reaming has been done the screw fixation chronology has to be very well thought of first you fix the above screw then do a Subtalar compression, ankle compression, and then the subtalar compression. And then you can go a freehand for uh, further EBO. This is the first subtalar compression where you can put that nut and uh, make a subtalar compression. And then you can put a screw EBO and then you can do a compression of the ankle. And then you have a good PA long calcaneal screw, posterior anterior calcaneal screw through the hole and the optional higher is the freehand proximal screw where you can put the proximal screw to have a good interlocking position and fibula here has been used as a live plate under surface of fibula is made rough and exactly put there and two screws one screw is going to the talus and one screw is going to the tibia and that works as a live lateral support with the plate as a bone graft structural graft and this is the position. This is the post-operative x-ray. I made little faster this film. Right? This is the case one. This is the case two. So this is the technique of how to go about that thing. This announcement has been already done. Thank you very much. Anybody has any question? We can. So I finished it little faster. Thank you. Thank you, Navin. You can stop sharing the screen. If there is any burning question to be asked regarding the TTC nail, otherwise we have Dr. Tanna to take the... Yes, next. sir. Tanna, sir, is busy still. So oh, we sir. go ahead and then uh, if he's not uh, available, uh, Sangeet will play the video last. Yes. Okay, so, so we'll go on the routine. Sangeet, you can do your presentation. Kardal.
So till that time, if he is available, then uh, he is going no, to talk. Yeah. I think we have now the next presentation by uh, Gade Gonesar himself. Forearm nailing. Uh, yes, forearm nailing indications and surgical technique. Rajiv Chatterjee next. So, thank you, Shiva sir, for cooperating uh, and uh, leading a front uh, foot uh, in this webinar. And uh, this is the nailing in adult forearm fractures. Crux of treatment of forearm fracture is the restoration of the radial bow is important. And that is the main thing which improves the rotation and strength. Hence, non-operative treatment is not advocated. Most accepted method is the open reduction and internal fixation is a gold standard and it's the literature says that this is the treatment of choice. But however, the plate and screw fixation, extensive surgical exposure, periosteal stripping, compromised vascular supply, increased operative morbidity, infection and refracture after removal of the plate. So intramodulary fixation in 1940s and early 50s, diapygial forearm fracture were treated by nailing with K wires and rust pins and indeed very poor result due to lack of stable fixation. The first oversight straight square shaped rim nail was developed by Street in 1954 pioneer in India, A.K. Talwalkar, Mumbai, designed and propagated a square nail for a diaphyseal forearm fractures. So intramodulary fixation, restoration of the radial bow was introduced by Sage in 1959 with the development of a pre-bent nail system. And this is one of the example of a fracture of a both bone forearm with a uh, this uh, molded nail, this fracture was fixed and union was achieved. Union with a good callus formation is because of the relative stability. And there are literature reports also says very encouraging result. Marek and Talwalkar achieved 100% result with the square nail. Kare et al showed union rate of 95.6. Moda et al. has observed 90% union. The average period of POP mobilization was six weeks. So diaphyle fractures of the forearm, plating versus intramed nailing, which is the better option? Open reduction and internal fixation with compression plate is a gold standard, which gives 98% union rate. Whereas internal fixation with the Talwar square nail, average, there was a 92% union rate. Pitfalls of unlocked nail, a straight, rigid, and thick nail could not restore the radial bow. Jamming of the nail and splitting of the shaft was noted. Thin nail permits a rotatory and substantial lateral motion at the fracture side, breakage of the thin nail and implant migration before union. So the most important complication is a painful hardware ulnar bursitis, non-union, malunion restricted motions were reported and therefore this procedure was abandoned and majority of the surgeons, they have shifted to the plating system. But with the newer nail design in interlocking capability and enhanced anti-rotational stability, Literature reported their union rate at 95 to 100%, which is comparable to the open reduction and plating. And there is a distant advantage. It prevents shortening in a metaphyseal, comminuted, and in segmental diaphyseal fractures of the forearm. So interlocking nailing is a technically a demanding procedure to put a screw in the very small hole and injury to the posterior intracess nerve is a reported. So I have developed a new concept in the treatment of forearm fracture with a screw intramodulary nail with a 96% excellent to good result. 
this is the screw intramedullary nerve which is more or less a modification of a talon nail and it is available in all sizes and there is a screw at the top which can be screwed into the metaphysis and screw head is placed at the end of bone to prevent migration so that the distal tip should be in the subchondral bone and the screw in the metaphysis. So this is an example of a restoration of a radial bow by intramodal nail union and full function and use elastic nail for restoration of a radial bow. This is the procedure how it should be done. The bowing of the radius can be achieved by proper contouring of the nail and you must have a good inserter to grip the nail so that we can pass very, very slowly inside the medullary canal of the radius. And Alna, these are the instruments which are required for the nailing. This is the method you can use a forearm distractor or a manual traction. Close reduction is achieved by a longitude traction and direct pressure at the fracture site. And you must assess the length and diameter of the nail on the normal side. Close or a K wire assisted reduction. You can use you can use a two K wires, uh, medial and lateral, and you can manage how to get the reduction. But however, 10 to 15 percent may require a mini open reduction. Ulnar nail entry to the tip of the olecranon, and with the help of a spin bend pin or a bone hole, we can directly reach to the metaphysis of the olecranon tip. Ulnar entry, this is the tip of the trochanter. You can see here, this is how it is done. And proximal opening of the canal, you can do it with the Stinman pin and it is straight hole so that it should be a proximal entry enlarged to put the nail up a, a 4.5 mm screw up a near about a two, a one and a half inch length. So this is how it is. And then reaming of the canal is done because we mostly do ulnar nailing is a rim nailing and you rim the nail till you reach to the isthmus and then you can also reduce with the assisted K wire and then go into the digital fragment. So this is how and then we have to insert the nail slowly, slowly and then last you can do a screwing in the metaphysis so that the placement should be perfect in the metaphysis and two, three screw thread should be out of the bone so that we can remove the nail whenever it is indicated. And then after this, a radial entry point, I preferably use a, a stylite process entry point and identification of entry point with the K wire window to the radial stylite between the tendon of extensor carpi radial is longest and the extensor policies brevis very important to uh, take care of the superior superficial radial nerve that is most important because if you endanger the superior radial nerve, you probably will get a hypostasia. So incision is enlarged till and the incision is dilated till the bone to prevent injury to the radial nerve and curved bone all is inserted. So this is you must be aware of the anatomy of the superior radial nerve. And this is the most important thing. And sometimes a reduction and uh, isthmus rimming and nail insertion. And this is how it is done uh, for radius. Mostly radius nailing is more difficult than the ulna nailing. And more, most probably it requires the help of a K wire or a percutaneous towel clip insertion. Suppose if you are not able to do a close reduction and negotiation of nail, there is no hesitation just to uh, give a small incision at the fracture side and uh, do a open reduction. So this is the use of a percutaneous wire to assist in reduction and displacement fragment so that we can stabilize the floating fragment and then negotiate the nail. That is the importance of a K wire. How can you see the displaced fracture here? just aligning with the K wire and just pushing the nail inside. 
but nail in the medullary canal should be slightly looser then and then you will be able to push snugly fitting the inner radius is a difficult to negotiate so this is the reduction and rimming and nail insertion of this this is the method rim nail alna and mostly earn rim rail in the radius so traction is released nail is forwarded the tip of the nail should be situated distal to the radial head without penetrating into the joint and last thread of a spiral should be located outside the bone to make the removal of the implant easier and you must reduce the distraction if there is a distraction that must be that the gradual uh, manipulation and you can see here you have to see the rotational stability and also see that the joint in the nail is in the joint or not so in a disparity of the canal in the radius mostly and in alna sometime you pass a first a reduction nail and then a very small stabilizing nail so that you will reduce the diameter of the canal and you can see here how a translation in the radius is now it is uh, uh, you can see here how this can be done and this is the translation after a radius and you pass a small size uh, rush nail you can pass go to the fracture side and you will sign as soon as the canal is aligned with the nail the translation is reduced this is the disparity of the canal to stack nailing are used so entry radial to the side of the distal tubercle you can use it also and this is well known procedure it need not be done but you can use a radial style like process or entry point radial side of the distal tubercle it's a surgeon choice mostly but i use a style like process entry point the nail was introduced through the metaphysis towards the medulla using a second tunnel with the help of a bone hole entry lateral to the lister tubercle this is the example and you can use this also very well there is no problem about it it's a choice but in a radial style at progress we have to struggle little bit to uh, reduce the translation in the lateral to the uh, tubercle there is a straight canal is aligned and therefore it is easy to pass so mostly a closed cosmetic procedure above elbow strap for near about 4 to 6 weeks but 10 to 15% do require a minimum open reduction in the picture and one drop pack is there use of a fluoroscopy may be a concern achieve stable fixation if required by stacking nailing so these are all examples fractures at the same level treated by close nailing and this is a radiological and functional outcome another example the very distal fracture radiation ulna it has been treated by a close nailing this is another example in a disparity of the canal of radius and ulna a stack nailing was done and you can see here how perfectly the radial bow is Uh, reduced and there is a, a stable fixation of the radius and ulna this is another example most unstable fracture i don't deny that the plating is the most standard procedure but you can see how i achieved with the stack nailing of the ulna three years of follow up perfect restoration of the anatomy so stack nailing this prevents injury to the posterior injury nor it is a common to observe while doing a plating and interlock nailing in a very very proximal radius fractures and in conclusion stack flexible nailing technique for radius ulna fracture in adult can be viable and a easier alternative to plating it avoids plaster immobilization after a stack nailing because it gives a very stable construct and this is another example you can see here it is written in the book that comminuted fracture requires a plating to restore the leg but if the comminuted fracture if length is maintained and the fracture is left close the bone grafting is not necessary and you can achieve the length 
by putting the nail properly into the subchondral bone of radius and putting a screw into the metaphysis. And you can see here how this is one of the example, a very comminuted fracture. No doubt that the plating will restore the leg, but you can see here how the nail has restored the leg by achieving a axial, uh, axial length. It can maintain the length if lay, placed, uh, this nail is placed properly in the subchondral bone and comminuted fracture, they heal around the nail, but only there is a difficulty that it needs some time a above elbow cast for near about four to six weeks. So this is a revision surgery, a plate fixation failure, probably you would have needed another plate and bone grafting, but I did with the restoration of the length with the screw nail, and then you can see here how the things that we done, restoration of length, bone grafting, and the fracture has united. So failure of primary hybrid fixation union with the stack nail and bone grafting. This is a close intramedullary nailing in an isolated fracture of a radius as well as ulna. You can see here a segmental fracture, good union and good callus formation. Here is a comminuted fracture, length is maintained and the fracture has united. So against nailing, against nailing of the forearm will achieve the relative type of stability through nail, hence plaster cast is required. Plaster causes a permanent stiffness of a joint and rehabilitation takes a longer time. And this is the standard, standard uh, observation which is seen in the literature against the nailing. So plaster causes a permanent stiffness of a joint is a myth. An uninjured joint never gets stiff if immobilized up to six weeks in any form of splint or plaster. And that is, I am not saying a John Lansare after a, 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 a experienced uh, late uh, John, sorry, he has written in his stage book. So incomplete reduction of one bone might produce a distraction of the other bone. But yes, it is possible. Alna is a relatively straight bone, so no issue in leaning but it is more issue in the radius and therefore restoration of a radial bow is the most important and problem is to, uh, to restore the radial bow. Caution, eccentric entry, hence use a prevent 2.5 uh, millimeter nail to restore the radial bow in practice is rarely observed, but with the careful thumping and compression, distraction can be reduced and if at all if you are so much worried you can use a small a reconstruction plate to reduce the bow. So this is a some loss of radial bow. It is an example and you can see here good functional outcome and step four months is able to do supination and pronation. Another example of a loss of radial bow is segmental radius fracture with ulna and full function 12 months and you can see there is a some malalignment and some rotational issues still the patient has yet to learn. So how it happens? Some terminal RMO may be lost especially supination of the forearm. I do agree but the majority work which can be performed without full supination and over a period of they compensate and you can see very very few um, maneuver will require a full supination. It is the mostly a mid-prone and supination. So how it is? Proposition, when both bone forearms are fractured, radial bow is last, ulna and shoulder probably adapt to allow the full rotation. In isolated radial structure, it is probably more important to retain the radial bone. And you can see how it is the compensation is done. And you can see here, how the compensation is done in the, how the, if the supination, if at all it is lost, you can see how the patient takes elbow away and the shoulder and elbow compensate for your loss of, some loss of supination. And you can see here videographically, and this is how it goes slightly away from your trunk and it can, it can, it can compensate.
so nothing always works highly comminuted fracture fracture at the end of bone backing up the nail persa formation and removal is essential otherwise it's a very difficult so it is not a good indication for doing a nailing so non union of radius if at all occurs it can be done by plating and you can do a very near about 4 to 5% of the patient they big require a revision surgery so literature is grossly inadequate even google pubmed failed to show enough references regarding nailing in adult both bone forearm fracture it is my meticulous record of operated patient by me and it is a google for me and pubmed for me so in conclusion literature also says that the intramural nailing of adult forearm fracture appears to be a good alternative to the plate osteosynthesis i am nailing is associated with a shorter operation time and lower complication rate as compared to the ori so mini invasive biological method you decide what you want open or a closed surgery choice is yours but literature say that the plating is a gold standard and advantages of intramural nailing implant stress sharing beware which leads to secondary periosteal callus formation no chances of recur fracture mostly scarless cosmetic surgery implant migration is prevented because the screw fits into the metaphysis of radiation alna biological method of fracture fixation results are compared to the plating you also make your choice of nailing in a next case i assure you you shall never regret and take home message plaster is the past present is the plate but i assure you in the future close intramural nailing will be the future thank you very much thank you dr gade gone for that wonderful uh, exposure to all types of nailing definitely because uh, it said that uh, due to injury to the intra intraosseous membrane one should treat the radius ulna fracture as a intra articular fracture and absolute anatomical reduction is required with the help of plating as done more damage probably and that is the reason why the nailing is not that popular and you have addressed many of them like backing out of the ulna by putting a screw intramural in nail by maintaining the radial bow by using a prebent nail and also by adding a stacked additional nail you have given shown lot of cases and uh, if there are any burning issues i think sanjay dhawan president has already raised the hand yes yeah all the garden go there most of the time if you have a communication fracture and you have putting a nail whatever curve you make but once it passes through a narrow canal almost this curve gets straightened so in transverse fracture most of the time they and if it is like near the isthmus you can have a bow maintained but in a comminuted fracture how you, what is the trick that you can maintain that bow because once it goes through isthmus it becomes almost straight so no, is sir, there any trick if you use a elastic nail and prebending prebending is very important for radius not for that is important for ulna so when you do a prebending so that your the apex of curvature of the nail should be at the radial bow and then you can and suppose a straightening does occur sometime so if you use a small canal small nail of a thinner size so that it will go into the canal and it will really maintain your radial bow so it's a theoretical question if you do it properly it will radial bow is maintained and i don't say that all radial bow will be restored by doing a nailing it said to be do learn the technique how to do radial bow uh, even in the your plate is also used if you don't contour it properly you may lose this the straightening of the radius that is possible so it's a error of judgment and uh, it's a technical and how, how thin a nail you can use for nailing in the radius you are not able to negotiate 2.5 then don't use it because 2 mm will not give you proper enough strength and uh, bending of the nail will occur 
So 2.5 and 3. Or if you are using a 2 mm, then you must use a stacking of the canal in a broader sense in the proximal ulna and a distal radius. Uh, this stacking is important because you must fill the canal. You must use the principle of both rust as well as Kunstner. Rust principle of three point fixation and Kunstner principle of filling the canal because here the you are not able to do a very good rimming in the radius, but we can stack and fill the canal. I just want to add Thank one you. point to that. Even if the medullary canal is wide, don't use a thicker 3.5 or 4 millimeter wire because that will straighten the radial bow and the supination will be restricted. So always try to use 2.5 or 3. Don't go beyond that. So, so Sir Sankar, Tanna Sir has joined. So we can ask Yes, yes. Yeah, I think Tanna Sir can give his talk on uh, non-union humerus. Why the humerus... Uh, doesn't unite. Tanna, sir. You please project. Uh, Sangeet, you have to project. Is it visible now? No, not yet. You, that's a video you have. Yeah. Okay. Okay, then you can project the video. Yes, Sangeet, we can see. Yeah. I am here, but I am on the phone. I am with the phone here. So I'll be there for the what question and the mailing and what next? That is what is my subject. All clear? Yes. Problems of nailing in humerus shaft. The distal part of the humerus is too narrow. So if the nail is a slightly longer and it can break this bone like this. The oblique fractures are not stable in the nail, as you can see it very well. Even two, three screws which you put in is still not stable in a oblique fracture. Same thing is in a transverse fracture. Transverse fracture also the rotational stability is not there with this nail. The proximal part of the femur, uh, sorry, humerus, is slightly expanded at times. And if it is expanded, the fracture is proximal, very proximal here. Then also it doesn't give you too good a stability. And the narrow canal lower down, nail is stuck as generally the reamers are not used as the small reamers not easily available. Those who have the small reamers, 4 millimeter, 5 millimeter, they can go. Here probably the surgeon went in the lower fragment and hammered it. He couldn't push it further because the nail is too tight. That's the reason it got distracted. He couldn't take it out because the nail was stuck and this nail is out. So these are the problems of nailing in uterus. Now in a comminuted fracture like this, you can do a nailing and keep in the cast brace or anything. Earlier I used to do it and it heals up. But today, that's not the way in which it is generally done. Today such comminuted fractures are better treated by a micro plate, as you can see it over here. Anteriorly here, three screws, here three screws and things become perfectly all right. And as you can see here, in such segmental fractures, still the nailing is the indicator. Okay. And you may have to support it for some time. Now, in a, such a lower down fracture, as you can see, lower oblique fracture, the surgeon has done the sterility is not there. He has done the nailing. And then lower one third, the nail does not give enough stability. And that's the reason why he has again done an Indian jugaad and tried to do this, but this will never work. This is the Indian jugaad, it doesn't work. Same thing here now, as I mentioned, the next. This is why it happened. Nail stuck, tried to hammer. Fracture got distracted, couldn't remove the nail, it stuck in the distal narrow cavity. How it could have been avoided? It could have been avoided, as I mentioned to you, if you had the 3 millimeter and 4 millimeter reamers, which you can go down, ream it out, and then the nail can go in. But generally, that reamers are not available in the Indian design. Only in the foreign design also, as I am aware of, only the seamer has it from 4 millimeter. Some of the Indian people have made it, and if you have it, that's the only way you can avoid this. Now you can see nail came out easily as it was four months. 
and in spite of the fact in spite of the fact that the nail was a uh, nail was out of the shoulder still you had a very good range of movement as you can see it over here very good range of movement and in spite of that and this is the compression plating which is done and that's the reason why probably i feel it is a myth that if the nail is out and if you remove the nail the shoulder movement are permanently restricted now here it is the same situation the nail was stuck here and again it could be treated by the compression plate there is a good literature evo foundation has mentioned orthopedic trauma directions taken together these reports suggest that intramedullary nailing resulted in more complications compared with the plate fixation of the humeral shaft fractures particularly when the anti grade approach was used there is also the report here that block intramedullary nailing was the dynamic compression plating of the humeral shaft complication rate was higher in the intramedullary nail group whereas the functional outcomes were good with both modalities thomas rudy individually experienced surgeon my personal experience however i favor straight as it seems to give consistently good results and functional outcome and minimal discomfort and a low complication rate there is enough evidence in the literature plating is shaft of the humerus is better non union rate is lower in plating and the operation rate is higher in nailing and lower in plating in relatively stable fracture i do nailing in comminuted or segmental fracture i feel it is not stable in transverse fracture generally i do not do it in transverse fracture plating of the humerus transverse fracture is different different from the comminuted fracture now you can see that this is the fracture which has gone into uh, non union and this is the one which the jugar which was done this is never going to work by any of these means all what you need is the compression and as you can see here i have in any of the screws nearby this is a compression screw this is a cortical compression screw cortical compression already locking screws and this is the one that the whole thing heals up but the main aim is is a compression which is that this compression is the most important part of it now here was the nailing which was done the nail as you can see got infected original one infected then just cleaned it out washed it out antibiotic beads and as you can see the whole thing ultimately healed up and then we did i did the nailing on both sides this was a dexa was 4.8 Hole was really parotid. Even two plates I did. Till ultimately everything worked out. He just got another fracture. So this thing with the fibula and everything, this has not remained. So this is the way in which you can end up in two if you are unlucky by multiple factors. And more so in a the infection occurs into the really osteoporotic thing. Now here is the transverse fracture, and you can see the transverse fracture. The nailing has a fracture here. so the way to take it out is i went down and i put in the pen k wire pen k wire i could push it out and it came out of the fracture so that was the way it was easily taken out so the broken nail was removed and now as you can see here i have put in the iliac crest strut in the intramedullary cavity instead of the fibula you can see the iliac crest strut and then compression plating was done as you can see this is the typical compression plating i'll spend some time on to this so there is the iliac crest graft then i did the plating so this is the screw this is first screw on one side and this is the screw below the graft and this got the compression first then i did the second compression with the second screw and once the compression was achieved i did these two locking screws and this is the way the whole thing is completely healed up and as you can see the patient is perfectly all right put link this is the put link oblique stress relieving cortical screw this is what he has described not much literature is there for this but he has suggested that last screw put in the cortical screw oblique screw like this then it is a stress riser will not happen initially we used to put a half a screw but now this is what is been recommended Still, there is not enough proof about this. Now, here was the fracture, 2002. Treat somebody treated with these X-rays, and then treated with the nail. 
This is the fourth surgery, and the nail, and as you can see, the whole thing is completely uh, osteolytic, non nutrient. There is no infection. So this was the nail, and everything. This is five years post infection. This is the different nutrients, right? You see it. So you can see this is 10 years post injury and five years after the after the last surgery. And this is the way stage again I saw the patient. This is the grill point which is there for many years. Fortunately, there was no infection. So I went down, I put an intramedullary fibula. Put in the compression screws, uh, the plating, the pillow plate with the compression for whatever I could do, and put in a massive bone graft here. And you can see this is in eight months' time, the whole thing is held up. But naturally, with these four, four, five surgeries and ten years thing, the fracture held up beautifully. But you can see the range of movement is only restricted. The shoulder range of movement is restricted. And I had followed it up for quite a few times. Even about five years later, I spoke to him. And he says it is only about 50 to 60 percent range of movement. He didn't get any more range of movement. Now, uh, here was the patient. Oh, this is segmental fracture. Three minutes, somebody did the nailing. The nail is again popping out here. This is the oblique fracture, and this was the comminuted log of the fracture. Fortunately for him, the lower fracture held up. But the upper fracture being there, it went into non union. This is six months. It is here, and you can see this is completely completely lighting area. So the surgeon did a second to guard. He put a small, piggly little plate and three screws here and two, three screws here, as you can see here. Once he has put in, and this is six months now. And over the time, in 18 months, this has again gone into total non-union. Now at this stage, I came into the picture and I saw the patient I did the plating, compression, I couldn't remove this screw, so the intramedullary fibula, compression of the fracture, and this fracture is completely held up. You can see the range of movement. He has an excellent range of movement. You can see it very well. In spite of the fact, for 18 months, the nail was out, but once the nail was removed and he did the physiotherapy, he has an excellent range of movement, which you can see it very well. Now, here was the patient. This is from Dr. Shiva. He had this sort of a nail being broke down, so he took it out. And again, the plating is a major issue. Now, this sort of a long oblique fracture, I, you can do the nailing if you are a nailer, but this is the way I would suggest. I reduce the fracture, open it, I reduce the fracture. And then I put the nail, I reamed it, and put a guide wire, and put in a nail. By holding the fracture, reduced. Now, having reduced the fracture, I put in the cortical screws so that it doesn't hit the nail after the nail was put, keeping the clamps there. And I put in the unicortical, only on one side. It is this oblique fracture, you could put it one side in there. And this is the way it is. Ultimately, this is type of nail. Still, I do it in such a long oblique fracture. And you can see everything is beautifully held up. Now here is the second case again, same sort of a thing. I held it. It, nailed it, and I put in this two, uh, two leg screws, unicortical, and the ultimately the thing will be done. As you can see here, I'm holding it there, and then afterwards, after the nail is gone, I put in the leg screws, and the patient is perfectly all right. Now, here you can see this is Dr. Shiva's case. He has done the nailing, and at this stage, he injected platelet rich plasma. But I told him that here at this stage, the nature had probably helped him. And this was some bone formation is seen here. In any case, he injected this in five months follow-up, uh, 20 days follow-up, this is what it is. And ultimately, it healed up. As, as, you, as you can see it over here, it healed up very well. This is again his second case. This is the nail and the leg screw which was done. You can see the instability, so the bone lysis has occurred, and he has gone down and did the compression and the plating. This he has not touched it, which is not of any importance, and the whole thing is held up with the pieces. So in conclusion, non-union shell
had numerous treatments in thigh compression and bone grafting and plating. As you could see, this is the way the compression. First do the one compression, then do the second on the opposite side. Then while doing this thing, you take it out a little so that the nail, the screw here, which is at the edge, will shift there and this will remain. So you will get a much better compression. I'm sure everybody is aware of the basic principles. And you can see here, do not do in a such a short of me. Do not do a leg screw. The surgeon did the leg screw here. And as you can see, this is gone into non union completely. And you can see intraoperative, this part is completely white, which I had to excise. Up to here, where you can see the blood there. So this part had to be excised, where the surgeon had tried to put the screws. And this is the one which is not going to be there. So same thing on the opposite side. Also, I had to excise, I had to shorten the things, and then do the compression. Now you can see it is an oblique fracture. If you have to do the compression, do not do leg, but do the compression. If you have to do the compression, if your first screw becomes onto the acute side, then the segment will move. So the first screw has to be onto the obtuse side. Once it is on the obtuse side, and now you do the compression, it will jam in there, and that is the only way in which you can get this compression. Short of the fracture, never do a leg, only compression. This is a Multiple operated intramural defibrilla is very sudden. I have yet to see a failure in this intramural defibrilla operation. And you can see here also in this case, I put in the fibula and put in the multiple screws. And this is the one only way in which I could see third time operation. Don't, don't keep anything ambiguous. Do overkill, but do this and I'm happy. So here it is. This is Elvin Toffler. And beautifully he has said, the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read or write, but those who cannot learn and unlearn and relearn. This is what you and me, all pedic surgeons, have to be doing. Friends, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tana, sir, for showing a lot of cases and all the varieties of cases. Uh, my question is, I know you don't do nailing for a transverse humeral fracture, but by chance somebody has done a transverse humeral fracture nailing and the fixation is good. And it is not showing union, but patient is not having any clinically symptoms. How long will you wait till you take any further decision of intervention? Good question, Shiva. Shiva, I think if there is no pain, I'll do a CT scan. What we have observed recently is you take a CT scan, there is always seen on one corner some bone healing occurring, which in a radiology, in one view or two views, you may not be able to pick it up. I have made a presentation at some stage, I'll be presenting that. So if it is a healing is occurring at one stage, that's the reason why there is no pain. And if you wait long enough and take a subsequent CT, you'll be able to appreciate that increasing healing process, then you don't need anything. But if in case there is no callus on any of the sides in all the cuts of the CT, then probably this is the one which is not healing up and you may need a, either a supplementary plate or a compression plate or whatever you need. Thank you, sir. Any question to Dr. Tana, sir? Sir. Sir, if you today, if you get a oblique type of a fracture, and uh, as you said, it is a transverse fracture, the plating is the only gold standard. But now the majority of the surgeons are also turning towards the uh, this uh, nailing uh, because of the newer uh, multi lock nails are available. What is your take on this thing? Yeah, I think a multi lock leg, if you can do a good fixation. And if the if the if the medullary cavity of the humerus is good in the middle, so the isthmus, even if it is an oblique fracture, probably it will heal up. But if the fracture is slightly distal, like we talk about in femur and tibia, then that fracture in a humerus, I feel, is not very comfortable. But with the multi-lock nail, you can improve the stability, and it may be an option. So thank you very much, sir. Can you, ask, sir. Can you Rajiv has a question. Yes, uh, Rajiv. 
what's your uh, take on using uh, anterior bridge plating the main worry was with the comminuted fracture sharp diaphyseal fractures we were nailing them with the anterior bridge <clears throat> plating what is your comment on that i thought there was one slide of that that i do not do in a comminuted fracture nailing but i do the anterior bridge <laughs> plating which is very very good sir. there is no uh, question about it only only issue occurs is in a young females in the scar which is there which is visible to them and to everybody so that's the only one which is a major drawback of that anterior plating otherwise it is functionally and um, healing wise i think it is an excellent treatment there is no question about it <coughs> i had the issues when in a young girl i did that and uh, her only problem was her fracture is healed up i have a full range of movement but i have to i have to wear the sleeves full sleeves in order to hide this scar while posteriorly if it is there neither the patient sees nor anybody else sees so it is hidden even if it is a long scar probably it doesn't come in the picture my question to tanna sir again the complication rate of nailing as per majority of the paper papers is around 8% <laughs> In the plating, the complication rate is four uh, percent. But we all feel that nailing has lot of complication. And uh, what is the reason? Because we see lot of problems with nailing in our OPD rather than with the plating. Why it is so? I think the nailing is a cheaper option in majority of the situations, and you do not need that compression and other things to be done for that. So the people do the nailing. at any level of the fracture in the isthmus which i think the way now the newer generation which is doing it with the reaming it so that it doesn't get stuck in those cases which are there and you can have a good fit at the isthmus above and below the fracture like tibia and femur same thing will happen probably in humerus if you have that you will be able to get a good fixation but that's what the nailing is done without any reamer by majority of the people so it is a hit and a miss surgery and once it is lower down as i showed you those two three cases where the jugar you try to immobilize with anything that's the reason why it goes into non union very often thank you sir thank you very much uh, in spite of your busy schedule now i know you are in washi attending a cme you joined us and dr tanna is the father of interlocking nailing in india he brought the tanna's nail and we popularized uh, everything in india and thank you for that uh, participation sir now i'll move on to the thank you very much i enjoyed being here thank you shiva thank you sir thank you sir now i we move to the talk on compound fracture by rajiv chatterjee from kolkata he is the past president of nails over to you rajiv i uh, a very good morning uh, sorry i am a bit jet lagged so please excuse me uh, i just arrived yesterday I spent time with children in uk am i audible Yeah, yeah, yeah. So basically, open fracture femur nail, and why are we discussing at all? What are the other options? Using a Thomas splint, an open fracture. I mean, it's great in ER, but it's temporary. Let's face it; it's just temporary. You can't keep on continuing it uh, till you are sure to go into next step. And actually, it has no role after you have debrided the fracture because it's unstable. Coming to external fixators, yes, they are great temporizing devices. but they are temporizing because you have pin side problems because these pins go through a really bulky amount of soft tissues muscles and if you leave them on too long beyond 2 to 3 weeks they will start bending and causing pin tract uh, discharging and want loosening and obviously you can't hold uh, unless you have something like an ortho fix holding the fracture with an external fixator is not a great uh, tool so obviously in a fracture like this a gastro type 1 small little uh, you know just bone poking out there is no choice you have to go and nail it so you get it uh, late evening this came late evening about 10:30 11 at night next morning it's at 8 o'clock in the morning first thing on the list debrided open cleaned and nailing and this is there is no questions about it so what are the questions we need to see uh, ask ourselves do we open the fracture yes because the success of nailing depends on a thorough debridement because debridement is the Uh, is is a rock on which our next healing process is built on so open the fracture even the small ones are opened up to 3 to 4 cm clean the bone out remove any devitalized tissues 
and then going for kneeling. Reaming, again, is a yes. Yes and yes. Because you have to get a large nail with a thicker lock screws, better stability to give you early healing. So, so two questions with nailing of open fractures. You have to open it. You have to debride it. You have to ream it. And once you ream it, you put a large nail with large locking screws and with good contact across the fracture surfaces. And this is what we've been discussing so far. I think with Navin Tucker's uh, cases, the one thing that I've learned throughout is that you cannot leave the OR without having some contact, at least one third to half contact across your fracture site. If you do that and use tricks like uh, remove dynamization, you're cheating yourself. You have contact one third to half to one third across the fracture site. That fracture is going to unite anyway. So, is there any literature in the uh, uh, to support my hypothesis that you can nail these open fractures? This is way back. 40, uh, this is about 33 years ago, Brumbach, Burgess, 86 patients, 89 open fractures, femur sharp, thorough, timely debrumor, immediate IM nailing, grade one, grade two, and some grade three. Very small chance of post-operative infection if you have done a good debrumor. Another article, again, uh, sorry. Um, next one. This is uh, um, an article, 1991. Again, 30 years ago which again showed primary reamed IM nailing is an effective alternative for treatment of type one, type two open fractures, and quite a few of the type three fractures in which you might have temporized. So since last 30 years, we have known nailing. So why are we discussing? There's no discussion, you have to nail them. But things are slightly different in this case. This gentleman had a slight argument with the bus uh, after having a few uh, C2H5OHs coming back from a party. And actually the bus ran over his leg and a bit of a horrendous wound out there. This is a, he came at about night, 11, 11.30 at night. So would I nail that? No, I wouldn't. This is the fracture. So what we did, it's the same night, went in, debrided. So I converted the bad, dirty wound to something like this and put a temporizing X-fix. With this sort of wound, do I leave it on an X-fix? No, because within three days, one wound check, 48 hours, 72 hours, back to OT, take the X-Fix off, nice wash, put a nail down, and got my plastic surgeons to cover the wound at the same time. So next trick is, if you're going to be having an open wound, cover the wound at the time that you're doing the fixation. So nail and cover the wound out. So this is what was done. So here is a, I know it's a low fracture. Maybe I should have put a, a polar screw in, but because with the amount of soft tissue injury, I was a bit worried. So I put a small triangular lock nailed down and put one screw on top and got a quick in, quick out. And this is him at six months. The fracture has healed to about 80%. In the, I think if you look at it, three quarters is a bridge across. And this is him who actually had a video. I didn't put it on because I was worried about the network issues. And he is back to working at six months. He's a builder by trade. He's a building contractor. He's back to riding his motorcycle at six months. And that horrendous wound that we saw on day one, and this is his leg today totally two different things. So if you do a good Devermore day one, temporize, convert as soon as possible, cover the wound as soon as possible, you will be a winner. Do I have any support for this? Yes, again, primary IM nailing is safe for open femur fractures. And then this, this article, uh, which says that conversion of external fixations to IM nailing. So they looked at 44 multiple injured patients and then most often the Exus was being put for DCU patients, and they were all converted as soon as possible to IM nailings. One patient out of 40, uh, 54, that is just 2% had refractory infected non-union, a very low percentage. One patient had non-union with nail failure, which was treated with a conversion to a larger nail, and infection was 1.7%, hardly anything. Everything is less than 2%. So this supports the notion that immediate external fixation followed by early closed intramedullary nailing is a safe treatment for fracture of shaft of femur. And here must, I must add that early closure of the wound, the wound has to be covered as soon as possible. You have to convert that into a completely closed assembly as soon as possible. Uh, this is another very interesting paper from Japan, which basically looks at, uh, can you correlate complications and open fractures to what all factors? So they did the multivariate uh, analysis and found out that if 
a higher gusty loss would lead to more chance of infection. And that is maximum 5%. So in those bad type 3 fractures, a 5% infection rate is not too much, I think. And you can treat them, you can debride later, you can put in antibiotic spaces, and you can get away with it. Non-union was related to higher gustulose fractures. This is obvious, this, this is a no-brainer anyway. Now, regarding open fractures with rotated, fra uh, uh, with rotated fragments which are lying free, you take this opportunity in this case to actually open those wounds out, derooted the fragment, and nail it. And this is what we have done here, put in Montaglin logs, and this fracture goes on to union in about eight months' time. And the lessons we learned here is that ideal timing, early debrimor, early nailing, an open reduction while you're cleaning the wound out. And I, I don't mean completely devitalizing the tissue, but minimally opening, you debride the wound, you make sure you see the bone ends, they're cleaned out completely. You take that opportunity to derotate the fragments and apply a multangular lock, these fractures will unite. Uh, this under paper, which is looking at is a most recent paper. I put it up because in 2021, and it's a paper from Samir Agarwal group from uh, PGI Chandigarh. And they looked at uh, type three femoral shard fractures. They looked at systematic review of literature and pool analysis of 176 cases. And the conclusion was again, intramedullary nailing in grade three femoral fractures, even as an early method of different fixation is an effective option. So. The type threes, which we are worried about, they can be treated very well if you have done an early debris and early intermodal nailing, and they give you good results. So in conclusion, nailing is a viable option for open fracture femur because you have no other options. Remember, the Bradman is paramount. That takes precedence and has to be done technically perfect. You have to get down to nice, clean bone. You have to get down to nice red tissue. If you're in any doubt, temporize with the X-fix, but remember, convert to a nailing as soon as possible, ideally within seven days. A reamed, locked, large nail helps in early recovery and early healing. Thank you. Rajiv, you have made it so clear that now there nobody should be hesitant of doing nailing in a compound fracture <laughs> if the proper care are taken. <clears throat> Thank you. I haven't slept for the last 30 hours, so I'm okay. Yeah. Better now. <laughs> Definitely, so. with the improved uh, surgical debridement techniques and uh, VAC, then availability of the plastic surgeons, then antibiotic also, all those things have changed the scenario. My question, both to you, Rajiv, as well as to Vivek, because Vivek has a lot of series of corporate fractures in Ames, Delhi. Uh, how quickly, if you are converting from an external fixator to nailing, uh, how quickly you can convert one. And if you are unable to convert within, say, about six weeks, how much interval time you wait to do a nailing? These are my two questions. Yes, so, Rajiv. Shall I go first? So basically, as I said in my talk, there's nothing like how quickly, as quickly as possible. So my time frame is day one, debrimor. Day two, because that day maybe I didn't get a plastic surgeon. 48 hours, I go back in with my plastic surgeon, do whatever needs to be done, get it done to completely like a, like a tumor debris So by that time I'm ready. So by my time frame is within seven days, I have to convert my x to a nail. That's the bottom point. Now, sometimes I get patients coming in from somewhere else with an x on. Those are the problem ones with, you know, which are, which I can't really go in and they have been debridement a couple of times. There, if it's, I've got it beyond two weeks, I will not convert straight away. I will put in a, take the X-fix out, wait for at least, uh, clean the, and most important is clean the pin sites out. The bride, clean the pin sites out, wait five to seven days, and then go in. But in, at that point of time, even if I'm in doubt, my bailout is an orthofix. I love the orthofix. I'm not good at elizorops and an orthofix. So if I think I'm in doubt, orthofix with this conical pins and get out. Sorry, over to you, Vivek. Yeah, Vivek. I just have to say what he has said. Early, no issues. You can go anytime. What we are dealing with mostly is the polypharma where the external fixator is applied, not for the open fractures. So open fractures is a different ballgame. You have to convert within seven days or so. But for a polytrauma situation where you have used it as a damage control and it was relatively a closed wound, 
in a my hospital previously i was used to wait till 2 weeks but now i have reduced it and maybe i would say 10 days is the cut off for me after that the chances of infection become pretty high okay. and we should be ready for giving a interval free period of at least a week after that look at the crps look at the other biochemical parameters and then only go about doing it previously i was going for 14 days there is a study by i think from tornata itself from tornitas. somewhere tornata where they said that it is around 3 weeks there 3 weeks 3 weeks maximum 3 weeks but i i was going for 14 days but unfortunately i have to reduce that span and go till 10 days i would say these are icu patient patients they are exposed yes. to all these exactly. big bugs because most that. most of us damage polytrauma is the damage control ones and when they come back to us after 5 to 7 days they are already going into the counter uh, cars time where the immunity is going down so i think we should be wary about doing and fixing at that time straight away with the fixator on okay sangeet you had a question yeah, the holiday period has to be uh, at least after 3 weeks because we don't know from where they are coming what they are yeah, carrying yeah. and even if they are from icu <laughs> again uh, the atmosphere and the skin will be loaded with bacteria so it will be safer to have after 3 weeks a holiday period of say 7 to 10 days sure. and during that period that is what was my question will you give antibiotics when you remove the pins uh one very important point here is when you remove the anti of uh, pins please spend half an hour curating those holes get the small long reamers in because those pin tracks are the biggest i found they have been biggest bug bears and i put them on the antibiotics during those time i don't know why uh, we give them for only for one two days maximum if they are coming from outside or so and then we just, we want a interval free period totally we want there because what we have found is whenever we give antibiotics for long and then under their cover we are doing some things as soon as he go back goes back he comes back with infection so we like to give a free period in between totally so what what i do is i give a 5 day period which is usually the antibiotic treatment period then stop for 3 days and then do it so 72 hours without antibiotics and do it right so uh, next yes. next uh, dr vivek trika he will be showing lot of cases about the uh, intraarticular fracture along with uh, shaft fractures where he has used the nailing yeah so vivek this trika is is from uh, a professor uh, from games delhi thank you sir thank you for the and learned a lot during the entire session this is a topic which is having a complication of combined articular and shaft fractures and they are your quite a unusual combination injury you won't be finding them so often in your place they are usually high energy and remember whenever you are dealing with such cases the impact has been quite great and there will be some associated injuries skeletal extra skeletal and many a times soft tissue also which are there along with that in the world there are limited treatment guidelines i could see only one or two papers in the world where this was the 2003 paper where they had only 10 cases of shaft and distal femur for the femur fractures where they managed with the nail and screws in 2003 again by david barai and sean nog group you had a fractures of the neck shaft and distal femur where they tried to evaluate in out of their 1600 cases they said it's roughly 2% which was pretty high but seven cases were there which were neck shaft and distal femur and if i go for the tibia part the only paper again is by david barai group in 2018 8 which has just 50 out of 1500 cases where they had a fracture of the articular area as well as the shaft both of them combined in a same bone only a review of literature from one person in 2018 a uh, end to end journal which i couldn't didn't know what was there so basically what we need to understand is how to diagnose and plan these cases so you can see a tibia and a femur fracture having a same side shaft as well as a separate articular fracture get a ct because that's what is going to analyze and give you where you are going to fix and how you are going to fix these cases what i'm going to deal with are the non contiguous patterns where the fracture from the articular is not extending into the shaft and they are two separate entities if they are unilateral or unis uh, both of them are same fracture of the articular going into the shaft many a times a single implant is going to help you but for these fractures are the places where you have a distinct articular fracture which is quite a high energy along with a shaft fracture which is again a high energy 
and you require good treatment plan for such. So the principle of fixation of these is that you need to do an articular fixation, which is anatomic with absolute stability. And we know that these diaphyseal fractures are not very low mechanism, they are high velocity. They also require good stability with relative as well as load bearing device, load sharing devices. Remember, the problem happens is the alignment problem, which is quite often in these cases because the articular area might give you a wrong alignment for the shaft. And what we want to do is a best possible fixation for both the fracture patterns. So I'll start with the femur first. And this is a fracture of a 40 year old male. You can see a undisplaced intertocantric fracture. You can see a shaft fracture and you can see a lateral condyle fracture again. So this is one of those rare types where you have the fracture at all the three type, three areas of the similar same field. Get a CT scan that helps you to evaluate what you're going to do and what can be the modality of fixation for such. Ideally, we require a fixation for the intertroc and the shaft in one go because a retrograde may not be helpful for this. We may require more than three implants if we go by that method. So what we try to do is maximum use two implants if you really want to do, because otherwise it's going to be a hodgepodge for you. So the first thing first, we fixed from anterior grade for the femur as well as the intertroc part, which you can treat separately. And the lateral condyle, which was mildly displaced was held first with the ball tips. And you had those drill bits and you secure that with a fixation. And then you can get about fixing the femur shaft in a separate plane and the shaft of the articular area, the articular fractures can be fixed separately with multiple screws. We could have used a plate here, but this was one of our initial cases. It was done, I think in 17 or so, when we were not very sure of how to go about and should we use a plate or not? And that's what, and you can see that within few times, if you give the best possible fixation for the individual fractures, you will get good reduction and good results. Another fracture pattern, spiral one, but if you see there is another separate fracture of the medial condyle which is here. Similarly, it was more in a sagittal plane and the different plane and not hindering our entry point of the nail. So we tried to get away by doing an ideal and an optimal treatment for the shaft because our articular fracture which was non-contiguous was not affecting and influencing our entry point. However, it could get displaced while manipulation. So we fixed it with K-wires first, made our entry for the nail, and then after that fixed it. Why we did this way? Because many a times the nail may displace the things. And if you have already had a permanent fixation or a temp definitive fixation, you might not be able to secure it later. So that's why hold it with K-wires or a clamp. And then subsequently, after the nailing has been done, you can secure your articular again with more screws. And this is what it was in six weeks, four months, and finally after eight months. Another case, having an intertroc fracture and a lower third shaft fracture with a lateral condyle. And here again, the CT tells you where exactly is the lateral condyle. You can see it's a sagittal plane fracture. It's not a coronal plane of the distal femur. The nail entry point, if you really want from the distal part, will not be influenced by this. However, the fracture of the intertroc gives us a better choice because we already know that we have to go from the proximal part, secure the intertroc and the shaft, and then we can secure the articular in a separate manner. And it also had a PCL evolution, which was their 55 year old nail. So that's what we did fix the femur shaft as well as the intertroc separately from the best possible, which we would have done anyway. And then the lateral condyle, which was going up, was fixed with a small plate, again around 2018, if I remember this. And then this was fixed with the PCL fixed later, once subsequently, these all had been done. And this is his three months follow-up, where you can see that the intertroc has united, the distal femur is taking its own time, but the articular with complete reduction has got the things. And this is around 15 months later, when you can see that everything looks fine and he has got a good movement, a good fixation and a union provide because we have given the optimal stability which is required and not compromised on the stability for the individual fractures which can be there. So for a non-contiguous bifocal femur injuries, look whether the reduction of articular is dependent on the diaphyseal component, mostly it is not until unless it's a contiguous one. 
choose your fixation modality as per the individual fracture pattern and then see whether it will fit into each other or not. Both anti-grade and retrograde nails we can use and screw and plates in a combination. I've shown you screw augmentation and a plate augmentation as well. And the main crux is achieve stable fixation for both the fractures, absolute for articular and relative stability for the diaphyseal. Don't compromise in this because it's not like a neck and shaft fracture where the neck is a just a small injury, whereas the shaft is taking the brunt. Here, everything is taking a brunt of it and you need to take care of that. Coming to tibia. Same problem and same fractures. Segmental diaphyseal tibia with articular depression. Non-contiguous pattern. Individual intact bone between the two fracture patterns. So what you do, this was again done in our unit. You can see we individualize the treatment for that. Reduce your fracture of the articular part. We put in the bone graft just like we, forgetting the, inter in the, the shaft fracture right now. Reducing it and putting in the screws, which are mostly in the distal part or the posterior part, so that the screws can be into the posterior part and it is not going to interfere with our nail. And then the advent of suprapatellar nail has helped us immensely because even if we want to put in a plate which is on the lateral aspect, we are not going to have a separate incision and both the incisions clubbing together at the same place for the suprapatellar nails. And then the nailing is done by reduction with a percutaneous clamps. And subsequently, a nail with a suprapatellar nail can be done with a fixation separately for the articular part, as well as for the shaft part, which was segmental in this part. And the benefits of suprapatellar have already been told. Would have been difficult to do this with infrapatellar and would have been difficult to put in a long plates for such cases. Hence, suprapatellar combination with the screws is giving us good results. And you can see that both the things at four months follow up have united with good and excellent results. Another fracture, this was the first one which I did long time back, which was a floating hip, floating knee with a complete intraarticular fracture as well as the shaft fracture. We fixed the femur first with a shaft. And because of the skin conditions and the intra-articular things, we put in a fixator first. You can see the shaft fracture of the tibia as well as the intra-articular comminuted fragment here. And the skin condition like this. Plan, non-contiguous again. We wanted to get anatomical reduction. So what did we do? Looked at the entry point of the nail. It was interfering with this part. If we do go with a suprapatellar nail. So what we did was we used an infrapatellar nailing for this fracture and we used a lower entry point just like we used to do previously, a small incision for that. And with the same thing, holding our articular fractures together because the entry point would have been compromised by our intraarticular fracture of the nail, we would and gone and pushed our nail inside slightly lower tibial tuberosity in the region, not at the proximal part where we normally put on our nail, change the direction and got this reduction for the diaphyseal fracture. And you can see that the nail is buried inside, lower down. The articular is being reduced by the plate. And hence, this was his union at six months, which you can see with the femur as well as the tibia having united. Another fracture having a spiraling down, you can see the CT scan where the intra-articular fractures are going. Plan it out whether it is posterior, whether your nail entry is going to be interfering with your screws or the plates lateral depression, which is central and posterior. Again, the same thing, lifting it up, since it was going and having a slight split, we thought of putting in a plate. The plate screws are going posterior and the benefit of using a suprapatellar is your entry point is quite anterior. Most of these fractures are posterior. So all these fractures can be fixed with a plate before you are even making your entry point for such cases. And once you do this, you are putting in a nail and you can see our plate is slightly posterior, holding the central and posterior depressions, lifting it up, just like you would have done if the fracture of the shaft was not there. You would have treated this articular in the same manner. I'm not doing anything right. We are just shifting and com combining both the best treatment modalities for the, both the fractures, which rely on different principles of absolute stability and relative stability by using a nail and a plate. And that's what we did. And you can see the final result of that uh, with small incisions. A suprapatellar nail with minimally invasive lateral plate, which was fixed with that plate and its minimally invasive screws and all the small screws for the interlocking bones. 
So it is minimally invasive. You are not damaging the soft tissues. You are maintaining the vascular blood supply and getting the best possible fixation which you can at six weeks follow up and the results which show you with the good results. So for a nail plate construct for an articular and a shaft fracture, what do you need to understand? Look for the CT scan in the axial sections to understand whether your nail entry point is going to be affected by the reaming and the articular reduction is going to be hampered. Put in the screws if they are posterior or K-wise to hold that and reduce it. If you feel your depression is going to go down of the articular, put in a plate with most of the screws going posteriorly. You require the initial 7 to 8 millimeters of the tibia for your nail, not more than that because 5 millimeters is the entry and then the wrist will be for you for the screws. Use the diaphyseal look where you are going for the intramedullary. Remember that alignment of axis, if you are using a long plate for diaphyseal fractures, becomes very difficult, which you can get in these cases. So analyze the CT scan, reduce the articular reduction first, especially provide provisionally fix them with screws, plate, or thick K wires. Don't put in all your screws right at the first time. Plate and screws should be posterior to the nail first. If you feel that it is going to hamper, then you might have to change the things. Nail insertion should not affect the reduction. If it does, you can again reinforce it by putting in the screws. Which is the sequence of fixation? Analyze the CT. Is it being affected? Is the entry point of the nail affecting the reduction or is displacing the fracture? Secure articular. If the nail track is different, it can be managed independently. And I would just say this as it was discussed in the initial time of this seminar. If it is a coronal articular fracture pattern, like a Hofa's element or other things, are in the posterior medial of the proximal tibia, they can usually be independently managed. The nail can be done separately, and these fractures can be fixed anytime you want. However, the sagittal fractures, which are usually the ones which are having the articular depressions, you need to secure your reduction first, then do the nail, and then reinforce the articular reduction by putting in the screws away from the play nail wherever you can get the fixation. And that's what this fracture pattern, you can see how big a depression is. Just this, we did this fracture, I think, last week or last Friday, where you can see a big, huge depression of the proximal part and a shaft fracture going down later. Did the same thing, made it bo bone hole or a burr hole, lifted up the fracture posteriorly, post laterally as well as the posterior view and lateral view and AP view, fixed it with the screws with the bone grafts, with the plate on. You can see we have pushed in the, all the three screws here. The nail was put suprapatellar again, and then we got about this fixation. So finally, I would say evaluate other injuries because many a times they are going to dictate what you're going to do. CT is important because that is going to tell you whether you can use the two best implants for the two different fractures which require different principles of fixation. Particular reduction as well as mechanical alignment is very important. The plates may not give you the alignment. Axis alignment can be best by the nail. Suprapatellar nailing has made these things very easy and is advantageous in the these tibia fractures. And you can use a nail plate construct or intramedullary nailing just with screw augmentation, which can be used both for the femur as well as for the tibia. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vivek. That was a wonderful presentation with a lot of uh, complicated cases, uh, with a lot of tips and tricks for the newer people to adopt and learn and uh, get good results. So if anybody has a question, yes, Sangeet. Uh, in spite of good planning, uh, pre-operatively, uh, of yeah. how you are going to fix the articular part and the non-articular part, uh, still there can be uh, disasters. Uh, so how do you change or how do you plan that? Or okay. do you keep a plan B ready? Yeah, so for some fractures, which are, as I said, as uh, that thumb rule was very important for me. Those coronal fractures, I know they are not going to interfere anytime in my fracture pattern. So for them, I have got this plan. The only plan which might change is whether I'm going to use just the nail with all its interlocking screws holding that posterior medial fracture which has been fixed with a clamp or i'm going to use a buttress plate for that so that is the only thing but we normally would keep a plate and anything the problem happens when it is an articular fracture like i showed you with the infrapatellar one <laughs> and where the fracture is entering or just going into the nail entry point 
So that is a difficult situation. And there, I would just look at the CT preoperatively very properly, whether is it the fracture, like the last one I showed it was way posterior. So I knew this is not going to have any issues with my anterior. But if it is central or anterior, then I will definitely keep another fracture or another uh, implant as a backup. But for many of these, as I said, coronal ones, you can get away by doing these fractures easily by the best of the implants. For the sagittal fractures or the splits where articular depression is there, going into the entry point of the nail, there you have to be cautious keeping a backup for you. So probably the message is all must undergo CT scan. Yes, because, the, because then only you can understand in an axial view, especially where your fracture is and where your entry point of the nail is going to be, both for the distal femur as well as for the proximal tibia. We had for distal tibia as well, but I didn't show the same thing. That's easy to do many a times. With, uh, Vivek, now we'll move on to uh, Dr. Ram Krishnan, President of Kerala Orthopedic Association from Tiruvananthapuram. He'll be uh, talking about uh, infection following nailing. Over to you, Ram Krishnan. Give me a minute, sir. Am I audible? Yes, yeah. sir. Please. You have to share your presentation. Yeah, yes, sir. One minute. Finding some difficulty in sharing? Yeah, no, no. One yeah. Because he's far, far away. At the southernmost tip of India, at three. Yeah. Yeah. Is it? Uh, no, you have to press the share button down first, and then you share your presentation. I think that would help you. Excuse me, sir. Uh, on Maybe the, the bot green button at six o'clock, share. Screen. Share. Just share so it first. Your presentation. Yeah. Share the. Uh, click on the share button first. At the bottom of the okay. screen, you, you'll be seeing a share button. Click on that and then click on your presentation. One minute, sir. Yeah, no problem, sir. Take your yeah. time. Yeah, 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 no problem. Yeah. Feel comfortable. Yeah, my... what, what are you saying? You are, you are not able to share? Yeah. Mm. I'm, I'm clicking on the share button next. Should yeah. I go to the files? I think. Yeah, then, then you click on your presentation. The box opens in that box. You can see uh, the Zoom screen, small, many screens are seen, including your presentation. You have so to have you your presentation the on the desktop, which has been opened up. Then only you will be able to do that. Ram Krishnan, when yeah. you click on that uh, share button, can you see a screen where all of us are seen? Yeah, yeah. Then you click on that, then you can open through your laptop. You click on that, double click on that, share, and wherever the Zoom screen is seen, that will share your whole computer. Or by that time, I can share and he can get this too. Oh. I'm not that techy. That may be. Yeah, very... no problem. No, I'm clicking on the share button. Then click. There is a box which opens with a Zoom screen where you and me are all seen. You click on that. Yeah, I can see you, Shiva Shankar sir, and all. Yeah, you click on that. Okay. Double click. And then click on share. Then click on share. No, now should I open my PPT? Yeah, it's better to open your PPT first. Yeah, till that time, let's go to Rajendra. Yeah, yes. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Poonam, if you can help Dr. Krishnan, meanwhile, 
Yeah, he's on. So able to see my screen? Yes. Mm. Yes. Yeah. 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 So I'll present by that time. So infected non-union after nailing, what next? How do we manage? So we have three important goals. Whenever there is an infected non-union, we have to eradicate the infection first, achieve union, and also solve the problems associated with all this long battle of the patient. Generally speaking, we have two main problems, deep bone infection, as well as fracture, which has refused to heal. There is a fracture uh, which has not healed. And there can be various strategies we can use to manage such fracture. Either we can manage the infection and fracture together. So definitely we fix like in an exchange nail or we control the infection definitely first, like in a masculine technique or both at the same time, example in a acute shortening. So we have to think what is going to be good for that given patient. The management protocol for all these infected non-union, if we understand these six things which are very important. So number one is debride, debride and debride all non-viable infected tissue. Have to have a dead space management in place. Have a good local antibiotic delivery, delivery as well as systemic antibiotic. Stabilize the limb with whatever is available, whatever is feasible and whatever is indicated in that patient. And then reconstruct the limb in future. That would give you a good healing in an infected non-union. Nowadays, multiple options are available. A compression plate after you eradicate the infection, antibiotic coated nail. You can have an extracutaneous plate. You can have a LRS, X-fix or Elizaro. It depends on many situations what we are going to fix up with. The key essential is to understand is have a good debridement and control infection. Let us take this example. She already underwent eight to nine surgeries before um, prior to this and every time the infection continued and she did not heal. So what is important? We have to take into factor everything which can lead to a persistent infection. We have to control lymphedema, we have to control venous stasis, etc. Give, raise her, uh, hemoglobin and, and manage in all the way in a bad, severe infected non-union. Investigate the patient thoroughly, find out whatever is lacking, supplement them and then take up the challenge. Almost all the infected non-unions we encounter in orthopedic practice are caused by biofilm bacteria and they prevent antimicrobial action. And that is one important thing to clear before we go ahead with managing this patient. And to manage and treat biofilm related infection, we have to understand the principles laid down by Zerni and Madar, complete surgical debridement, fracture and non-union stabilization, soft tissue coverage, and adequate antibiotic elution. The treatment of non-union nowadays mostly is in two stages. We debride, provide stability, and then once the infection is er eradicated, provide a stable fixation with bone graft if required. When we provide an antibiotic coated nail, one of the most important thing to decide is what antibiotic elution you plan for. So you can plan for a thermostable antibiotic, especially if you are using a nail, or if you are using a stimulant that can act as 5 to 10 gram granules for a localized place. And, and the antibiotic elution and the antibiotic spacer can be a rod, rod and beads, superficial beads, local excision and beads, or if you excise segmental, then you provide a complete segmental antibiotic spacer. The important thing is to debride the whole tract, the whole medullary cavity, including all sinuses. And in these difficult situations, when everything is infected, you have to have a stage protocol. Eradicate infection first is the most important thing. And for eradication, we need to have a lot of good wash, lavage, irrigation, everything in position. Um, you irrigate the whole thing, uh, remove all dead tissue. You have to have a good strategy and form a protocol what you are going to use for irrigation. And there are various guidelines given in literature. Use the most common thing what we use is a saline. You can use peroxide, etc. But the thing is, remove all dead tissue, remove all uh, discharging sinuses, eradication of the medullary membrane, the biofilm, etc. That is most important. In such severe fluorid infections, you need to manage them in multiple stages. Control the infection first. You may have to use negative pressure wound therapy. So this was a badly infected 
pouring pus. And in situation, in these situations, we have to remove the previous implants, remove the previous nail, remove all the dead bone. As you can see, this was all ivory white. The whole almost four to five inches of bone was ivory white. That was uh, debrided. And then get with negative pressure wound therapy, a wound which can heal. You may have to use irrigation either from the same tubing or from a different tubings. Irrigate, you can have suction irrigation. So the, once the fluoride infection is controlled, then once the soft tissues are debrided or dead tissue is removed, dead bone is removed, then comes the next phase of your stabilization of the limb and providing stability. Remember, you need to remove all the dead infected bone, provide good antibiotic spacer, which may you have to change once or twice, still a good uh, antibiotic membrane uh, is created, a good uh, membrane is there, and then you can put stability and bone graft. So a good wound healing is what we want. Once that is achieved, then rest of the things become uh, as for a non-union. Nowadays, multiple options are available by which what we are going to uh, use for a stability of that patient along with antibiotic elution. The use of an antibiotic coated nail in various form is the most important tool to manage an infected non-union after a nailing procedure. And there are various tips and tricks to manage a good antibiotic elution. I would use amikacin, gentamicin or whatever antibiotic sensitivity is there. You need to have a heat stable antibiotic. This was a young male, had a road traffic accident, had initial fixation, which may not be very optimum as you can see on the x-ray and then had discharging sinuses. This sinus was there in the popliteal fossa. So initial debridement, complete removal, antibiotic coated nail, providing an antibiotic coated nail initially and a good spacer at the fracture site also is important. This usually I keep into two hemi cylinders so that locally you have a medullary antibiotic elution. Also, you have a local antibiotic delivery by two hemi cylinders at the spacer site. And then final fixation can be with an intramedullary nail and bone grafting. And this patient had a good result, perfect bone healing and a good range of motion as well. And a good soft tissue healing is what we want. And all his sinuses heal completely. So good eradication of infection and stability would give you a good result. There are indications where we may not be able to use a nail again, like in this difficult stuck up bone, stuck up soft tissues, etc. Deformed bones, deformed medullary cavities, where we may have to use some other form of external fixation. Like in this patient, I uh, used an extra cutaneous plate after debridement, dead bone excision, getting good soft tissue, and then fixing with an extra cutaneous plate. This patient had an intramedullary nailing and infection, but his knee was zero degree, uh, absolutely stiff. We, it was very difficult to take out the nail. The flexion was only from zero to 10 degrees. And in this case, we had to remove the nail by tricks. We had to remove the anterior shell of bone. You're able to hear me? Yes, you can. Yes, okay. yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. So uh, then this was the bright bit completely, and along with uh, and as we were not able to pass long curates inside. We had to use a brush in that specific situation to remove the, all the antibiotic membrane and then irrigate the whole thing. So this debridement, the medullary debridement is a key after an infected nailing uh, of a non-minium. And in that case, we removed the whole antibiotic membrane, created windows that was irrigated and you wash it out saline. Uh, you have a intramedullary device where you can irrigate the medullary cavity. So you insufflate with a syringe and suck out everything. So this is how it was done. So that the whole medullary cavity debridement is the crux in getting good infection control. And then we can proceed for further reconstruction. So that was done. And in this patient, you also had a discharging sinuses at the interlocking nail hole side, the screw side. So you remove all those, have a special curate which can go into those holes, remove everything. And then that was a good thing. So friends, a good vascular bed, bleeding bone, uh, a healthy thing, uh, good antibiotic cement spacer, which when you put, you have to cool it down. Otherwise, the soft tissues 
also would get heated up and then you can construct uh, this uh, difficult patient. The antibiotic elution is really very important in and a fixation. Good resort, especially when there is a segmental bone loss, lot of after a nailing procedure, which would uh, give us and in reconstruction with Elisa Rob is also a very valuable option. And with this end result, we are all happy when we have a good infection. Whenever we have infected non union all that tissue, do a good medullary debridement, put a good antibiotic spacer, don't worry about the length of bone you have to reconstruct, remove all infected shoes, whatever is dead, there is no vascularity, you remove it. Resources, uh, prepare an antibiotic rod on table with our at least three to four grams of vancomycin and whatever other antibiotics you can use in this situation. Put a good cement spacer, which is a bit bulkier than the original size of the bone so that you can have a good uh, membrane. And after <coughs> this patient, and had a good result. Achieve of tissue healing for the patient. These patients can be managed definitely, but they need a lot of counseling, a lot of resources, and a lot of efforts. So all this thing has to be counseled to the patient at the beginning itself. Thank you very much for your patient placement. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rajendra Chandak. I request Ram Krishnan to keep uh, trying to do the uh, uh, screen sharing by the time we'll finish our uh, question and answer session. Rajendra, my question is, yes. is there a, yeah. any quick way of how much antibiotic to mix with a 40 gram of bone cement? Whether I can mix four vials, six vials, two grams, four grams, six grams, how much I can mix? Is there any quick way of uh, doing something? Or, Could you get my question? I think there is a net problem with him. Uh, Vivek, you can take that question. Yeah, the cement as such, it, it's two types. One is regarding the prophylaxis and one is regarding the therapeutic dose. So here, remember that what we are using in the orthoplasties are the prophylactic ones, not the therapeutic ones. Here in infected nails, we are using it for therapeutic purpose. And hence the maximum dosage which you can get away is around, they say it's, it should not be more than 20% of the total content of the cement. So it's, if it is 40 grams, they say it is eight grams that you can put. When you increase it by 10% or beyond, that is four grams and beyond, the structural stability of that cement becomes less because it becomes more brittle sort of a thing. But here we are not using it as a prostalac or a weight, weight bearing device here. We are using it more as a coating for the therapeutic. So we can use 10% to 20%. That is for 40 grams, we can use up to four grams, maximum up to eight grams, but normally four to six grams is what you are using in an infective therapeutic dose. And Vanco and Tobra are the best ones by which, uh, Vanco and Tobra are the ones which you can combine because it has been found that if you use them in a combination, the effectivity of both of them becomes double rather than becomes more than one, two plus two is going to be four. So that is not it is good. Yeah, some of the antibiotic come in lesser quantity like uh, uh, gentamicin comes in 80 milligram. So mm -hmm. does that mean that uh, you can add four grams of gentamicin means so many vials. No. So you are not going to put in that liquid ones. You are going to have to put in the powder forms usually that we are putting in. And okay. tobramycin needs to be got in a powder form, which is difficult to get. But that's what we need to get if you are wanting to combine Vanco and Tobra. That's why Vanco is the one safest one which you can be putting because that's in powder form and you can use it for gram purpose. But however, if you get Tobra also in, in a powder one, that both can be used. Okay. Chandak, you are there? Yeah, sir. So, okay. any question? Van to yeah, vancomycin and uh, uh, the most important for gram negative is amikacin and gentamicin. 
and make efforts to procure them into powder form. Either you get them from internal sources or, or ask some of your pharma colleagues or especially somebody if they're from the FDA, they help me out getting in vials of gentamicin 500 milligram into vial form and amikacin in one gram uh, powder form. And that I keep always ready because they're very valuable in managing this difficult infection. Okay, any more questions? Otherwise, Ram Krishna. Just, just, just one question. Yeah. If you are late, we are there. Dr. No, Chandak, sir. Yes. In an intramed, the problem for me in an infected intramedullary nail is how to decide when to remove this nail straight away. So, what is the sign or the thing which is going to tell you that I'm going, because in a plate, many a times we debride and just give antibiotics in the initial times and then wait for one more sitting and then maybe debride, remove it. So, in an intramedullary nail, which are the things which help you to decide or the first incidence of a discharge infection is the one when you are going to remove the nail? Because intramedullary entire infection is can be spread. Depending, depending. So, you are muted. Yeah. yeah. Is it um, audible yeah, now? You, can, you are audible. Yeah, yeah. So, if the fixation is done recently and the fixation is stable then it is uh, okay to go ahead with infection control measures like exploration of the fracture providing antibiotic elution but if the infection if this uh, uh, construct is unstable it is always wise to remove it provide antibiotic coated nail and then redo always it is better to redo the complete thing because then only you have to have a then only you will be able to do a complete medullary uh, debridement so ideally, I would always wish that whenever there is a major infection, it is better to remove the previous implant because a lot of antibiotic uh, uh, membranes, etc. are there. The, the bacterial membranes are there. We have to remove everything completely. Then only I am happy with the control of this effect. Yeah. Uh, uh, Dr. Chandak, yes. how, how much of the maximum length we can uh, treat by this muscular technique? So beyond that, we should go. We should switch over to laser or some lending procedure. So if you have a source of bone graft available, like a, a yeah. reamer irrigator aspirator, so we reconstructed even up to eight to nine inches of length of bone also, because that reamer irrigator aspirator gives you a privilege of large bone volume of graft, even up to eighty cubic. Um, Millimeter, millimeter 80 cc of graft yeah 80 cc of graft you can get along with split fibula along with ilacrase graft in those difficult cases so length of bone to be reconstructed see more important is to get a good infection control once the muscular membrane is formed then the uh, incorporation of this transplanted graft is also very good so the length is not an issue the more important issue is to have complete uh, infection control and how much time you would require to protect them because it takes probably a longer, longer time yeah, and how yeah. much, what are the chances yeah. of getting yeah. fractured? Yeah, long, long time it takes and all these patients need a regular follow-up to boost them with the support they have. You brace them for a long time and in spite of that, some of these patients do come back with a refracture or a stress fracture of that zone of long reconstructed bone and again then it goes to square one but if there is no infection, they are easy to manage, either with a splintage or a additional MIPO plate you can do at that time if there is no infection. So, do you prefer no. using plate uh, after removing the fixator at times? Yes. Yeah, it is better to supplement with a MIPO plate if the soft tissues are okay because that saves a lot of time and the patients are also very comfortable. Only issue would be you should be able to put a MIPO plate. If you if you do a complete open plate fixation, again, the chance of recrudescence of infection is quite large. So, thank Chandak you. sir, thank you very much. And thank we'll you. go for a last lecture now after Ram Krishnan. Hello. Thank can you, sir, for the opportunity. Thank you. Yes. Good afternoon, sir. Can you see my screen? Yeah, it's a blank screen, white screen we can see. You can start your presentation. Oh. Are you able to see? No. Yeah, you opened your presentation? Yeah, yes, sir. Then stop sharing the screen. Stop sharing the screen. Stop it. Yeah. Again, you press on the start share screen button. Stop it. Stop it.
Yeah, now I can now we can see. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Now you can go ahead. Stage three, we can see. Can you? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, sir. All seniors and respected members of IOA. Uh, my topic is uh, post nailing infection. What next? So, some of the important aspects have been covered by Rajendra, sir. So, the development of a deep wound infection in the presence of a hardware presents a real clinical dilemma. So, we can actually uh, factors predisposing to that are, um, as mentioned earlier, open fractures, gross tissue contamination. There is a loss of soft tissue coverage. Then in certain cases, multiple procedures and prolonged hospital stay. And there are some host factors like malnutrition, diabetes melters, immunodeficiency, and cigarette smoking. And stages of infection, the stage one is actually called as uh, early bacterial cellulitis in, may see in some cases. That is in the early part of the post-operative period, some two to six weeks after the nailing. The second stage is one where you have a delayed wound healing and a discharge from wound and necrosis of soft tissues. And there can be an impaired fracture healing also seen. This usually is the time frame will be between two to nine months after the nailing. And for stage three, which is called the chronic phase, usually be beyond nine months. When you have a clear case of an non-union with the chronic wound drainage, there can be a septic loosening, some bone resorption and implant failure. And sequestrum and involucrum may also be seen in some cases. So the diagnosis of an early infection is a progressive and new onset of pain. Generally, when we do a major fracture fixation, the most important uh, clinical sign we see is the happy, happy face of the patient next day. Once the fracture is stabilized, they have a good feeling that pain due to the fracture will be uh, not be there. But in these cases, there can be a progressive postoperative pain, and it may be located either at the fracture site or a nail insertion site or at the locking screw sites. It can be a dull, deep pain preventing weight bearing, and it can even prevent the normal sleep of the patient. There can be associated fever, night sweats, chills, and tachycardia. And other risk factors is on cigarette smoking, again, open fractures, alcohol abuse, uncontrolled diabetes melters, and in post x fix cases, as mentioned earlier, uh, pin tract infection. Whenever we have put an x fix for an open fracture, we should give a time frame of delay the uh, definitive procedure by a week or 10 days. And also at the time of removing x fix, uh, we should cure the pin tracks very clearly with a lot of copious saline. And I usually put a temporary slab, especially if it is a tibia fracture and an open fracture. Once the X-fix is removed, either if I can manage it uh, with soft tissue flap, I will do that. Otherwise, we put a X-fix and then delay for a week or 10 days and then plan for the definitive fixation. The physical examinations, again, local signs of infection will be there. Screw insertion site and nail insertion site are the common sites where we get signs of infection. There will be swelling, tenderness, erythema, and can be spontaneous drainage, which can be a serosanguinous or purulent. In such situations, let me point out that we should have a high index of suspicion because uh, th there is no point in being complacent and uh, uh, thinking that my case is not infected. Anybody's case can get infected at any point of time. So whenever I find a discharge of, in a post-operative case, which is beyond three or four days after the fixation, I immediately take a swab, deep swab. Probably if there is a suture, I release the suture, take a swab from the deep, deeper tissues and send it for culture. And in the normal case, uh, most of the cases, my dictum is for uh, antibiotic coverage will be three doses maximum. Okay, and um, after that, I usually stop the, there is no point in continuing with the antibiotic coverage for a week or more after an elective case. And laboratory investigations, ESR and CRP are elevated, the leukocytosis with the shift to left and aspiration, as I mentioned earlier, if the pus is pointing, you can aspirate and follow by gram staining and culture. Or the radiographic changes in the earliest, cha earliest changes are seen in the medullary canal. It takes several days or weeks to develop uh, radiographic changes. The subtle loss of cortical density begins at the fracture site. And as the infection progresses, the radiolucency around the nail and the locking bolts will be seen. 
the endos endosteal cortical lysis in a scalloped pattern is one of a common finding and periosteal re re reaction may extend away from the fracture site many a time the young surgeon will think that this is callus formation it can be mistaken for a callus and septic loosening may occur even with a healed fracture and long standing infection may show classic signs of osteomyelitis like sequestra and involucrum and even most of the cases the ct and mri may not have much role in make they helping us with the decision making a technetium or indium scans may show increased uptake along the medullary canal so what are the treatment modalities an aggressive treatment is warranted to ensure bone viability and maintain implant stability aspiration of the major surgical site or the point of maximum inflation is one way of uh, uh, starting the treatment it is better to take a specimen for culture before starting the antibiotics and broad spectrum antibiotics iv antibiotics are preferred a combination of cephalosporin and amico aminoglycoside is the usual way of treating it and patients with significant findings may require a decompression of medullary canal the nail insertion site can be opened and irrigation is performed around the nail See, the problem with intramedullary nail is uh, removal of the exudates and biofilm formation is difficult to prevent because of its intramedullary nature so in a hollow nail one distal locking screw can be removed to allow the fluids to egress out you push saline from the nail insertion site and allow it the washed out fluid to go out through the screw site locking bolt site and the screw can be replaced when the lavage is complete and the wound can be left open and to allow it to heal secondarily if you find that the implant is loose it has to be converted to a stable implant as mentioned earlier the stability of the fracture is very important for fracture healing and resolution of infection whenever you find that the stability is at question it is better to remove the nail and put a longer or a stouter nail the routine removal of a stable implant is not always necessary and loosening of the locking screws is treated by revision of the nail of a different length and relocking at a new level unlocked nail has to be revised to a locked nail a dynamically locked nail has to be converted to a st static locking and appropriate iv antibiotics are usually continued for a minimum period of 2 weeks or up to 4 weeks and the absence of fever and no drainage wound healing all these are looked for and you have to get a normal leukocyte count so the, now we come to the biofilm formation it is a colony of microorganisms suspended within a self produced matrix of polysaccharide and proteins adherent to the implanted medical devices and damaged tissues this is called the extracellular polymeric substance and it forms a slimy layer on the device and it happens on all the artificial implants artificial hardware joint replacements nails vascular processes etc so this is a diagrammatic representation of biofilm formation you have planktonic bacteria getting adherent to the implant surface and they form a slimy layer and the once the slime is formed they are uh, very difficult to tackle with iv antibiotics they are resistant to iv antibiotics will not penetrate the slime layer the likely organisms commonly found in biofilms are staph epidermidis aureus and pseudomonas aeruginosa very less commonly we can have a mixed flora and you have what you call as a race for the surface in to prevent biofilm formation and to tackle the infection we have a window of opportunity in the early post operative period before the slime formation occurs biofilm formation occurs at that time we should have an aggressive protocol to manage the infection so cells that are within the biofilm are nearly 1000 times more resistant to antibiotic than their planktonic counterparts and the antibiotics fail to penetrate the biofilms and bacteria within these communities undergo a phenotypic change and make them resistant to antibiotics and the biobodies and phagocytosis so how do you prevent biofilm formation any plastic or metal device implant must be perfectly clean your aseptic technique is very important during the surgery and any residual contamination of the surface by organic uh, material especially biofilm accelerates the process 10 times so simple sterilization may not be enough in orthopedic procedures you may have to have enzymatic treatment also when you sterilize the instruments so there are there are several methods some are in experimental phase of how to prevent biofilm formation surface modalities and using copper and iron titanium oxide and um, cyto use of cytokines etc etc 
then come the role of reamer irrigator earlier the previous speaker uh, has mentioned rajan sir has mentioned about it so this was introduced in 2003 and it developed to be, developed it was originally used to prevent fat embolism and lessen the inflammatory response to reaming extended indication is to harvest bone graft from medullary canal and in management of long bone infection the reaming and subsequent irrigation and aspiration is a form of surgical debrima of the medullary canal this is a diagrammatic representation of one design of a reamer irrigator and um, you have two channels apart from the reaming head one to allow perfusion of saline and the another one to suck the fluid out this is how it is being done you have to do it continuously so that you get clear fluid out of the wash out uh, fluid should be very clear antibiotic coated implants again gentamicin and vancomycin sulfate and palmitate can be used Dobramycin is also a, a promising antibiotic. The slow elution of antibiotic into the surrounding tissues help to control the infection. And antibiotic should have thermostability and good elution properties so that it can be used in antibiotic coated implants. The another method is, uh, as mentioned earlier, is the use of cement beads and the cemented nails, antibiotic cement nails. So you make the many of the times we can make it on the table and use it after a debrima. This is how we make an antibiotic nail. You can use a chest tube to fill antibiotic cement into it. And after consolidation, you can remove the chest tube and use it as a temporary stabilizer. Bioabsorbable antibiotic delivery systems are also available. And like collagen fleeces, polyesters, chitosans, etc. They are composite carriers and calcium sulfate carriers are also available. They are supposed to have a better drug elution profile than PMMA. Treatment strategy for a stage two infection. You have three strategies. One is retaining the nail if it is stable, then debrima and antibiotic administration. Second strategy is to do an exchange nailing plus antibiotic and plus or minus bone graft. You can do the bone graft in stage uh, as a delayed procedure. And in third option will be nail removal, external fixation, and then go for a stage two bone grafting. Exchange nailing is the most appropriate in non-union without bone blast. No clear consensus for exchange nailing can is in the presence of active purulent infection. It is a good choice for aseptic non-unions of non-commutated diaphyseal fractures. Also a good choice for aseptic non-union of tibial diaphyseal fractures. It is not usually indicated for humeral fracture non-unions. The principles of an exchange nailing, it is better to control the infection first before going for an exchange nailing. The nail should be long, at least one millimeter larger in diameter than the one removed. And it can up to four mm larger can be used if the canal permits. We will be doing a reaming so that we can use a larger nail. It gives more stability. The canal reaming should progress until we get clear fluid which drains out and the bone tissue is also seen in the reaming fluids. The biological effects of reaming is uh, exchange nailing is increased in the periosteal blood flow and stimulates the periosteal newborn formation. And it produce, products of reaming contains osteoblasts and pluripotent stem cells, which serve as bone graft. And activation of growth factors are also supposed to take place. And there is also an inflammatory response, which help in healing. The mechanical effect is a larger diameter nail provides greater bending rigidity and strength. And it gives a better cortical contact at the isthmus. If original nail was short, increasing the nail, increasing length of the nail improves the stability. A previously dynamically locked nail should be converted to a static locked nail. And increasing the number of interlocking screws may also be possible in some situations. These are some of the articles which are useful in with regard to this topic. Exchange nailing of fun united fractures by Brinker and Connor or Connor. Then you have a maintenance of hardware. As in early infection, you can maintain the hardware in early post-operative infection followed by fracture internal fixations. Then we have the treatment of medullary osteomyelitis of femur and tibia, the Kanakaris et al. It above using the reamer irrigator aspirator system and antibiotic cement rods. And again, management of an infection of the intramedullary nail of long bone fractures, the treatment protocol and outcomes by uh, Macridis and Gianodis. To summarize, the early post-op infection after nailing should be aggressively treated. If stability is assured, hardware can be retained, drainage of pus along with parental antibiotics. Washout should be done with plenty of saline, which will be very helpful. The pus taken for culture and sensitivity before starting antibiotics. 
IV antibiotics for a minimum of two weeks followed by oral antibiotics for up to four to six weeks. In late presentations, after control of infection, exchange nailing with secondary bone grafting should be the choice of treatment. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ram Krishnan, wonderful presentation. Thank you, sir. So, Shiv yes. Shankar, sir. Yes. Uh, if there is any burning question, to, because he has uh, beautifully covered the uh, post-operative infection following nailing. If there is any burning question to ask to Dr. Ram Krishnan uh, by anybody, we'll ask. Otherwise, uh, okay. Uh, let me start thanking because uh, I was I became the by default moderator for this session today. Uh, no, no, I you mean, are not by you are not by default. You are by choice. <laughs> <laughs> because Dr. Navin Tesar is in the, uh, Tamil Nadu and Dr. Yeah. Sushu had to attend for a polytrauma case. So uh, that's how I became the moderator. I thank all the speakers and also I must thank. Dr. Vivek Trika, because he was is there right from the beginning till the end. I was not expecting to tell Bradley. He's such a busy person, staying five hours. Uh, I have get, got some few questions and also people have said that it's a very long webinar you have kept. Yes, friends, what we want, Dr. Gadegone, who is the chairman of the Nail Subcommittee of IOIE, he said that uh, it should be comprehensive, it should be... Uh, people should be able to go back and see the recording. They may not be able to attend in live the whole five hours, but the material should be in such a way that uh, it should be a sort of a reference uh, webinar. So this webinar will be available on YouTube and uh, you people will be able to retrieve them and see them whenever they are in trouble. And we have covered the entire gamut of uh, uh, nailing, principle of nailing up to infection and even uh, exchange nearly everything we have covered non-union. I don't think uh, there is anything much to say. Uh, Dr. Rajiv Chatterjee, in spite of his jet lag, is now in UK. Yesterday night only has reached uh, UK and uh, he, he was able to join early morning today. Dr. Kiran Sauji from Nagpur has been kind enough to join. Uh, they are still there. So I'll uh, thank all the faculty, Dr. Tanna, Dr. Sushrut Babulka, Sunil Kulkarni, everybody who have chipped in their expertise and making this webinar successful. I'll uh, uh, ask our president of NAILS, Dr. Sanjay Dhawan, to say a few words before I hand over the mic to Gade Gone to say it bye-bye. Sanjay Dhawan, are you there? Dr. Sanjay Dhawan also is the president of uh, NAILS subcommittee, NAILS uh, Association. He is in uh, attending a JESS meeting at Delhi, but he was kind enough to join and he was there for majority of the time. Yes, Kiran, you want to say anything before I hand over to... No, no, it was a very nice webinar, but little lengthy. That's okay. Yeah, that's fine. But it's lengthy for us because people can uh, see afterwards. Also. Watch yes. at their convenience, their part, whatever is required. Yes. Yeah. So, so what Dr. Kadeone? So to conclude, actually, uh, I have gone through all these things, Dr. Sivshankar, Trika, myself, from the beginning we are here. And the standard of presentation was par excellence. And you can have a, at the end a crystal clear idea and take home message from each and every lecture. And that is the beauty of this uh, webinar and lengthy show. But uh, anybody can go with the reference of this R2 TV and also the link also. So I must specially thank all presenters and they have spent their early morning of Sunday and especially Dr. Sivishankar who has helped me out of this a very difficult situation to organize all stalwarts of uh, all corners of India. So thank you all. Thank you, viewers, you. Part of TV. Thank you viewers of YouTube also. And Not the least. I must appreciate uh, Gadi sir, the energies of this two giants, Shiva sir and your <laughs> sir. Uh, thank Achala. you so much. Thank, thank you, you Rajendra. Thank, thank you. And thank you, thank you IOA President uh, Dr. Ramesh Sain and Secretary Dr. Uh, Navin Thakkar for sparing their valuable time and allowing us to present this webinar on this platform. So thank you and thank you and goodbye. Thank, thank you. you all. Thank, thank you. you.
เดือนเราบายบาย